Chris. All, All right, let's go. I did All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Vintage Computer Festival East 2020. Yay. We finally got this show going. Um, we're doing it virtually, and we were going to do it in April, and then this COVID thing happened, and then we rescheduled to October, and then we said, oh, we still got problems, so we're going to do it virtual. Um, we got a great lineup here. We got a lot of people, um, historical, interesting exhibits. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's, it's really great. Um, I want to thank you know, all the people that were helping me with this, you know, especially the people that submitted the videos. I mean, they're the ones, that's the meat and potatoes of this, of this show, is all these uh, videos and people doing their exhibits and presentations, uh, and that's very important. And uh, thanks to Kay Savitz, who processed all these videos. He's been really wonderful. Here, send him the video, and he can fix up any audio problems or video problems, and then it's ready to go. So it's awesome. Um, and... Uh, Thanks to the local crew here, you know Andy Diller and Chris Falla and Corey Cohen and um, everyone else to, that are helping me out. And thanks to CDL, Computer Deconstruction Lab here. We're here at InfoAge uh, broadcasting out of their podcast studio. They let us use their studios. This is really awesome that they let us use this. So um, without further ado, Andy, you ready to go? Mm -hmm. All right, hit the button to start our first exhibit. Hello. I'm Eric Rangel from Downingtown, Pennsylvania, and my exhibit for VCF this year is Ted Nelson's Vision. The exhibit is powered by Hyperduino, which is made by Roger Wagner Publishing. And when a person comes up and touches one of these points, Ted Nelson is a visionary who imagined the ideas of hypertext in the 1960s. So the exhibit starts in the early 1960s when Ted was envisioning hypertext and he had ideas for what are now called zippered lists for maintaining data structures of links to text that can be reorganized as needed. So these are some diagrams from his 1965 paper showing his vision. In 1967, Ted, at his own expense, went to Brown University to work on a hypertext editing system. And that's a picture of him working at an IBM terminal. Um, he was unhappy with the results of that system because it did not include all the ideas that he had. He envisioned hypertext as being able to visually connect related works of text, for example, um, an article and the source material, so you could jump between them and see exactly what was quoted in the source. So his vision was documented in Computer Lib and Dream Machines, and um, he lectured about it, and he had ideas that he published um, about how word processing should be done, and then the um, system design of that system with what he called lollipop diagrams, and you could see the kind of flowcharts he drew and user manual. And this actually became a product for the Apple II computer, which I will demonstrate. He coined the term intertwingled, and he also collaborated with Douglas Engelbart. Here is an example from Xerox, where a hard drive was discovered in a dump and it had a small talk image. So Smalltalk is unique because the entire system is stored in one file. So all your work at whatever point you've stopped is available. So that hard drive was able to start right up and leave off where it was. So here are some demonstrations of Ted's ideas. Xanadu Classic was a method of comparing documents using what he calls tumblers to address different versions of documents, even down to the character level. So what this is showing is comparing two versions of the Declaration of Independence, and they have different tumblers, and that's a way of organizing the text on a disk so that um, any new versions, it just appends another level to the tumbler. Um, an example from the 90s is called Cosmic Book, 
which had to go beyond the windowing system available. You had to have special code to connect material in different windows. And his greatest demo is called Xanadu Space. So underneath Xanadu Space is a zigzag data structure. This is an Apple IIc running a 1986 version of Ted Nelson's Jot Design, which was programmed in fourth by Steve Whittem. So to show you how it works, the space bar navigates one word at a time, and then the right arrow moves forward one sentence at a time. So here I'm moving to each period, to the colon. Okay, now the left arrow moves back one sentence. So it's based on a mode. So initially you're in a word mode, so the space bar is word, and then the next level above is the arrows. Okay, but then when you press return, you hear two beeps. Now you're in sentence mode, so the space bar advances one sentence at a time. Okay, and then the arrows move a paragraph at a time. So I'm going to go to section three and hit the right arrow, and it moves down to the end of the paragraph. So he designed the system to make sense for writers. So when you hear three beeps, you're in paragraph mode. The space bar then moves one paragraph at a time, and then it fills in the text below it as we go. So he wrote a sample essay to demonstrate the system. And then the arrows move to the beginning and the end of a document when you're in paragraph mode. So the left arrow gets you back to the beginning, and then if you press the right arrow at any time, it interrupts it and goes forward all the way to the end of the document. So here's an example. If I am in power, if I go to uh, level two, and the left arrow then goes back a paragraph at a time, and now it says, please move this paragraph between the previous two paragraphs. So the slash key, is a cut and then I can move back and then the at key is a slurp which um, now it put the please move this paragraph right here between the previous paragraph and the next one so it's designed for a writer who's thinking in terms of sentences and paragraphs to easily rearrange their work a popular implementation of hyperlinking is in the Macintosh HyperCard. So this is a Macintosh SE30 running HyperCard, and the theory was that um, people can create their own stacks of cards. So if you had an address book, you would have lists of addresses on each card. Okay, and you'd navigate, you can search, and then you can link applications like a date book and see what you were doing back in 1989. So I wrote a simple stack of my own, and here it is, VCF 2020, just to demonstrate what you could do. So back in the 1980s and 90s, people were all crazy about fonts because Steve Jobs took a calligraphy class in college and went to Xerox Park and saw all the fonts that you could do. So you could click the right arrow here to continue. And Ted is known for inventing the back button because he insisted that there be a way for people to navigate back through a stack of what they had been looking at. And here's another back button. And I said, I clicked the left arrow instead of the right arrow. I must be creative. So you could play around on the card now using these tools. So now people were able to scribble and write their name and do all kinds of fun stuff with the tools available in HyperCard. Hyper Studio by Roger Wagner Publishing is an innovative program that does hypermedia for the Apple II GS, and it is still available for the Macintosh today. It used invisible buttons, so you could just take a graphic and mark a point of it, a rectangular um, region of it, as a button. So I created a button on the red spot of Jupiter that uh, runs an AppleSoft program. And what I created is a chord keyboard. So in Douglas Engelbart's Mother of All Demos, he used a five-finger keyboard 
to create uh, data entry for his um, systems, the NLS. So I created a simple program that reads the switches from the chord keyboard. So if I use my ring finger and uh, the rightmost bit is like a strobe, so one zero zero is a four, and then a one is um, my pinky. So I just strobed in a four one in hex, which is the letter A. And I could do a four two as a B and a four three for the three, you need both your middle finger and your index finger, and then you get a C. So you could type on a chord keyboard. Now, Doug had an actually a different system than what I'm showing here, but it just shows what is possible today. To learn more about Ted Nelson's vision, you can go to github.com slash erangel slash VCF East 2020. On that site, I have a list of resources, and you can see demos of Ted Xanadu Space and ZigZag. And then there are more detailed resources at the bottom where you can see other videos if you want to go into more depth about Ted Nelson's ideas. Thank you. All right, that was great. Um, I love Ted Nelson. Um, I'm glad that Eric did that. Um, he was here at VCF a few years ago um, and it was wonderful. It's like amazing ideas uh, that he did. And um, I know he was working on making some of this a reality and lots of visionary to, that propelled a lot of like the web way it is now. Um, so we have, um, some questions i think here for eric so let me just go and and see so chris we have some questions for eric yeah it looks like uh eric actually responded in the text is that all right so i will then i will read the question well, i'll read the question all right all right sorry I'll, you hear the so, question i'll hear the answer go real. chris bereski asks have you tried writing any longer text with the editor you demoed on the Apple II C, how does it compare in ease if used, if use and efficiency to other keyboard-based text editors that you've used? So then Eric answers, the Jot demo can store up to 99K of text on a floppy disk. So that's the one question we have so far. So um, far. Uh, all right, maybe someone else is typing. Eric is typing a little bit more. Um, just so you guys know, the next um, after Eric is going to be Jason Moore, uh, the interactive Atari. All right. So Eric says it takes time to get used to Ted's system. Yes, I, I if what I remember, um, Ted was trying to get that system working and and the technology wasn't quite up to what he was envisioning. Um, so it was very difficult to actually implement his ideas. Um, and then it, I don't think it actually ever finished. So um, but it's very interesting. All right, so last chance for questions. If there's no more questions, then we will go to the next one. The next one is the Interactive Atari by Jason Moore. All right, Andy, ready? Let's hit it. Hi, I'm Jason Moore. I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And today I'm gonna give a demo of the Interactive 6502 for the Atari home computers. You can find more of my Atari projects at atariprojects.org. the goal of this project is to allow the user to interact directly with the 6502 processor via a user-friendly graphical interface. The 6502 was developed by Chuck Peddle in the early 1970s when he worked for Motorola. And this was really one of the first inexpensive computer chips on the market. It sold for about $25 in 1975. 
And this led to the Cambrian explosion of home computers. In 1977, we saw the Commodore PET, the Apple II, the Radio Shack TRS-80 all released for, to the consumer. The Commodore and the Apple both used the 6502, while the Radio Shack used the competing Zilog Z80. I'm gonna focus today on the Atari home computers, which were released in 1979 and included a graphics processing unit a GPU which allowed advanced graphics for the time. So here's a summary overview of the 6502 processor from chapter three of the book Atari Roots. Uh, on the left here are shown all the various registers. We have the program counter which helps the CPU keep track of the next instruction that needs to be executed. A stack pointer which keeps track of memory addresses used by the CPU a process status register which uh, keeps track of the various states of the processor, the X and Y registers where we can store numbers, and the arithmetic uh, logic unit, the ALU, which allows um, simple addition and subtraction with numbers coming from the accumulator and uh, the data bus with the results going back and being stored in the accumulator. This is the 6502 instruction set. There are 56 instructions that we can use to tell the CPU what to do. I like this figure because they're organized according to the, the various parts of the 6502. And the instructions here are represented as assembly language uh, mnemonics, three letter mnemonics that um, indicate which instruction is to be used. We're gonna focus today on just a subset of the 56 instructions, specifically those that allow us to um, create and, and move numbers in and out of the various, the X register, the Y register, the system memory, uh, and the accumulator with uh, arithmetic, uh, including addition and subtraction. This is a screenshot of the interactive 6502, uh, which I'll give a demo of here in a minute. Uh, at the top are the assembly language commands, the instructions that we're going to be able to use uh, to interact directly with the 6502. Um, and at the bottom, um, shown uh, a memory location that we're gonna keep track of uh, on page zero of the Atari memory. And then on the right are the register, three registers of the CPU that we're gonna keep track of, the X, Y, and the accumulator. The software for the Interactive 6502 is programmed in BASIC, specifically BASIC XL. Now, unfortunately, you can't interact directly with the 6502 processor from BASIC. You cannot manipulate the registers directly. And so what I've done here in this program is I've included some assembly language commands which actually manipulate the registers and those assembly commands are then called from the BASIC program when you click on one of the instructions to be executed. The source code for the Interactive 6502 is available on my GitHub page, and I've got more details about the program on the Atari Projects website. Okay, we have the Altera Atari 8-bit emulator loaded here with Basic Excel, my programming language, and we have the um, interactive 6502 disk image loaded into drive one. Obviously, you would want to run this on real hardware to get the authentic 6502 experience, but we're gonna use emulation for the purposes of the demo. Uh, we can see the contents of this disk and we're gonna load that basic file that has the program. And we're gonna run that and that'll bring up the title screen. Uh, the program's doing some initialization and then it is ready to go. And here at the top, we have our assembly commands and we can scroll through them and select the ones we want to play with. Um, INC is, is increment that increments the contents of the memory location. So when I push that, we can see the memory, the RAM, goes from zero to one, one to two, two to three, uh, et cetera. We can also increase the X and Y registers with similar commands. So this increases the X register and this one increases the Y register. 
Um, there's some other commands here. Um, LDA um, loads the contents of memory into um, the accumulator. So when I push that, the four will appear in the accumulator. We can also do the same with X and Y. Um, and we can subtract and add. SBC is a subtract function, so that's going to take the contents of the accumulator and subtract the contents of the memory location, which is passed to the ALU over the data bus uh, with the value from the accumulator. So four minus four is zero, and we can see the value of the accumulator drop to zero. Um, here's a command for um, storing what's in the accumulator and memory. So that'll transfer the zero across the data bus into memory. Uh, and you can see the zero appears in memory. There are also some transfer functions here to go from the accumulator to the X register, to go from the accumulator to the Y register, um, et cetera. So that's it. Um, <clears throat> it's really a, a very simple program, but is, is meant to give the user an authentic experience interacting with the 6502. And again, I would encourage you to try this on real hardware. Um, the last thing I want to show you is the, um, uh, an example bit of code to show you where the assembly language uh, routines are um, uh, loaded in. So here are the last three lines of the program. This is the assembly routine for the transfer Y to A assembly command. So in this remark statement, I have the actual assembly commands. The first three are for initialization. I bring in the value from memory that BASIC is keeping track of into the Y register. Um, it's stored in memory location 205. I can then transfer the contents of the Y register over to the accumulator with TYA. Then I wanna move that back to a memory location that BASIC keeps track of so I can draw the contents of the accumulator on the screen. And here's the actual decimal values for those assembly commands and the, you can see the memory locations in here. Um, and uh, we store these in memory um, and then can point BASIC to them to execute those assembly commands. All right, that's it. I uh, hope you enjoyed the demo um, and please give it a try on real hardware. Thank you. All right, uh, Jason, can you unmute? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, Chris, do we have any questions for Jason? He had an interactive Atari. I think that was pretty cool. Um, you know, using assembly language and like in, in looking at the processor like that, it's really, really cool looking. Any questions, Chris? Looking at the chat right now, I don't see anything coming in at the moment. Um, do you have any questions, Jeff? Oh, did it just come in? Oh, oh, it wasn't a question. Oh, okay. Uh, so the question is, is the 6502 simulator, is it written in basic? So, um, yes, it is written in BASIC, and, um, and first of all, I, I, I don't think of it as a simulator because you're, you're actually executing assembly commands which interact directly with the 6502. So the way I think of it is it's a program for you through a BASIC interface to manipulate the 6502 directly by executing assembly commands. Oh, okay, great. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Chris? Do we have any more questions? I do not see any other questions right now. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Jason. I, I really like oh, yeah. that video. Someone is um, typing. I, oh, someone's typing. Well, let's wait one second. But while we're waiting, uh, I would I would I really like that vi video, and I would hope that someone had made something similar for the Commodore sixty four because that's one of my favorites. But. Um, Atari has always had a soft spot for me since the Atari 2600. I really want to get more into the Atari computers because they have got a lot of great uh, hardware there. Um, so I think it was really awesome what you did. All right, so we do have another question, Chris. Yes, 
the question is for SBC to work, you'd need carry to be set. So presumably carry is being simplified away. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah I've, I've simplified this uh, to make it um, somewhat idiot proof, right? So the, the ranges are set, the, the carries are set so that um, it's just simple, simple integer manipulation. So I have simplified it to make it make it work. All right, great. Okay, and we have one more comment here. Maybe it's not a question, but uh, maybe it's something that we can um, look at. Uh, I don't know if that's what was used, but I loved Waz's single step in the Apple II monitor. I wrote a 6809 version once, and that was from Elwin. And I just want to say this would be pretty easy to port to the Commodore 64. The the basic source code is pretty pretty straightforward. Um, I think you know the graphics would have to be changed, but uh, the the guts of it would be pretty similar, I would think. Yeah, I'd love to see that. And another one, um, Eric S asks, could this be used while another program is running to debug stuff? I don't see how that would be possible. Maybe it could be modified to do something like that, but it's an interesting idea. I'll definitely think about that. And another question, can it run on my VCF 6502 name badge? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> All right. Um, it looks like it was, someone's typing. We'll wait to see if there's one more question left. Um, While we're right. waiting, I want to thank you guys for all your hard work to put this together. I know um, I, I can only begin to imagine how much time you guys have put into organizing this. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I appreciate you doing your stuff, but yeah, thank you for that. It's, yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, I had to do a lot of the work because we had to reschedule. So a lot of other people had other obligations. So uh, a lot of behind the scenes things. It's a, quite a different thing to do a in-person show. There's a lot of physical stuff moving around and coordination. And, and it, I've done those for a few years. And so it really worked out well, but then shifting to a virtual show, it's a whole different thing. You got to start bugging people to get their videos. Who's going to do the videos, it's scheduling. And so it's a lot of different. So yeah, I'm glad it's here and I'm glad we're going. Yeah. All right. Um, one more question, Chris. Yes. Tony Bogan asks, hi, Tony, what are you doing? Come on over here. Hey, uh, you mentioned the GPU in the Atari machines. What was the resolution of those graphics? Yeah, let's see. Um... I don't know if I can say them off the top of my head on the spot, but um, there were um, uh, multiple resolution modes. Um, yeah, I, I uh, blanking on the top of my head, but uh, they're easy to look up. And someone responds higher than the apples. Yes, definitely. <laughs> all right. That's all the time we have for questions. I thank you, Jason, for doing that. I hope to see you again in person in April, um, hopefully when we do our live show. Um, so we got to move on. The next one up is uh, the linotype. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Stephen Edwards. Stephen Edwards is going to do Inside the Apple II. Um, it's a class, so it's about... 30 minutes long. Um, so it's really great. It's Stephen had done the talk for VCF West. Um, and you guys can look that up on our, our YouTube channel, Vintage Computer Federation. All right. So without further ado, Andy, you can hit it. I'm Stephen Edwards. I'm going to tell you about some of the details of the hardware of the Apple II, one of the early successful home computers. Let me start by saying I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here. The Apple II has been fantastically well documented in part by Apple Computer itself in the form of the Technical Reference Manual, which was really polished by the 1979 edition. Two other amazing books, which both came out in 1983, each present the details of the Apple II hardware in incredible detail. 
Winston Gaylor's Apple II circuit description, and James Sather's Understanding the Apple II. I've drawn liberally from both books. Most of the technical drawings I show are from them. Another classic is Don Worth and Peter Lechner's Beneath Apple DOS from 1981. While it focuses mostly on software, its low-level description of how bits are encoded on the Apple II floppies is excellent. The Apple II was released in June 1977, which you should be able to guess by looking at this early ad in Byte magazine. Clear the kitchen table, bring in the color TV, plug in your new Apple II, and connect any standard cassette recorder player. From the beginning, its ability to display color images was a major selling point, even though it initially shipped with only 4K of memory. Not surprisingly, the best way to understand the internals of the Apple II is to understand its video capability, since virtually every aspect of its design was motivated by video. First, let's talk about what video was like in 1977. From the ad, it's clear that you were expected to bring your color TV into the kitchen and hook it up to your Apple II, so let's talk about how that color television works. Analog video encodes images as an electrical waveform. At each point in time, the height of the wave tells us how bright the image is at that point. The most important thing is that images are scanned in raster order. We start looking at a tiny region in the upper left corner, then proceed horizontally to the right. At the end of the first line, we go back to the left and start again, slightly lower than we were before, just like reading a book. We can reconstruct the image by turning the waveform back into a series of light and dark regions. It's important to carefully follow the same raster path we did when we scanned the image. If we scan hundreds of horizontal lines, we get a realistic looking image. If we update the image 60 times a second, we get the illusion of smooth movement. In 1977, the cathode ray tube, or CRT, was the dominant display technology. You may remember these as TVs. A CRT is a vacuum tube with a large, flat face leading to a thin neck. At the end of the neck is an electron gun where a heated cathode emits electrons into the vacuum. An anode charged to tens of thousands of volts attracts the electrons and sends a beam of them flying towards the face, which is covered in phosphor, a substance that emits light when bombarded with electrons. The strength of the electron beam is controlled electrically by the image waveform we talked about earlier. Electromagnets placed around the neck deflect the beam. These electromagnets are called the yoke. The television uses these to smoothly sweep the beam across the face of the CRT. A television uses two sets of magnets, one for vertical deflection and one for horizontal. By sweeping the electron beam across the face following the raster path and controlling its brightness, the image can be reconstructed. Do this fast enough and the image will appear to move. Now we can start to talk about video in the Apple II. The Apple II has three video modes. Everything is derived from the 40 character by 24 line text mode. Text mode characters are 5 pixels wide, 7 pixels high, and are displayed in a 7 by 8 pixel grid. 8 pixels high is a natural choice because 5 by 7 characters are attractive looking and because it's a power of 2. 7 pixels across will turn out to be both brilliant and very awkward. Each of the 64 possible characters is represented with a single byte in memory. The extra two bits control two character attributes, inverse and flashing. 40 times 24 is 960, a little shy of 1K. Here's the complete character set. Flashing characters were used for the cursor and to annoy your family members. The original Apple IIs only supported uppercase. Lowercase arrived in 1983 with the Apple IIe. Remember that televisions scan in raster order so that to display a character, the Apple II has to provide a waveform for each row of the character. Here's how Gaylor illustrates it. For the second row of an A, the first two pixels are black, then white, black, white, and finally two more black pixels to complete a seven pixel wide row for the character. The desired waveform has two humps corresponding to the two white pixels. Here's Gaylor's block diagram of the circuitry used for text mode. The byte for the character, say an A, arrives encoded on eight wires on the left, along with VA, VB, and VC, which tell us which row to display. These addresses are fed into character generator ROM A5, which generates five pixel brightness values for the row of the character. These five pixels are fed into shift register A3, which spits them out in order through the serial out signal. If you looked here, you would see the waveform for the character. 
This waveform is fed into exclusive OR gate B2, which may invert all the pixels to give inverse or flashing characters, then into multiplexer A9, which selects among text, low-res, and high-res graphics, and then is eventually fed out through transistor Q3 to the television set. Low resolution or low res mode follows naturally from text mode. Each character is split horizontally into two rectangles, and each rectangle can display one of 16 colors. The top rectangle's color is selected by the lower four bits of each byte, and the bottom by the top four bits. While low res mode can cover the whole screen, the Apple II has the ability to display four lines of text at the bottom, which is very useful when you are coding or if you want to display some text along with the graphics. Low res mode uses the same memory as the text mode. So when you switch back to text without clearing the screen, you see the graphical image coded in annoyingly flashing characters. Now here's perhaps Waz's greatest trick. He generates the waveforms for color graphics in almost exactly the same way he does for text characters. To see this, let's look carefully at this low-res color image. By itself, it's colorful, but not especially instructive. But let's try switching to a black and white television. The colored regions turn into a bunch of closely spaced vertical lines. If we look more closely, we see that the image is still fundamentally digital. That is, everything is either black or white, there is no gray, although regions that have more white pixels appear as brighter colors. This is not an artifact of the emulator I used to capture these images, but is an accurate reflection of how the Apple II generates video. Waz's basic trick was to generate these vertical lines at the so-called colorburst frequency, which tricks a color television into thinking they represent colors. His technique was so bizarre that he got a patent on it, which I'll now explain. But first, no, we're not experiencing technical difficulties. It turns out if you can understand this test pattern, it helps you understand video on the Apple II. The waveform for one line of these color bars looks like this. If you looked closely at the blue regions, you see they were high frequency sine waves, around 3.6 megahertz. So the first clue is that white is a flat line and solid colors are rapidly oscillating signals. Another clue comes if we look at the color bars in black and white only. Here, the brightness decreases smoothly from left to right, just as the average of the waveform does. The brightness, or luminance, of the image, regardless of color, is effectively the average of these oscillations. We need two more numbers to characterize colors. The amplitude of the oscillating waveform indicates the saturation of the color. White, black, and grays all have low saturation. Bright red, blue, green, yellow, purple, cyan, or any other pure color has high saturation. In the color bars, the yellow is slightly less saturated than the others, so it looks a little whiter than the others, but the effect is subtle. The final thing we need is the hue of the color. This is whether it is red, blue, green, or some other angle on the color wheel. Here's the color wheel North American televisions use. Note that the saturation goes from high at the boundary to low near the center in this drawing. The hue is encoded in the phase of the oscillations, that is, how well they match up with the television's internal oscillator, which runs at the same speed as the color oscillations. As you might imagine, it's important to get the television to agree with the broadcaster about the phase of these oscillations. To do this, a color burst signal is sent at the beginning of each line of video, but off screen so you generally can't see it. Now you can understand Waz's color trick. The Apple II video circuitry runs at about 14.3 megahertz, which Waz chose to be exactly four times the color burst frequency. So if the Apple II outputs a digital waveform with period four, the TV will interpret the waveform as color and display it as such. This is exactly what happens in the low res mode. Here's Gaylor's block diagram of it. Again, eight data bits arrive on the left from memory. These are the same bits that are delivered when the screen is in text mode, but this time they're treated as two 4-bit colors, one for the upper rectangle and one for the lower. These two 4-bit numbers are fed into two 4-bit shift registers that send the 4 bits out serially to the multiplexer A9, which decides whether to display the waveform for the top rectangle or the bottom one. As in text mode, the output of MUX A9 is fed through Q3 and out to the television. Let's look at Gaylor's illustration for the waveform of one specific low-res color. Low-res color 2 is dark blue. In binary, 2 is represented as a single 1-bit. When fed out repeatedly through a shift register, it generates this waveform, which is high 25% of the time and low 75%.
Since luminance is encoded as an average of the waveform, this waveform has a low average, so it will appear dark. Furthermore, this is a digital waveform, so its amplitude is large, so the color will appear saturated. Finally, look at the waveform for blue compared to that of the color burst signal. There's a 180 degree phase delay, which gives it a blue hue. Now consider low res color 6, usually called medium blue. In binary, 6 is two ones in a row, so we get a 50% duty cycle waveform with a slightly longer phase delay. It still looks blue, but the luminance is higher because the average of the waveform is higher, and the color is more cyan-like than deep blue. Light blue is low res color 7, which in binary is three ones. Moreover, the central one is in the same place as the lone one in color 2, so the TV interprets this color as having the same hue as dark blue. However, this waveform's duty cycle is 75% rather than 25%, so the luminance is higher and the color appears lighter. Here's the full collection of low-res colors, which I've arranged according to increasing luminance. Black is all zeros. Magenta, dark blue, dark green, and brown are each encoded with a single one bit, so they appear dark with low luminance. Purple, medium blue, green, and orange each have two adjacent ones. They have higher luminance, but slightly different hues than the first group. There are two gray colors, which arises from feeding the TV every other bit. This produces a waveform at twice the color burst frequency. The TV just gives up trying to guess the phase of this waveform and treats it as having no saturation, in other words, gray. The next group of colors each have three ones. These are complementary to the dark group. They have the same hues and saturation, but have much higher luminance. Finally, white is color 15, which is all ones. This doesn't produce a changing waveform, so it's not interpreted as a color, just high luminance. In other words, white. There's one other subtlety in low-res mode. Remember that there are seven text mode pixels per character, but that the color burst signal is half this speed. This means that even and odd-numbered columns are 180 degrees out of phase from each other. While Waz could have fixed this in software by insisting you use color 1 in even columns and color 4 in odd columns, he fixed it in hardware by generating different waveforms for even and odd bytes. Here's how Gaylor illustrates it. For low-res color 6, medium blue, Waz outputs 01100110 for even columns and 10011001 on the odd columns. To do this, he taps the circular shift register B4 in either the first or the third bit using multiplexer A9. Now let's talk about high resolution mode or high res. High res is also based on text mode, but uses 8 bytes per 7x8 pixel region instead of just 1. This provides individually addressable pixels, but consumes a lot of memory by 1977 standards, 8 kilobytes. The Apple II high res mode can display six colors, purple, green, blue, orange, black, and white. The vertical resolution of high res mode is 192, which is simply 24 times 8, but the horizontal resolution is complicated. There are 280 black and white pixels horizontally, but color requires 2 bits per pixel, so there are effectively 140 color pixels. Waz added high res mode through a clever modification of his low res circuitry. Here's Gaylor's block diagram of the high res circuitry. In high res, the two 4 bit shift registers used for low res are configured as a single 7 bit shift register by data selector A8. The result is that for each 7 pixel text mode column, high res mode again reads a byte from memory, but then shifts out the 7 bits individually rather than how low res repeatedly emits the color in the top or bottom 4 bits. There's yet another subtle thing happening here. The color burst frequency is exactly half the text and high res bit clock frequency of about 7 MHz. So using Waz's color trick, we should only get two colors in addition to black and white in high res mode. But of course, Waz squeezed out two more. Interestingly, high res on the very earliest Apple II motherboards only supported four colors. In the June 1979 edition of Byte magazine, Alan Watson III published an article discussing how color worked on the Apple II, to which Waz responded by showing how to extend the high res color gamut by adding two chips. He did mention that adding this circuit voided the warranty. What Moz suggested adding in that article became a standard part of Apple II's after then. In Gaylor's block diagram, this modification appears as flip-flop A11, which delays the waveform coming from the shift register by half a cycle. The otherwise unused most significant bit of each high-res byte selects whether this delay is inserted. If the flip-flop is bypassed, the byte can display green and violet. If the flip-flop is used, you get orange and blue. 
Unfortunately, unlike in low res, bits are shifted out the same way in even and odd columns. The result is that code for, say, all green in an even column appears all violet in an odd column. This is fixed in software, of course, but adds yet another challenge for the Apple II programmer attempting to do fast high-res graphics. One side effect of these bizarre color rules is that you can't mix green and violet with blue and orange in the same byte. There were a few tricks to get around this issue. One was to stick to a single palette only. For example, here's Karataka, which uses only the blue-orange palette to great success. Another trick was to stick to black and white sprites against a colored background. Congo Bongo does this. Another fundamental trick Waz used in the Apple II was to run the memory at exactly twice the speed of the processor. Waz explains this in an article he wrote for the May 1977 issue of Byte Magazine. A fundamental problem in any processor system with a video display is that both the processor and the video display need access to the memory. One solution was to let the processor step on the video, which is what Sinclair's Bargain Basement ZX80 computer did. Notice how the screen glitches every time the 8-bit guy presses a key. This is the processor taking over. Waz's solution was to interleave the processor and the video's access to memory. The video system gains access to memory in the first half of each processor cycle, and the processor gets the second half. This way, both processor and video have all the access to the memory they need. Today, such an approach would be an odd choice because processor speeds have greatly outstripped memory speeds. Modern computer video systems have their own dedicated memory that they allow the processor to access when they're not using it. The Apple II's 5 quarter inch floppy drive, released in 1978, was crucial to its success. Waz credits it and VisiCalc for why the Apple II succeeded. By today's standards, Apple II floppies are primitive. They can only store 140 kilobytes, but for the time, they were revolutionary, in no small part because they were relatively inexpensive due to Waz's clever engineering. For reference, here's the Shugart SA400 mini floppy, the standard one on which Waz based the Disk II. Its analog board has about 19 chips. And here's the Disk II. The drive mechanism is almost the same, but its analog board has only four chips. To understand how Waz did this, let's look at the details of how a floppy drive works. Mechanically, it's fairly simple. A spindle motor turns a spindle to which a circular disk is clamped. 300 RPM is typical for five to quarter inch floppies. The disk is covered with brownish magnetic material and tiny regions of it can be selectively magnetized. The read-write head rides in circles around the disk. A stepper motor can precisely position the head a certain distance from the center to select which circle or track the head is on. The Apple II drives have 35 tracks spaced 48 per inch, so the head doesn't move far. The head can be made to write magnetic pulses on the track as the disk spins. These magnetic pulses stay in place until they're overwritten and can be also be read through the head. Here's a top view of the disk II drive. The spindle is the smaller circle near the center. The read-write head is under the black clamp on the right. The stepper motor is connected to the large white disc, which has an engraved spiral that positions the head. The spindle motor is in the upper right. Here's a close-up side view of the head against the recording surface. If you apply current to the head, it magnetizes the recording surface as shown by the arrows. If you reverse the right current, you reverse the direction of the magnetic flux on the disc. Later, when you are reading the disk and the head passes over one of these flux reversals, it induces a tiny voltage pulse that can be amplified and interpreted by a computer. The details of this process are subtle, and there's plenty of opportunity for error. But ultimately, if you record a square wave, each transition will become a flux reversal, and if you would later pass the read head over them, the read electronics will turn the transitions into pulses. Waz also did a remarkable job reducing the number of chips on the disk controller card. For contrast, here's an S100 disk controller card from 1976 with 47 ICs that perform roughly the same function. Waz's card is so simple, I can tell you exactly what each chip does. PROM P5 contains the bootstrap code, which starts the drive, moves the head, reads the first sector from the first track, and jumps to it. In short, it's responsible for the sound you always hear when an Apple II starts up. That's the sound of the stepper motor pulling the head toward the outermost track by turning that spiral groove. The 9934 handles commands from the computer like turn on the drive and bring the head in one track. The 556 keeps the drive spinning for a little while after the computer asked it to stop, 
useful for sequences of disk operations. These two chips are glue logic that do things like make sure only one drive is on at once. Finally, these three chips are the brains of the outfit. Together, they convert between the drive's serial bit stream and the parallel data used by the computer. I think this, along with the color circuitry, are some of Waz's shrewdest creations. Writing to a floppy is comparatively simple. The main thing you have to do is spit out the bits from a byte one after the other and flip the output voltage when you see a one. The one thing unusual about Waz's design is that it relies on a software timing loop. That is, the software on the processor is responsible for feeding the next byte to the drive exactly 32 processor cycles since the last. Reading is much more difficult. A central challenge is deciding when you've read a zero. Reading a one is easy. The readhead electronics delivers each one as a short pulse. But a zero is the absence of a pulse during the time you might expect a one. Although the speed at which data is written to the disk is controlled very precisely, the speed at which it is read varies because no two drives spin at exactly the same speed, and the disks are, well, floppy. So the read logic needs to be liberal about when it can declare it as read as zero. Here's how Waz's read sequencer works. First, it runs at twice the processor clock speed, or about 2 MHz. But the drive only transfers bits at one eighth that speed, that is, at about 250 kilobits per second. Assume the sequencer starts in state 2 here. Now I'm going to draw the read waveform near the top of the screen and indicate the absence of a pulse with red. In state 2, the sequencer waits until it sees the first pulse in a byte. Red arrows are taken when there isn't a data pulse. Now let's assume it sees a pulse. This sends it to the next state. Green arrows are taken when there is a data pulse. These pulses are usually just one clock cycle long. Now there shouldn't be another pulse for a few cycles, so the sequencer doesn't bother to check and just advances a few states. But starting in state 4, it starts checking for another pulse. Over the next eight cycles, if it doesn't see a pulse, it simply waits and checks in the next cycle. After nine cycles of not seeing any pulse, the sequencer decides a zero followed the initial one and clears its input register, which I'm drawing here on the right. At this point, the sequencer starts to shift the two bits it knows about into the newly cleared register. First, it shifts the one corresponding to the first pulse we saw. The black one indicates the shifting operation. And then it shifts a zero, indicating the absence of the pulse after the first one. Now let's go back and consider what happens if there was a second pulse. Typically, pulses occur every eight cycles, which is four microseconds, or 250 kilohertz. Let's assume a pulse did occur. A few cycles after the first pulse, the sequencer starts looking for a second pulse. If it sees one, it transitions down to this state, which is remembering that it just saw a second one. Then it waits a couple of cycles, and again clears the register, shifts the leading one as before, but this time it shifts a second one since we saw a second pulse. At this point, the sequencer has seen two bits at the start of a byte, so it starts looking for the third. As before, it must wait a few more cycles before it can declare there wasn't a pulse, and therefore it saw zero. But if there is still no pulse, it shifts a zero into the register and starts looking for the next pulse. And the process repeats every eight cycles. Now, if a pulse is seen during this process, the sequencer immediately knows it saw one and stops looking. Here, I've drawn the pulse the usual eight cycles after the previous one, but it isn't always exactly here. The sequencer then waits for the pulse to go away, which should happen immediately, waits two cycles, and then shifts the one it just saw and starts looking for the next bit. There are a few other corner cases. If a pulse occurs while we're shifting one zero, we need to remember it and shift out one zero one. Similarly, if we saw two ones at the start of the byte, an early third pulse could interrupt us. Now there's one other important case to consider. What happens when we see the last bit in a byte? By convention, the most significant bit of each byte written to the disk is 1. So if the most significant bit of the register is a 1, the byte is complete. This happens in two places. If the last bit is a 1, 
the sequencer transitions from the shift of one state back to the beginning like this. Similarly, if the last bit is a zero, the sequencer transitions from this state. Which brings us back to where we started, a state in which the current byte is valid and we're looking for the start of the next. All this cleverness around remembering the top two bits is to give the processor more time to realize a valid byte has been read. While all of this is going on, the processor is constantly asking the disk controller, do you have a byte? Do you have a byte? In any gray state, a valid byte is in the register for the processor to read. The complexity of what I've shown you here has mostly come from handling timing variations. There's one even bigger trick in reading a disk, synchronization. That is, figuring out where a byte sequence starts. As I've just shown you, if you start off waiting for the first pulse of a byte, this sequencer stays synchronized. But what if the processor starts reading in the middle of random bits? It turns out this sequencer will fairly quickly synchronize itself if you feed it a repeating sequence of eight ones followed by two zeros. Credit where it's due, my animation of the sequencer comes from a drawing in Sather's book, which I adapted for this presentation. Another trick of Waz's was to improve the encoding of data on the disk. The standard at the time was frequency modulation, or FM, in which every other pulse on the disk represented a clock, limiting you to only 16 of the 256 possible 8-bit codes. This made it easier to separate the data bits from the clock bits, but wasted an enormous amount of space. Of course, you always need some clock bits, but WASD used an alternative known as group code encoding, or GCR. Here's WASD's code table. Every byte starts with a 1, and there can't be more than two zeros in a row. This is still limiting, but it allows 64 codes out of 256. This brought the capacity of Apple's single-sided, single-density, 35-track floppy disks to 140K. The manufacturer, Shugart, only suggested 80K under FM. For comparison, the comparable Atari format could only store 80K. Commodore drives could store 170K and also use GCR, but required double-density diskettes and had a microprocessor in the drive. The Apple II motherboard has three rows of eight dynamic RAM chips, which are inside the white rectangle near the center of the board. Revisions before about 1980 had memory select jumpers that would allow you to use either 4K chips or 16K chips. The first Apple IIs shipped with only a single row of 4K DRAMs, but as memory prices fell, most people upgraded. By 1980, the jumpers were removed and machines shipped with three rows of 16K chips for a total of 48K. In 1979, Apple released the Apple Pascal Language System, which needed the Apple Language Card, which supplied an additional 16K of memory. Eventually, most Apple IIs acquired this card or a copy of it. There were many third-party manufacturers, including Microsoft. In 1983, Apple incorporated the function of the 16K card into the Apple IIe, since so much software, including ProDOS, had begun to rely on its presence. A 48K Apple II exhausted the 6502's 64K of addressable memory. Beyond the 48K of memory, another 12K was devoted to read-only memory for the system monitor and AppleSoft Basic, and the remaining 4K was I.O. locations. To increase the available RAM, the language card made its memory selectively appear in place of the oddborn ROMs. Even more confusingly, rather than occlude the I.O. region, the language card bank-switched a 4K range of its memory. Another notable aspect of the Apple II 16K cards was how they were installed. Note the pigtail in the lower left corner of the card. To install a 16K card, you had to remove one of the DRAM chips on the motherboard, plug in the 16-pin jumper in its place, and then install the remove chip on the card. This was a trick to save hardware. While the multiplexed addresses needed by the DRAMs could be generated from the addresses on the slots, it was much cheaper to simply steal these signals directly from the existing DRAMs. Now I want to talk a little about the Apple II power supply. For comparison, here's the Commodore PET, which was also released in 1977 and also featured a 6502 processor. The PET used a much more traditional linear power supply, the primary component of which was the enormous massive transformer, the brown mass of iron on the left in this photo. Also notable was the enormous filter capacitor, the silver blue cylinder in this photo. The Apple II's power supply was small and light by comparison. Inside the power supply, it is easy to see the difference. 
This is a so-called switching power supply, and while the technology was nowhere near as revolutionary as Steve Jobs would have you believe, it was unusual for the time. There's still a transformer, but it's vastly smaller than the one in the Commodore PET. There are also a handful of components on heat sinks and plenty of filter capacitors, but again, all are smaller than they are in the PET. Here's Gaylor's simplified schematic of the Apple II power supply, illustrating how a switching power supply works. Wall voltage is fed directly to bridge rectifier CR1, which converts the alternating current from the wall to direct current, which is then filtered by C1. Q3 is the heart of the switching power supply. It is the large trapezoidal thing with a silver circle in it near the transformer in this photo. Counterintuitively, Q3 is used to convert that hard one DC back to AC, but there are good reasons to do this. The first trick is that Q3 generates AC at about 20 kilohertz instead of the 60 hertz that comes out of the wall. And this allows transformer TR1 to be much smaller because transformers are much more efficient at high frequencies. The second trick is that because Q3 is operated as a switch, it is much more efficient than the transistors used in the PET supply, which dissipate unwanted voltage as heat. The control circuitry varies Q3's duty cycle, which allows it to regulate the output voltage, again, without wasting much energy. Full-time light dimmers often worked on the same principle. Overall, Q3 generates high voltage, high frequency AC. Transformer TR1 reduces it to low voltage AC. Diodes like CR12 and CR14 rectify it into DC, and capacitors like C10 and C12 filter it. Like the transformer, filter capacitors like C10 can be smaller than their counterparts in the PET because they are filtering higher frequency AC. Complexity is the only drawback to such switching power supplies, but this was becoming less of an issue in 1977, and virtually every computer power supply works like this today. Thanks again for your attention. In putting together this video, I realized I have only scratched the surface of this marvelous home computer from the 1970s. There is a lot more to talk about. For example, see my other video on 6502 assembly programming, which shares more insights about the Apple II's video system, along with a lengthy discussion of the instruction set of the venerable 6502 processor at the core of the Apple II. I'll remind you again of some of my favorite technical references, the Apple II reference manual, Gaylor, Sather, and Worth and Lechner. And now, Bob Bishop's Apple Vision from 1978. All right. That was great. There a lot of interesting information in that, that video, um, Stephen. That was just really awesome. I, people here uh, at the podcast studio were, dead, were, were just raving about it and um, all the different details and different aspects and the color part, uh, go, talking about the CRT, all the little tricks that Wozniak was doing. That was really a great video, and a lot of people are going to want to watch that again um, here. I saw, I've seen it, of course. I watched all the videos, but some of these guys didn't have a chance to watch all of them, so they're going to be happy to watch it again later. Um, so, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's uh, definitely pretty dense. Uh, my goal was, yeah, you'll pick up something the first time you watch it, but uh, there's two things. One, it's going to go on YouTube, uh, and secondly, YouTube has this great, a speed feature where you can speed things up if they're boring or slow them down if they're overwhelming. I'm assuming the uh, latter will be appropriate for mine. <laughs> overwhelming, yes. So lots of lots of good details. It shows that you're a computer science professor who really know and really knows your stuff about vintage computers too. So, um, all right. So we have some questions. Um, Stephen, do you want to start reading off? Yeah, yeah. So uh, t somebody asked during the uh, the talk uh, for some of the old. So most of that video was mine, um, but I did steal a, a, a bit of it. So the two things that I stole were a, a very nice video on uh, uh, CRT internals uh, and so forth. And I've put something inside the Apple II. So it's, it's on YouTube, and I put a credit on the on the bottom of the. Uh, the thing, but yeah, I did not do the animations of the uh, the CRT. Uh, I also uh, stole that stuff from the eight bit guy where he was demonstrating the the glitchiness of the uh, the ZX uh, eighty or whatever it was. That was good. Uh, let's see. Other people 
uh, asked here. Uh, let's see. Somebody was asking about the power supply. The pet had to drive the the monitor. The Apple II didn't include that. That I don't believe that had much of an effect on the pet. Uh, the pet used, I believe, a pretty standard uh, 12 volt uh, monitor chassis that then reproduced all the, the high voltages off the rest of it. And I don't think the uh, the the 12 volt load on it was all that substantial. So I don't know that it mattered all that much. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think I actually attached a small uh, uh, monitor like that to an Apple II at one point and the, and the power, the switching power supply was able to handle it. So I don't think that was a huge, uh, a huge example of that. Uh, let's see, somebody else commented uh, during the uh, talk that you could change the character ROM on the Apple II to give it lowercase. And yes, indeed. In fact, uh, if you're really sharp-eyed, uh, at one point, uh, the, one of the later uh, Apple II motherboards I was displaying there, uh, if you notice, actually doesn't have the original ROM on it. That's my personal one uh, that I bought from uh, a guy quite literally in a dark alley in, in uh, Brooklyn at one point. And uh, they had put in the uh, uh, the character ROM. So if you're if you're really clever there, you can go and take a look and and see that the character ROM is not original in that. Um, but the uh, uh, the operating system software didn't really know what to do with the uh, lowercase char characters for most most of the time. Uh, let's see. Did anybody else see any other questions coming up? Chris, any questions? Any more? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm seeing. Yeah, I'm the seeing one that just came in. Here. Yeah. So, um, uh, was he far above engineers of his era? Somebody's asking about Woz. So, Woz's uh, main skill, uh, and that put him way ahead uh, of the game of virtually everybody else, was taking stock parts and making them do stuff that you didn't think they were capable of doing. And his disc controller card with, you know, a whopping eight. ICs on it right. uh, is just insane. Uh, if you look at that, and it's just nuts. Now, in putting together this video, the thing that occurred to me, the thing that really separates the Apple II from the other uh, uh, personal computers of the era was the absence of custom chips. The only custom chips on the, on the board were the ROMs, and those kind of don't count. Uh, and you compare that with the, the the Commodore 64, or the uh, Atari, or any of the other uh, things of that era, all of which had custom video chips. The fact that Woz got the video and the, the drive working with essentially no custom chips is just breathtaking. Um, so yes, engineers back then were pretty smart at using limited resources. Uh, this, in fact, has always been the mark of good engineering. Woz was exceptional even by the standards of the day. Uh, let's see. Somebody else commented also the video design also gave dynamic RAM refresh for free, uh, plus it fit into the way the 6502 accessed memory. Yes, all of this is is true. I didn't even mention the 60 the uh, the vi video refresh uh, uh, for the dynamic RAM chips. Uh, some other people had, had looked at this presentation and said, "Oh, you left out this, you left out that, or whatever." Of course, I left out thousands of details <laughs> about all of this. Um, and so it, uh, yes, the the one drawback to the the Apple II's uh, construction is it was it was too cleverly integrated, and it didn't really take into account that the fact that processor speeds would increase and memory speeds would increase in the future. And so when it came to uh, doing things like the various accelerators that. Uh, uh, were built for the, the Apple II that eventually made their way into the Apple II GS and the Apple II C+. Um, they were sort of insane hacks as opposed to the, oh, let's just speed things up like you were able to do on the IBM PCs. Uh, how well do Woz's video techniques translate to more modern display devices? Uh, horribly, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, Woz's uh, display trick was all about um, how can we sort of deal, 
how can we fool the circuitry of a late 1970s color television into doing stuff it wasn't really intended to do? And uh, as a result, about 50% of the time you hook up uh, an Apple II to a modern uh, flat panel or whatever, it befuddles the uh, little chip in there that's going in and trying to take the analog video and trying to turn it into uh, turn it into color. So you can you can it can just give up and say I can't figure out what the colors of these things are. Uh, the horizontal and vertical sync is just different enough where about half the time it can't be figured out. And I remember trying to record uh, a video from the Apple II on an '80s era VCR, and it was not too happy. It it had a hard time. So, uh, very, very clever, but too clever in, in practice, which is true for a lot of Waz's designs. Steven, got a couple more here. I'm not sure if you got these. Uh, question is, does your Columbia.edu site house most of this, or do you have another space online? Uh, so, the Columbia EDU site de definitely has... Um, uh, all of my stuff. For this video, I don't have much up there. I, I should put up some of the slides I did. The uh, uh, I had a lot of fun and used, I don't know, you know, 37 different tools or whatever to put together that video, and I've, I've documented it a little bit. Uh, let's see. Were Waz's color and disk control considers hacks or innovations at the time they were inter originally released? Um, yes. Uh, they are absolutely hacks, and they were amazing that they were able to figure it out. Now, the one thing that's kind of interesting, and I should go back and check the uh, uh, check the prices at the time. So these hacks, these these tricks that he played to reduce the the cost, uh, dramatically reduced Apple's manufacturing cost. But I don't think the other Steve passed much of that along to the uh, uh, the users. Uh, and so that's uh, uh, that was one of the interesting things. And you know, I, I you have to go back and look at the the cost of what uh, Apple was selling its drives for versus Atari versus uh, Commodore and so forth at the time. Um, Waz did use stock stuff, but one were they low cost, and did they have this, the same performance with others? Um, so they did not have the same performance. There's no question that the video system on the Commodore 64, say, uh, or on the Atari was more advanced, could do fancier stuff at the time. What was clear in putting together this presentation is that Apple really was started out of a... a, a garage, and you can really tell that they did not have a lot of capital. And the big difference is, is that if you look at Atari and Commodore, they had capital that they could sink into designing these custom chips. Apple did not, and it did not. And its, it's design reflects that. And so in some sense, it's sort of an oddity. Uh, the, the pet was a little bit closer, although still with the, the, the big uh, physical design of it or, or what have you. Um, but this is really the big thing. Now, when the Apple IIe came along, this is after Apple was much more established, they went the, the custom chip route uh, because ultimately, if you can do custom chips, the per unit cost is much lower than using stock stuff. Um, however, uh, this was what Waz had to work with. This is what he knew how to work with. And this is what he produced. I think another one came in. Uh, how similar different is the Apple II to the original Apple I, particularly with regard to the circuitry reuse? Uh, yeah, so remarkably little. So from what I can tell, uh, the Apple I and the Apple II, the commonalities were the 6502 processor, although you could uh, substitute in a, a 6800 uh, pretty easily. The video system was very, very different. So they both had more or less the same text display, but the way it was realized was just night and day different. So there's really not too much, uh, really not too much there is all. Yeah, Jobs was never much for passing on cost savings to the customer. Yeah, I think we uh, uh, have to do it. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, even more fun is to record Atari 2600 v video on a VCR. Um, some of them don't get the line counts right. Yeah, I can't imagine trying to record uh, uh, 2600 video. All uh, right, Stephen. Thank you very much for that video and answering the questions. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. We have to move on to the next thing. Uh, but anybody that's on Discord, you can go into the Inside Apple II channel there. Stephen is there, can answer any further questions you have. And that video will be up to on Monday morning for anyone to see. So the next uh, one is the Linotype machine. The Linotype machine, um, Bob Roswell is going to show it off his machine. He has it down in System Source in Hunt Valley, Maryland, uh, in his uh, museum slash workplace. Uh, it's a really amazing device. Um, so without further ado, we're going to play the video for the Linotype machine. Hello, and welcome to the System Source Computer Museum. I'm Bob Roswell, one of the curators here, and today I'd like to demonstrate our Linotype Model 31. It's a typesetter. I call it our 3,500 pound copy of Microsoft Word. Um, first of all, uh, about an hour and a half ago, our photographer, Brendan, turned the machine on. What we've done is we've melted some lead into the machine. The output of this, just jumping way far ahead, is a line of type made out of lead. We ink this, we put it in a printer, and away we go. So just to show you what's going on here, here's a used line of type. I'm gonna put it in the hot pot, and it's melting. You can see that there's um, about five cups of um, liquid lead in there. I'm melting. So let's roll the clock way back before 1455. If I wanted a document and I were alive in 1450, I would get out a quill and write it. Or if I was rich, I would ask a monk to do it. Uh, in the 1455, we got the greatest technological revolution of all time. Uh, as everyone knows, Gutenberg invented movable type and the printing press. So just to see how that worked, we would have a box full of type. If we wanted the letter M, we would get out the letter M. We would lay out each of the letters. Letters lined up, we would ink them, we would put them into a printing press, we would print however many copies we needed. We would take the used um, pieces, put them back in for tomorrow. As just a small aside, you know why capital letters are often called uppercase? Because the typesetters would go into the uppercase to get out the capital B and then the lowercase to get out the O and the B. And then when they went to write my last name, they'd go back into the uppercase to get out the R and so forth and so on. So that's the way type was set from the time Gutenberg invented the printing press until Otmar Mergenthaler moved here to Baltimore in 1880 to revolutionize typesetting. So he sat down or he formed a company, the um, Mergenthaler company, to build a line of type. So the way this thing works is we start with these little brass mats. Here's a sample mat. This one has a G on it and human readable. The business end of the mat here has the mold for a G in both italic and standard print. And then I want you to notice for later that there is a set of eight teeth that uh, are on this mat. Anyway, we have mats. We take 1,440 of these and load them into a magazine. So this magazine has 92 channels, timbers. Uh, each channel holds a column of a single letter, E's, T's, A's, I's, dollar signs, everything that's on the keyboard. We need lots of each map because when I was demonstrating this for the Redeemer Church, the Redeemer 
those just those two words used five E's, one and uh, and four and redeemer. We then load on this particular machine up to four fonts on the machine. So there's a magazine here. When I close the, uh, put the sword in to keep them from all falling out, I can crank this, and there's another map, in, another magazine beneath this that has little eight-point type, and the one before that has ten-point type, and the bottom one has fourteen-point type in it. When we set out to typecast, we have a keyboard. The keyboard is in an unusual layout. My lowercase letters are here, my uppercase letters are here, and my symbols are here. Uh, it's in E to Wayne Sherdlu. E is the most common letter in the English language, followed by T, A, O, I, N, S, and so forth. So I'm going to turn on the machine. And a couple mats drop down front that I hit the keyboard. I'm going to very slowly, because I'm a terrible typist, type V, I, N, T, A, G, E. And my keys got stuck there, so I got a lot of E's. Luckily, I have a spell check right here. So I'll get rid of the others, and I'll deal with those later. And I've written the word vintage. And then I can hit a space. And then I can write computer, C-O-N-T-U-T-E. -E. And that's sticking a little bit, R. And again, we'll fix that up. If I had, um, characters that were not on the keyboard, I would reach over here to my pi characters, and I would just manually insert the character pi or anything else that isn't on the keyboard. So now I have my line, and I'm about to line cast it. So when I go, I'm going to check that nobody has fingers and toes in the way. It's going to come up, over. The elevator is going to take it down in front of the molds. I have four different molds, each mold in this at a time. I need a different mold depending upon the width of the line and the height of the line. Then what's going to happen is a piston in the back is going to inject hot metal into the mold. And then a line of type is going to eject over here. Let's try it. Uh, make sure that's over. Up down, over, inject hot metal, rotate, pick up the used mats, put them on the sort queue so that each one of those falls back in. And out here, it's very hot, so I'm going to hold on to it. You have a line of type that says vintage computer. Now, of course, it's inside out and backwards because we're going to get a positive. I want to point out a couple of really amazing things about this. As I mentioned before, each one of these mats has the 8-bit code on it. So when I type a couple of characters here, and when we go through the cycle again, the arm is going to pick up those used mats, slide them on this binary sort queue, and each one of those is going to fall back in the proper slot. Cool. Uh, Brendan, why don't you stay over there and we'll watch the back end of this. So I'm going to type a couple of characters. Start a line cast. All mechanical. And you can hear or see each mat falling back in for the next line of type. 
So the linotype, of course, is our word processor. Word processors don't print. We send the output to a printer. So in this case, what we've done is we've lined up our various lines of type. We've used uh, some coins and some um, furniture here to put it in a chase. We put the chase in the printing press. This is a, a Heidelberg windmill press. Put ink on here. This has a pneumatic system that'll pick up a piece of paper. Put it up, 40, uh, 40 tons of pressure. And then we get our hard copy. One of the amazing things about this machine is that we got perfect left and right justification. So just like Microsoft Word knows that the M in Mergenthaler is a wide character and L is a narrow character, Word mathematically spreads out all the letters to get the left and right justification. But this is a uh, late 1800s device and it does full justification. And the question I'll ask of all of you before I tell you the answer is, how does it work? I promise you, I did not count the letters as I was typing this out. I certainly didn't do the math to figure out the width of each letter. Mergenthaler was a genius, but this took him six years to figure out a working system. The answer are these uh, space bands. So down here, instead of using a fixed M or N space, I can hit the space band. And that drops down one of these wedge-shaped pieces. So in between each word, when we do full justification, I get a variable amount of space between the words that give me the full justification effect. Pretty neat. So I'm not going to actually ink this up right now because it's a pretty big job, but we'll um, imagine that our um, chase is in here. Imagine that we have filled this up completely with ink. We're going to turn it on. We pick up a piece of paper, smash it against there, and all of these pneumatic arms are picking up one sheet of paper printing it, depositing the final copy over here. All right, welcome back everybody. Um, that was really fascinating. I really liked that linotype. I didn't wasn't able to see it there in person uh, working at the time, um, about last year, this time is November. And I was glad to see the video to see actually see with the hot lead there working. And I like the, the terminology, uppercase, lowercase, where we use these, these terms and we don't even remember where they originally came from. All right, so we have some questions for Bob. Bob is on. Hi. So one of the questions is, was lead poisoning a work hazard for typesetters? Um, not so much. People did it for a long time. Um, the lead is either in a liquid state when it's up at 550 degrees or it's in a solid state. It, it cools very quickly. Uh, the only problem that we know of is if we drop a piece of paper or debris in the hot pot, it does start to smoke and that would bring lead particles into the air. And that, that's where it becomes hazardous. So you really wanna make sure that you don't get debris into the, into the hot pot. But I did run it, uh, kept it on overnight. We had uh, some lead testing going on and there were, there were indetectable amounts. Okay, the other question we have, when was this equipment uh, manufactured, specifically the one in your demo? So the one, uh, so mine um, is from the uh, mid 1950s. I want to give a big shout out to our fellow member, Bill Dagnan, who found the original one for me. I had that one in, tried to make it work for a very long time. 
and then ended up uh, parting that one out and getting a, a different one. Um, Mergenthaler designed this in the uh, 1880s, 1890s. Uh, when we look at the models, really from about 1900 on, they're very similar to this. Uh, the Model 31 was introduced in roughly 1931, 1932, and they were produced with minor variations um, really up and through up until 1970s when they went bankrupt. How often did people get injured using Linotype? Um, it depends if they're a pro or they're like me. Uh, I have hurt myself with it. Um, the biggest hazard is what we call a squirt, and that's when things aren't lined up right and the uh, lead squirts out, literally, and it's hot. Um, if you're not careful, it, it's certainly not an OSHA approved uh, sort of technology. Uh, you could you could certainly hurt yourself with it. Although uh, I think the printing press may be more dangerous with all with all the pressure that it has. I, I've I've cut myself on it. I've burnt myself, but no, nothing serious. Way safer um, than riding my bicycle. Oh. <laughs> uh, do you know, was this the same model linotype that was used in the Twilight Zone episode? I do not. Um, the variations, as I said, were, were fairly small. The Model 31 had four fonts on it at a time. There were less expensive models that took one font, um, and you had to physically um, move the magazine. There were models that had eight fonts. There were versions that you could put a paper tape on. So you could grab a paper tape, load it, and it would automatically typeset. So uh, a paper tape could be brought by train or, or even telegraphically um, to a newspaper for them to set the news wires. Uh, did you have to remove the stuff that floats to the top of the molten metal from the hot lead? And I actually, from my experience in uh, using electronic uh, wave soldering machines, I believe that's called dross. Is that dross, the same? Yes. yes. It's, it's, it's the same thing. I just have a ladle. I just have a pan coated with tin foil, and I take that out to get higher quality. And how many times can you melt the metal? Is there a maximum number that would make it incapable of use? So I guess uh, what happens with lead after you melt it multiple times? Uh, really not much at all. Luckily, everything else floats to the top. Um, they, they were they were reused. We recast it. Uh, when I'm just dem demonstrating it uh, one at a time, I just put the used mats back in the hot pot as I demonstrated. Um, if you were doing it commercially, you would put and make that pig because there's a mechanism, a float mechanism that keeps the level of the lead proper in the in the pot. Okay, they're rolling in here, Bob. I hope you have a few minutes. Uh, beyond general lubrication, what kind of maintenance work it is needed to be done to keep these running on a day-to-day -day basis? Sure. So we have a book of what to do every hour. There is a huge amount of cleaning. You may have noticed when I was typing that many of my keys stuck. That's just plain dirt. So what you have to do is you have to take those mats, you have to clean them, you have to rub them in, in graphite to keep them running smoothly. Um, it has belts, it has grease points. Um, it was working when I made the video, I've broken it again. I've sprung an oil leak in the quadding mechanism that does the justification. So now when I turn it on, it's, it squirts oil. And uh, luckily there's a man by the name of Dave Seat who travels around the country and does the repairs that are beyond my, my abilities. Uh, and I just wanted to read a comment. Eric S. says that he hopes you use this to type every letter you send out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, another question, where did you find this machine? And is it how textbooks were mass produced in that time? So questions. Um, all sorts of printed material. Most of these you would see in, in newspapers, but there's a, a great video that's about an, uh, at least an hour long. It's called Linotype the Film, where you'll see these at the government printing office. They had 300 of them that they shoved out the window um, when, when photo typesetting became available. Um, I'm sorry, repeat the question. 
I lost my train. Uh, okay, hang on one second. I hope I I deleted it. Where did that one go? Um, uh, textbooks. I don't know as much yeah. about textbooks. We we tend to see it much more on um, newspapers, magazines, um, government documents, but you, you can really use it for any, any, anything that you want. Oh, we, uh, the question was, where did you find this machine? Oh, so um, Bill Degnan uh, called me up one day and said he really wanted it, but it wasn't going to fit in his house. So uh, the original one was at the uh, Union Press Company in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, I, I drove up in my, I think I had an, a Honda Accord at the time, and my wife said, why don't you take the minivan? It looks big. And I'm like, no, it's not going to fit in the minivan. So we arranged for a rigger. And uh, while it would fit in our warehouse, I couldn't get it from the warehouse onto the museum floor. So that required uh, taking the window taking the windows out and, yeah um some some people who are much big, bigger and stronger than i to uh, get it into the onto the floor and the question says when was the printing press manufactured i assume he was talking about this linotype machine uh, but so, you can answer either uh, not, not not the linotype the, the, um at the end i showed a uh, heidelberg windmill oh. and that, that's a mid-1950s machine as well I also now have a beautiful hand press that's from 1909. Um, but that I have to manually insert one page at a time. That's where you can really hurt yourself when you're inserting. Uh, how many prints can you get out of the result of the linotype before it starts to look bad? I assume does is there does the lead wear out if you use it for many copies? Um, because I came to this many years after these were used in production, um, there's no practice. There's no, I assume if you're doing 100,000 newspaper, uh, let, let's put it this way, the, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Baltimore Sun, the Washington Post, uh, all would have used these for their daily runs. I don't know how big the runs were back in the day, but you could certainly do all of them. Okay, and the last question, in quotes, is, is this the same model line of type dropped on the Coyote by the Roadrunner? <laughs> <laughs> no clue. I'll have to look up that reference. <laughs> I don't know who said that. I think, uh, oh, someone says, how old is the format for bordering? It's a, the, the guy typed a, a plus sure, with dashes and another decoration plus around it. Um, I believe that was done again by calligraphers or you know people who were writing long before printing the decorations, and then you can certainly do those if you're doing hand letterpress. And then we have we have mats that do the same thing. All right, thank you, Bob. Uh, a lot of questions. That was great. I really loved it. Um, so if you guys um, are in Discord, there's this channel there, Lionel Type, if, if you want to ask him further questions. And um, Bob, do you still have your you have your museum um, open right now, or it has limited op uh, opening status right now? So the museum, um, we're, we're asking uh, two visitors at a time, wearing masks, of course. Uh, I can be a little bit flexible with that if, if there's three or four of you, but we're not not looking to have, we're not inviting our usual school groups or other groups in. Yeah, but, yeah, it's so. understandable. So do you do like, so you, if people have to let just show up or they just have like a way to um, arrange? It, 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 most of us are working remotely. So what would be great is go, go to the website. My phone number is there. My email address is there. Um, mm -hmm. Brendan and I are usually around to give tours. Um, Brendan's usually there on weekends. I'm, I'm usually there during the week. All right. Well, thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. And again, everybody, you can go to Discord channel if you want to ask him further questions. Uh, we're going to sh be shifting to a live uh, broadcast um, in our in our classroom area of CDL. We have we'll have. Alex J. Cox and Jonathan Sturges, uh, they're going to be doing 6502 Graphics Evolution. They have, we're here on site. We have their exhibit table set up. 
um, and Corey Cohen is going to be the cameraman there interviewing them. First live second segment for VCF East in 2020. Yeah, thanks very much for bearing with all of us as we uh, deal with the delays from COVID, and we're really happy that you all could join us remotely. We're going to be talking about the evolution of graphics on 6502-based microprocessor systems. And it's truly amazing how many years that that processor has endured. In fact, in 2020, there are devices being made with 6502s in them. And there's an entire company called Western Design Center that still sells 6502s for a variety of applications. That's really impressive, the legacy of that, of that processor. So, of course, the 6502 was designed by Chuck Peddle. Uh, he originally worked for Motorola. And then he split off and formed his own company called MOS. And that is the basis for all of these machines. The first machine we're going to talk about here is sitting right in front of me here. It's a Commodore PET. This particular model is a PET 4032-12. It is, it is a later PET, but we're going to start and we're going to talk about as if this was 1977. So in 1977, there was a trifecta of personal computers that came out to make personal computing really realistic for home users. We have the Commodore PET, which is actually the last in 77 to come out. And we have the machine I'll talk about next, which is the Apple II sitting right next to it. And then we also have the TRS-80 Model 1. So there's some really amazing things. So since we're talking about graphics, we'll show what is possible and how that evolved over time. So on the pet, as you can see, we're actually showing here, we're showing a demo of a, a new game that will be coming out uh, later this year, or early next year, I'm not sure exactly which. Uh, it's by a, a guy, a YouTuber you may familiar with, called the 8-Bit Guy. Uh, it's called Pesky Robots. It is showing character graphics on the 6502. And that's what these pets were capable of. There was no graphics hardware in them whatsoever. They did have video RAM for storage of what was going to be outputted on the screen, but there's no graphics hardware. But it does show, if you look at this system, that you can move around and it's, it's pretty impressive the capability and how fluid you can be without any sort of graphics hardware whatsoever. So it shows what the capability of the systems are. It also shows that there's still interest in these 6502 systems and pushing the limits on them in 2020, which is truly amazing. So the next system we're going to talk about here is we're going to talk about the original Apple II. There probably aren't too many more directly influential microcomputers. Um, this machine has had enormous sales, uh, maybe not quite so many as, as the Commodore 64. There's always that discussion of what was the best-selling microcomputer of all time. And there's, depending on the metric, there's all kinds of different arguments, just like everything in history. But this is, this is an original model Apple II. It is a later version. The original versions wouldn't have had these slots in the case, and the keyboard is slightly different. And this one, of course, has been slightly modified over the years as parts failed. But this is an original Apple II, and we're showing on it is a game you're going to see repeated across a lot of our machines. This is Defender. So we're showing Defender on various systems so you can directly compare. When you compare the graphics on the Apple II to the PET, you'll see, first of all, it does have graphics. Um, the Apple II has a really interesting graphics setup where uh, the layout in RAM for the graphics is a little odd. And the reason it was laid out the way it was by Steve Wozniak is because by having the graphics memory arranged the way it is within main RAM, you could both eliminate the dedicated graphics memory that the PET had, and also you could refresh the dynamic random access memory, or DRAM, without extra chips, just by having the screen layout being the way it is in RAM. So it makes for a really fascinating system. If you compare this, you'll see even without, there's no sprites. Um, which we'll talk about a little bit what a sprite is when we get to a computer that has one. This system has no sprites, has no uh, hardware movement of graphics. It just relies on you know, off-screen buffering and what, a technique called racing the beam or updating when things are not in use and not displayed. But you can see we can have fairly wide moving display items. We can have things move clearly. We have some fairly sharp and color graphics. The other interesting thing is there's no dedicated color circuitry in this Apple II. It uses a technique called artifact graphics, which is pretty darn amazing. Uh, again, to keep the part count down, because things like RAM and chips, the ICs that run the system, were astonishingly expensive in 1977 and 1976 when these were actually designed. 
But to keep the part cap down, they use a technique called artifact color, which is a, a NTSC, or, or our national television standard uh, in the United States and, and some other countries. But it, it's, it's an after effect of how the system works. And that's how the system generates color. And you may notice there's only certain colors in use on the screen. And only certain colors can be generated on certain positions in the screen. That makes for a very unique color layout. And games like Defender here, you can see actually, you can get some very bright, colorful, and changing layouts. And you can see in the ship as it moves, there's detailed color on it. And the reason those colors have to change as the ship moves from place to place. But if you do it well, like Atari Soft did when writing this game for the Apple II, you can see how it makes the system look more detailed. So over to my co-presenter here, Jonathan Sturgis. Yep. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. So next up in this uh, evolution of 6502 graphics, we go to the venerable uh, Atari uh, video computer system, or otherwise known as the 2600, uh, first introduced in uh, 1979 and uh, probably well known to almost everyone. Um, it So in 79 had the uh, innovation compared with the previous two units of actually having five sprites. Um, and uh, this, this, this is kind of a big advancement in, in gameplay because it uh, allows, well, allows you to write better games, allows you to have uh, objects moving around the screen um, without having to do a complete redraw of the screen. Um, th uh, this machine obviously for its, it's still by obviously by modern terms kind of kind of limited. I, one of the biggest um, interesting, I think, limitations on this machine was that it had um, only 128 bytes of RAM, and so it didn't even have. Um, so it, it, And uh, it uh, so it had some it had some uh, it had so just comparing it to the VCS for example um, it had uh, it it doesn't have any sprites um, uh, because we're not sure if we're broadcasting.
to see a beast. That only took 15 minutes, too. That's impressive. Hey, Corey. We're back. So it was, uh, we had, we were experiencing technical difficulties. The OBS software, I guess, decided uh, it didn't like what we were doing. So, which I don't understand what we're, why, but uh, we're going to start again. Uh, uh, say, we're going to start again from, uh, just want to go back a little bit, just because I think the audio stopped. Uh, I mean, the audio kept going, but the video stopped. So if you don't mind talking a little bit more, let's start again with the Atari 2600, because I'm not sure if it's in the stream, but it's really somewhat something that most people really have, was, you know, their first touch yeah. on a computer because of it, the way it was. And I do apologize to everyone. We are still also recording this stuff um, in a high definition video, so we can kind of, you know, give you a clean one. But let's start again, and I do apologize. Once again, we are working out our technical difficulties. So, um, if you don't mind, yeah. uh, you know, start again. No uh, problem. We've got our top engineer working on this to make sure that, you know, we've got DK, our top engineer, uh, is working to make sure that this is all uh, fine. Is that right, EK? <laughs> so let's get going and let's uh, let's start from, uh, from the Atari 2600. And thank you very much, everyone online, for being so patient. So the... Uh... Yes, uh, so, so uh, going back to where uh, we were a few minutes ago, so the Atari 2600 um, followed the, um, uh, the PET and the uh, Apple II in 1979, um, and it was a, uh, probably one of the most, uh, most recognizable and most popular game consoles of the, of the uh, early 80s, for sure. Um, it had some unique, unique characteristics compared to um, the previous two machines. Um, it had a lot less RAM, uh, only 128 bytes of RAM, but it, but it was able to display 128 colors on the on the uh, NTSC version, so that was impressive for its time. It also had five sprites, um, which does uh, allow you to write more um, uh, more more advanced games, basically, um, having objects moving on the screen and um, not having to do a full rewrite of the screen um, allows you to. Uh, have things that interact with each other a little better. So it had some, some advantages. Um, uh, the um, resolution still not, you know, we're still talking, um, uh, you know, er, early um, early 80s, we're still talking about analog, most people, you know, hooking, hooking up to a, a TV at home, so low resolution stuff. Um, 160 by 192 pixels on the VCS, um, and that's with trick, that's with a little bit of trickery, that's if you kind of max out all the, um, the, the play field and the sprite pixels and kind of get creative there. But um, in the end, very good, a lot of very good game ports. Defender was a good one. Um, in some ways, it, in some ways um, you, you see it side by side with the Apple II. Um, while the, uh, there's aspects of the Apple II that, that, look, um, that look pretty good. The Apple II's port is pretty good. The, you can see, one of the things you can see on the um, VCS version is the, uh, the scrolling is much smoother and, and, and much faster, so that's pretty cool. So it did, did allow for uh, uh, Defender to be a really good, really good game on that platform. Um, and then, so following following the, the VCS in 1979, we're going to move up in time um, down to the Vic, the Commodore Vic 20. Um, well, not, um, uh, so introduced 1980, um, it was an inexpensive home computer, uh, about introduction, introduction price of uh, $300, uh, launch price of $300. And while not intended to um, complete, compete, or be a dedicated game uh, console, it certainly had uh, very good game capabilities. It was kind of a, targeted to be a low cost uh, game, a game and education machine for home use, um, and then some, you know, maybe some home finance or something on the side. But it turned out to be a pretty popular game machine. Um, did not have any sprites. Um, did take a step back in colors relative to the VCS. It only had um, 16 possible colors. Um, 
but uh, had a lot more RAM. It, it came with a, a kind of an odd number. It came with 5K of RAM by default. Only about three and a half of that is usable. Um, but then it was extendable through uh, RAM expansion on cartridges up to, uh, up to 40K in some cases. And so what that also allowed, um, actually I kind of forgot to touch on that on the, on the, on the Atari. So um, the Atari cartridges were much smaller and typically maxed out around four kilobytes. Um, there were a couple, I think, that with some trickery could, could maybe go to 64K. Um, and um, so, so here, uh, it was also quite common on the VIC to, uh, for games that needed to add some additional RAM on the cartridge with the, with the game. Um, we were, again, to compare Defender. Um, so um, the uh, Defender port here also uh, does tend to look pretty good. Um, the uh, scrolling is not quite as smooth as the VCS, but, um, but, the, uh, but the colors are pretty good. Um, platform pretty good. Um, let's see, what else was I going to say about it? I guess that's some kind of the key stuff. Um, Alex, do you want to Yeah, the only other comment it? that I'll add on the VIC-20 is that uh, going back to another system here that while, as you can see, the graphics are fairly impressive, there's actually no dedicated graphics hardware per se for sprites or anything like that. There's a chip, it, it's called, where the system gets its name, called the VIC, um, and that's what generates the output. But it's not really doing graphics. It's, it's mostly doing, it's effectively, it's a, a modified form. You can change the character set to be whatever you want. Um, but yeah, it doesn't have a, any sort of bitmap graphics capability, but it shows what you can really do with that. Yeah, thank you. That was a point I meant to make, is that it's not, not a fully addressable screen. And that was, uh, that, that's something you find later on is quite common and we expect, of course, but uh, in the early days, yeah, it didn't quite, didn't quite get there. Okay, so. well, uh, next machine we're going to move on to right next to the VIC-20. We're jumping a f uh, ahead a few years to 1983. So Atari, actually fairly early on, came out with their own competitor uh, same, uh, about the same time as the VIC-20. A little bit, uh, They had the Atari 400 and the Atari 800. Um, this Atari 800 XL that you see right here is a couple years later from 1983. And it's a, uh, it's a redesign for significant cost savings, but it also adds a ton of capability. It has 64K of RAM, so it's the most RAM we've seen in any of these systems. But it inherits a capability from the Atari 400 and 800 in the fact that it actually has dedicated graphics hardware. It, depending on the version, it either has a chip in the early systems called the CTIA, or Television Interface Adapter. Um, this system has what's called a GTIA, or a Graphic Television Interface Adapter. Um, in addition to those capabilities, uh, it, it gives it the ability to do advanced sprites. And you actually have eight sprites on screen at one time. You also have dedicated sound and a chip called the Pokey, which was also available in the uh, Atari uh, video game console line, depending on the video game console. But you also hear it in a ton of arcade games made by Atari Soft. And it, it's a pretty amazing graphics chip. It can, uh, it has very flexible, has several voices. I'm sorry, sound chip. But um, anyway, as you can see, comparing the 800 to what you saw from the VCS and what you saw in the VIC-20, you can see significantly higher resolution graphics here. Um, so you have a maximum resolution of 384 by 192 uh, with 256 colors. Um, so again, you have a much more colorful palette and as I said, eight sprites. And, and you have a, a little bit of a faster system too because um, the main processor is still 6502, this, in this case 6502B, but it's al almost twice as fast at 1.79 megahertz. Uh, it's a significant difference, and again, with the dedicated graphics chip, it means you could do a heck of a lot with this system. Um, these systems were a lot more powerful and a lot more flexible than they quite often get credit for. Uh, a lot of people saw them as just, oh, the, you know, the 800 is just an Atari 2600 with a keyboard. There's a ton more capability with that, and there's been modern expansions and modern upgrades. You know, there are a couple of them sitting here. We're not really talking about them in this, but this is uh, effectively an Atari floppy drive on a Raspberry Pi that's sitting here attached to it. Um, but it's a system. So this, this is the device I was talking about here. So. It's, it's called an S-Drive Max, and it allows you to store a ton of Atari software, and it, it looks very much like a cartridge, and it sort of is designed to look like that. So, anyway, there's a ton of different uh, software available for the Atari, and if we have time at the end of the stream, we'll show some more capabilities on it.
But for the moment, we're actually going to move on to our next system, uh, which is uh, back to my compatriot Jonathan Sturgis yep. here for the Nintendo Entertainment System. All right. So another another uh, you probably saw it earlier in the in the video uh, stream next to the Atari, but the Nintendo NES is the later NES with the uh, uh, the vertical cartridge um, slot. Uh, another extremely popular uh, worldwide game system um, in the States was introduced in about 1985. Um, it has the same speed 6502 as the uh, Atari 800, so 1.79 megahertz. Um, only 2K of onboard RAM, um, 48 color palette, 25 of which can be used um, without any trickery um, at the same time. A uh, little more resolution than the uh, VCS, uh, so 250-something uh, by 240 uh, pixels, and an impressive uh, uh, 64 sprites, so that's a, that's a huge improvement. Um, uh, definitely adding a lot, to, a lot of flexibility there for uh, game development. Um, so then there is... Uh, Original Defender is not available for this platform, but there's a Defender 2, um, and you can see, you can clearly see this looks way more advanced than the uh, other Defenders we've seen so far today. Um, the uh, sharpness of the of the of the uh, uh, of the fighter and the uh, all the and the aliens, uh, the colors are great. The scrolling is incredibly smooth. Very very nice. Very very nice port. Um, and. Uh, Makes a really good use of this of this uh, of the system, and so then this had a very long life. Uh, the Famicom version of this, which was the Japanese one, um, launched two years earlier in Japan, so in '83, and then I think ran until like 2003. So it had an incredibly long lifespan. So that's that's an incredible uh, run for a single uh, uh, little 8-bit chip like the 6502. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a note yeah. that, uh, yeah, the, the processor in this, it, it is a 6502, but in this case it was made by Ricoh. It, it's called the Ricoh 2A03. It's a very similar speed chip to what was present in the Atari 800. Um, the, it it uh, just met fab by someone else, as the 6502 has been. It's been made by many other companies throughout its lifespan. Um, but uh, it, we have slightly lower resolution than the Atari 800. We have 256 by 240. But um, an interesting palette of 48 maximum colors, but there were 64 possible sprites. So our next system we're going to move to, I'm going to have to switch the TV real quick and switch the input on it. We're going to talk about the TurboGrafx-16. Let's see if I can do this from behind. I got it. Actually, I'm pretty good at it if you want me to do it. Okay. Actually, I think okay. I got it. HDMI uh, 1. Yeah. HDMI one there, so it should be moving. Yep, okay. there we go. So, and here uh, uh, is another modern port. Again, the original version of Defender was never available on the Graphic 16. We're going to show a game that came out in 2014 called Atlantean. But again, it's it's Defender. It's a modern take on Defender and showing what it's capable of doing in this hardware. Uh, so, the TurboGrafx 16 came out originally in. Uh, in Japan in 1980, late 1985, I believe. It was called the PC Engine. So it was a very powerful system, but it, it was late in its introduction into the US market, which is why the, uh, our viewers, if we have any in Japan, will be much more familiar and in Europe with the system. Um, it, in Europe, it was the core graphics, uh, but the, the PC Engine uh, actually, even though it called itself, and again, in the US, it called itself the TurboGrafx 16 that really only uh, applies to the graphics processors. It's not a true 16-bit system. Again, this is a 65 over 2 based system. In this case, it's the Hudson C6280, which is a 6502 with some added capability added on. So it, it's kind of a system on chip, if you want to think about it that way. Um, for game consoles, it's had a ton of RAM. It's had 64K of RAM, and it's a fairly fast 6502 at uh, 7 megahertz. So, uh, pretty capable system. Uh, and again, the resolution on this, getting into more technical details, we have 565 by 242. And really, you're limited there by NTSC. That's really the limitation on this system, rather than what it was capable of doing. It was capable of the same 64 sprites as the NES. 
but you'll see, looking at the system and some of the other games, if anyone's familiar with the launch, there was a game called Bonk's Revenge that was launch title in the U.S. It's very large, uh, colorful sprites, and it supported more colors than the same sprite than the NES does, showing the evolution on 6502 graphics systems. So, very large sprites there, and you can have a sprite size of up to 32 by 64 pixels. That's a very big sprite, and they were quite colorful. We're running a little bit short on time, so we're going to jump ahead to our last system here. We're going to jump ahead to another system by Atari, the Atari Lynx. Yep, so our, our last um, 6502 machine in the uh, display today is the Atari Lynx, a uh, handheld 6502 introduced in, um, in 1989. And um, by my personal estimation, a pretty capable machine, although it never seemed to garnish, garnish the market share necessary to really be uh, successful for a long time. Sorry about this, guys. And then, um, thank you. That should have done it. <laughs> Please pardon that, guys. Yeah, okay. So, um, so, uh, and, and this really um, shows how, by the late 80s, how things had advanced. This, uh, this handheld machine now has 64K of RAM. Uh, it has a color palette of 4,096 colors. So up now once again we are sorry for the uh, technical difficulties so we're going to zoom we, back out and we, unfortunately you'll have to show the links again okay just start over the i assume the you link. should i'm not sure yeah. Yeah. let's ask yeah. the tech support yeah so you know tech support what do we do i think we start over again right <laughs> all right thank you tech support so uh so uh rewinding a bit here the uh so the atari links uh Introduced in 1989 uh, as a, uh, uh, the, uh, I, I believe the first handheld gaming platform based on the 6502. It had a 4 megahertz 6502, 64K of RAM, and had 4,096 colors, and ran off of uh, six AA batteries or, a, or an AC adapter. Um, for its time, there's no, you know, no wireless uh, technology or so forth, in, but it did have a, uh, a um, what do they call it? Uh, it, it but it, I forget what they called it, but a links, a uh, multi head uh, uh, cable. You could interconnect two links units and play head to head, which is kind of cool for the time, too. So, um, yeah, so the, so no Defender for this machine, but there's a, a Defender ish game called Gates of Zendikon. Do we need to, let's see, let's reboot this and then we'll get it, launch a game of it. But um, you can see really quickly what the, um, how uh, with, with the uh, some of the advancements here, you the uh, some of the um, the scrolling is great. Uh, we're not really showing off audio today, but this game's got pretty good sound effects. Um, and uh, let's see here. Let's see if we can get a game going here. Here we go. All right. This is our bad guy. <laughs> He's so dropping this is another brain from Metroid. Yeah, he drops, a, he drops a bunch of eyeballs for some reason. All right. All right. I don't know if I'm going to be able to play this. Uh, 
upside Another down. interesting note about the Lynx is the fact that even though it's marketed as an Atari, it was actually designed by a, a famous video game software company called Epix, is the handy. And uh, they just didn't have the money to, uh, to develop the system, so they ended up selling it to Atari, so it finally came cool. out. And it took a while to come out because of that sort of development. Um, and you can see an interesting effect here is as Jonathan's playing, you'll see that the sprite has changed. Because of the, the capability for so many sprites in the system, it's actually modifying that main player sprite, the, the ship, as it gets hit. You lose some pieces off of it then before finally being destroyed. You see that big colorful explosion. Yeah. It's a pretty impressive uh, graphical technique. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to play far enough into the game to show you some of the additional levels today. <laughs> but. Uh, but it is, this, this game is quite impressive, actually. Yeah, and it really does show that 6502 really is a flexible CPU. Yeah. And again, there's modern versions of 6502 available that are uh, up to 33 megahertz. So that's, that's a really impressive system. So especially considering that the 6502 is a fully static microprocessor, means it can be fully halted and continued during execution, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. So truly amazing system. Why don't we come to the last thing I'll just show, since we're running a little bit over time, and just show a couple things from, since I didn't really get to show you movement in this uh, pet game called Petsky Robots. Uh, again, showing what's capable, the hardware is capable, even if development wasn't. If you see, we actually have moving water here, which is pretty impressive that this is all going in the background. And again, this is a fairly slow machine with no graphics capability, but we can move very smoothly. Um, we have animated, and again, as I run into the trees, but uh, we have animated doors. So it, it's pretty darn impressive. And if I'd seen this on a pet, when I first saw a pet when I was in elementary school, I, I would have been just blown away. Yeah. You can do things, we can interact with objects. I can, uh, I can search for something. I can, uh, uh, you know, I can, I can look around. I, can, I, can, I have a weapon here. Uh, I can shoot in any direction I'd like to go. We gotta, we gotta wrap it. So it, it's really amazing. So keep an eye on that. And thanks again to the 8-Bit Guy, David Murray. For, uh, for allowing us to show this. Right. And thanks so much to everyone for their attention during this presentation. Sorry for the technical difficulties. We're, you know, it's a learning experience for everybody. Uh, COVID makes everything more difficult than it otherwise would be, but we're still glad to be able to talk to you about all these great systems. And uh, keep your eye on 6502. Well, thanks guys very much for showing us uh, everything today. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, we're sorry if we had some uh, technical difficulties. I guarantee you it worked on the developer's desk, uh, <laughs> but you know we were, did want to have some time for questions, but unfortunately we're running a little bit too far behind. If you send your questions into Discord, we'll try and answer them back on email, or if you email uh, microphone at vcfed.org, we'll answer them electronically later. Yep. Um, right now we're going to uh, run over and we'll take a look at uh, FujiNet, um, and I think that's uh, Thomas Cherry Holmes. So thank you very much. Hey everybody, it's Tom Cherry Holmes here with the FujiNet project, and I'm going to try to explain FujiNet in approximately 15 minutes. This is FujiNet, a revolutionary new piece of hardware for your Atari 8-bit systems that provides a whole host of virtual devices, some of them you already have, and hopefully a couple of new ones. Firstly, it provides a virtual disk emulation that allows you to read and write disk images both from the local SD card slot and over the network to either local or remote resources. It also provides a virtual printer emulating a variety of Atari, Epson, and OkiData printers as well as a few specialty ones, rendering the results in PDF format for easy retrieval by a modern PC to print onto a modern printer. It also provides a Wi-Fi modem attached to a virtual Atari 850 RS-232 interface, complete with driver handler polling support. So existing Atari communications programs just work. So you can use it to call BBSs, and if you want to, you can set up a BBS with it. It also finally provides a network device, which allows an Atari to natively communicate with TCP and UDP sockets directly using standard Atari I.O. idioms, but also providing varying degrees of pro protocol offloading for protocols like HTTP and encrypted protocols like HTTPS 
And when combined with uh, JSON and XML parsers that are also on the FujiNet, allows the Atari to, for the first time in history, become a first-class internet citizen. But first and foremost, I think most of you would be most interested in the disk emulation. It has the most out-of-box potential, and we have spent an awful lot of time trying to make sure that it works as smoothly as possible. When you first plug in a FujiNet and turn on your Atari, it will load a configuration program into memory, which, after specifying your network and any keys required to access your network, it will present you a screen where the top portion shows you a list of hosts that you can potentially connect to, and the bottom provides the list of drive slots that you want to take any disk images that you get from these hosts to put into various drive slots to use with your Atari. We're going to go to slot number five here. We're going to pick a copy of Jumpman from the games folder on this server, and we're going to boot it in drive one. We hold down the Option key, and what is literally going to happen is the game is going to be streamed directly from the Google Cloud, roughly 2,000 miles away, onto the Atari. And the Atari is none the wiser. As you can see, it just works. In addition to ATR disk formats, ATX is also supported. ATX has the advantage of being able to encode copy protection schemes. When ATX files are selected, the FujiNet will actually transfer the entire ATX image over the network onto the FujiNet's memory so that it can not only accurately represent the copy protection, but it can also make sure that the timing of each sector as it's read off the virtual drive happens correctly. As you can see, the copy protection just works. Complete with the custom loader. In addition, binary load files in XEX format are also supported. I'll load a copy of Canyon Climber from Homesoft. When selected and mounted, the FujiNet will dynamically create a boot disk around the binary load file. Virtual printer emulation provides an emulation of almost a dozen different printer types, rendering out to PDF to print on a modern PC to a modern printer. For this test, we'll actually take and load a copy of MyDOS to set a couple of things before we actually go into, say, Atari Writer, for example. We will take and load a document from a web server directly into Atari Writer. First, we set the network prefix to point to our web server. And then we go into Atari Writer. We go into Atari Writer and we load the document from the web server. As you can see, completely transparent. This is a rather large document, but we're only really interested in the first page, so we'll just print the first page. Since I have my web admin set up for an Atari 1027 printer on the FujiNet, we'll select number four. 
We won't print the whole document, just the first page. And one copy. And we see right here that Atari Writer is sending the data to the FujiNet. And the FujiNet is creating a PDF on the fly, which we can then pick up in the web admin window. We'll go ahead and do that now. Apologies, I'm doing like five things at once. <laughs> and we'll go ahead, click on the printer icon, and what winds, what hap, what comes out, something very much like this. Since this is the 1027 output, we get nice letter quality output with fonts matching the original printer. Since we have Epson printer compatibility, programs like Print Shop also work extremely well. And once we print, we get this output. And I think the results pretty much speak for themselves. What do you think? The modem emulation provides a complete Wi-Fi modem and Atari 850 interface to allow existing communications programs to be used to dial BBSs and even for you to be able to load a BBS and answer calls from the internet. Here we've loaded a copy of Bob Term and set it at 9600 baud. We'll use it to dial into a BBS. As you can see, just works. We'll go ahead and hang up here. And we'll do one more feature with the modem. You can not only originate connections, you can also specify to answer for them, to listen for them, using the AAT port command. In this case, we're going to listen for connections on port 6502. And I'm going to use Netcat over here on my PC to connect to it. Once we do, we see that a ring happens, and we can answer. And as you can see, nice and easy. This will allow you to run a copy of BBS Express, Forum XE, whatever you want to run in its existing form on your Atari. We'll go ahead and drop the connection. As stated before, the end device opens up a whole new world of possibilities by giving the Atari access to many different network adapter functions, such as the ability to open TCP and UDP sockets and to communicate in a very offloaded and abstract manner with various network protocols. This allows a great deal of transparency, especially when paired with the Atari operating system. We've loaded a handler, which gives us access to an end device. And I'm going to use it here to load a file, a basic program, off of a web server. As you can see here, it just works. Not only can I take and load those files, but since I also have WebDave support built into the FujiNet, 
and I happen to have write access on my web server. I can also write files back to the web servers. All of this happens transparently. But the transparency can actually go even further. We can, for example, set a network prefix for an FTP server. You'll see that this is a very large path, and I would rather not type that over and over every time. So I want n colon to refer to that entire path. I use ncd to set the path, and now, whenever I do an n colon, it's actually contacting the FTP server and will give us back a directory. And we'll take and copy something off of that FTP server onto a disk here. And you can see it just works. I happen to know that there is frog execute in that folder as well. And it takes care of all of the process of negotiating with the FTP server, logging in, changing to the correct directory, appro appropriating the correct file type, and doing all of the data transfer. This happens automatically without any intervention from the Atari whatsoever. So we can see. Boom, there we go. Oh, with that, we can go even further. And this time we're going to take and go into DOS for just a moment. and load a particular disk image. Now I'm using a utility that provides a function that's already in config, but outside of config, so that I can use it from inside my DOS. And I'm mounting a disk image to drive two, which contains a dumb terminal program. Essentially an implementation of something like Telnet, but done in about 10 lines of basic. We load it up. And we have a look. And this is all you really need to make a raw terminal client. I'm going to make one small change here to change the line endings to CRLF. And since we've been using network prefixes, you'll notice that the same device specs that I was using for HTTP and whatnot are also being used to initiate TCP connections. But there's already a network prefix in effect that I need to get rid of because I explicitly set one within CD. I just clear it. And once I clear it, you'll see that the behavior that you saw with the Wi-Fi modem is now happening with the end device here, except we're dealing in terms of packets now. It just works. Not only that, but I can take and change one thing just the file that I'm opening to a totally different protocol, and none of the rest of the program will have to change. And that is the power of the end device, right there in a nutshell. to thank you all for being patient for the last year watching the development of FoodNet. It has been a fun ride. Hello to everyone attending VCF East 2020. That is all for this video. As always, have
Hey everybody, Tom Cherry Holmes here with the FujiNet project. And I want to show you guys just how easy it is to program new network applications with the FujiNet using nothing more than an Atari, a FujiNet device, and a copy of Atari Basic with the N handler loaded via Auto Run Sys. In fact, if you want to take and follow along, you can actually do so by mounting atariapps.errata.online onto a host slot, going to the nHandler folder, selecting the nHandler ATR, mounting it to drive one, and booting a copy of it. The auto run sys that's on this disk can be copied to any DOS disk that you wish so that you can write your own programs as well. We'll go ahead and boot in, and you'll see that the auto run sys adds a banner to the top indicating that FujiNet is now ready and we can now use the end device. What can we do with this end device? For that, we are actually going to need to set up a little terminal window over here on my PC and view it. Pardon me there. And we're going to open up a copy of Netcat to listen for a network connection on port 6502. Once this is done, we can then go ahead and dimension a variable for our input here, which we'll use in just a moment, and go ahead and open up a connection to our host. Now the open command may look familiar to most of you. In fact, the only things that are maybe different are the aux2 value and the string of characters after a device spec here. The aux2 value here specifies a translation value, which specifies whether or not carriage returns, line feeds, or both are translated to Itasky EOL characters and back again. And in fact, there are four different values. If you use zero, then no translation is performed at all. If you use one, then carriage returns are translated to EOLs. If you use two, then line feeds are translated to EOLs. And if you use three, then carriage returns and line feeds are translated to EOLs and spaces. We'll go ahead and use two since I'm on a Unix machine here and open up the socket. We'll see here, you'll tell by the sounds that it wrote the command to the FujiNet. The FujiNet completed the command and acknowledged that everything was okay. So we wound up with a nice little ready prompt here. At this point, we can do any input and output to the socket that we wish using standard IO commands. Writing to the socket is very easy. We can simply take and use the print number one command here. Write out strings with impunity. Conversely, we can also take and send information back from the PC. And get it using the input command. Oop. You can see right there, that is how easy it is to translate to to literally transmit data from one host to the Atari and back again using nothing more than standard I.O. commands walking out to the internet. Let's put this to good use. We'll do this by writing a simple little terminal program here in BASIC. We'll go ahead and close this connection out and you'll see that closing this connection actually closes Netcat here and brings it back to the shell. We're done with this for now, so we'll go ahead and just kind of put this to the side. Now I'm going to go ahead and bring up my notes here for my terminal program here. And we'll start writing this. 
We start making a new program, and the first thing we do is we go ahead and open up a socket to bbs.fostex.net. Since bbsfostex.net sends carriage returns and line feeds, we need to accommodate for that, so we do that in the open statement. We also open up an additional, uh, an additional IOCB to the keyboard to handle keyboard input. We go ahead and trap for line 140 to catch any eventual errors that may result. And then we immediately start to try and scan the keyboard. If we get anything from the keyboard, we grab it. and then put it out to the socket and flush the output buffer. This ensures that the character will go out exactly when we type something at the keyboard, as is expected for a terminal program. We then check the status of the input device. In the case of the end device, if we do a status, we get back four bytes. Two of those bytes, the first two, are the number of bytes waiting in the receive buffer. Since this is a 16-bit value, we actually need to take and do a little transformation on them and turn them into a nice single value. If the number of bytes waiting is zero, then we don't need to do anything. And we can go all the way back to 110. Otherwise, we go ahead and loop through the number of bytes waiting, and for each one of them, we grab it, put it in C, then immediately output it to the screen. Put number 16 is the same as basically uh, putting to IOCB number zero, but since you can't reference IOCB number zero from basic, number 16 will actually get you the same result. We'll go ahead, finally, and uh, once that's done, we take and go back and immediately start scanning the keyboard again. 140 is where we trapped before, and it's basically go, said, okay, if something goes wrong, then we close the connection, we indicate that we've con disconnected from the connection, and we end the program. That is everything that we need to do to make a usable terminal program. Let's test it. We can see right here that it just works out of the box. Nothing special. I mean, it's literally, it's nothing but basic, and yet it works just fine. It's not the most efficient code, but it is hopefully a good example to show you how simple it actually is to make something like a raw terminal program inside Atari Basic on the FujiNet. We'll go ahead and loop through this, get to the main menu, and we're not really gonna do anything, but we're just gonna take and log out immediately once we reach the main menu. Okay, so we're done, log off. Yes, go ahead and log off. And now that we're done, we can go ahead and hit the break key here and close the connection. That's it. Bam. There you go. Fully functional, uh, raw uh, terminal program. No telnet or anything that adds to the complexity. And of course, one can argue that we can take and make a protocol adapter for the FujiNet to handle the telnet IAC escape sequences, etc. But I wanted to do it this way to basically just prove the point. But that's really not all. You see, this end device exposes a wide variety of protocols in exactly the same manner, using exactly the same conventions. This is very important and very powerful. We can, for example, go to ICANHASIP.com. 
which has a nice little HTTP uh, little serving connection that sends back a public IP that I'm from. All I did was change the URL. That's it. Boom. And suddenly, this program is transformed from Telnet, or Netcat in this case, to WGET. Voila. And to show you that it actually is HTTP, we'll do one final, one, one final HTTP test here and go to fujinet.pl. Uh, let me the screen. And we'll see, whoop, is it gonna let me do this? Eh. Come on, really? Darn it, okay, darn, okay. Uh, such as such is the way of demos here, but hopefully you guys got the point across. We'll go ahead and close the connection here. But the end device can actually do a lot more than that. For example, since this is a standard CIO device, I have blackjack.basic sitting on this web server. And we can load it, or at least Darn it. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Apologies for that. But you can see, yeah, still working on the program here, still bugs to work out. But you can see that it actually fetched a copy of Blackjack from the web server and loaded it into Atari Basic. Worked. Bam, there we go. And then some. I hope this really drives home the point of how powerful uh, this FujiNet device is, not just for emulating existing devices, the disk drive, the virtual printer, the speech synthesizer, etc., but the end device and the SIO functions underneath the end device open up a world of possibilities for writing new network applications. Not only can you use these uh, networking functions through the end handler, you can also talk to the SIO devices directly. And for high level languages like Pascal or C or Action, this may actually be more preferable. So with that, uh, I'm gonna end the demonstration here. I hope you guys really enjoyed this. And um, until next time, have fun. Welcome back. Um, we didn't have time for questions and answers after Alex's exhibit. Um, okay. So, so um, now we had uh, Thomas Cherry Holmes doing FujiNet, um, which was great. We're going to take some questions and answers. We have to mute that. Actually, mute, mute that. Is it gone? Go to the phone. You're still on. That's all right. All right. No, you're still not muted. Wait, I'm now good. It's not muted. Are you getting feedback? Okay. Okay, so questions. First question I have, what is the hardware inside? The hardware inside is based entirely off of the ESP. Oh, you're muted, Tom. Oh, did I? Uh, there you I, go. There we go. So the hardware inside is based entirely on ESP32. It's got 16 megabytes of, uh, uh, of flash memory, and it's got 8 megabytes worth of serial RAM that's also attached. 
there are some uh, there are there's some glue for the Atari bus itself, a handful of other passive components, LEDs and buttons. But overall, it's very simple. Ninety nine percent of the magic is in the firmware itself. OK, thank you. So I'm going to Steve and Edwards asked a few questions. I'm just going to bunch those all together. Maybe you can just hit them. Uh, together. So he first said level converters, I assume, question mark. Uh, then he said, what's the baud rate in quotes? Like on the Atari serial bus, are you bit banging the protocol with the ESP32? And you want to keep going or you want to answer this first? Uh, I, I can answer pretty much all of his questions because he and I are actually were going back and forth on, on Discord, but for the benefit yeah. of I just want to get them live. Yeah, exactly. For the benefit of the listeners, yes, to understand the Atari serial bus works at 19200 baud nominally. However, with high speed modifications to the operating system, it can go all the way up to 125 kilobits per second. And the FujiNet actually supports going up all the way that high. Uh, the FujiNet itself uh, doesn't need to bit bang the serial because it has built in UARTs that can transmit up to four megabits per second. So we're able to take and utilize those. We also don't need level converters because thanks to a discussion with the actual designer of the ESP32, uh, he actually told us very point blank that the uh, ESP32 can accept plus five volt TTL levels directly without damage to the silicon. Very good. Uh, the other question from Stephen was about byte framing RS-232 like or something else, or is it just eight and one? It's straight up. Um, like I said, it's you can think of it literally as TTL level RS-232, uh, eight data bits, uh, no parity, one stop bit. So yeah, essentially just standard 10 bit serial. Okay, and uh, the question says, it looks like there are several places to purchase. Any advice? on uh, Brewings versus VCC uh, versus Fujinet.online. Okay, so because we, uh, there's a little bit of a backstory behind this. Um, basically, we built this with the intention that we were going to do a run to make back the development costs on the hardware. We did that, we did an initial run of 50 units. Those were sold out in a record time of about 20 minutes. I didn't even have time to finish making the announcements. It was so fast. And um, because we made back the money on that, we decided to open source. We, were, we, we had the intention of open sourcing uh, both the firmware and the hardware so that any vendor could actually, so that could actually manufacture them. And to date, there are three known vendors that are producing them. Uh, the uh, 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 Gavin Hobbelt is actually producing them at uh, fujinet.shop. And Marlon Bates over at the Brewing Academy are, is also producing uh, units as well. Uh, in Europe, we also have uh, a guy by the name of Zaxxon who's producing them. And hopefully there will be others that also jump on board. And for each of these vendors, we are actually working with them hand in hand to not only get them up to speed to produce these units, but we're also, as we make improvements uh, based on bug testing reports to the hardware itself, uh, we're also working with these vendors to fold these fixes in to the products that they ship out. Now, I want to take an end that by saying that basically, uh, because this is 99% hardware and 1% software, we've hit a point where all the changes and evolution that we're going to do to the hardware we've done, the hardware for all intents and purposes is stable, especially after this next revision, which fixes a few small uh, bus coupling issues for some rare system types. Uh, so anything that is going to be included for new features and whatnot is basically going to be handled as a firmware update from now and forever, more or less. OK, uh, one more. What's the connection, if any, between this Fujinet project and the errata.online project, which seems to be a reboot of Plato? Well, essentially, FujiNet was me making a was was me fulfilling a promise in Errata Online's charter, and that was to uh, provide a place for uh, retro computing users to come together to collaborate together across the brand name lines. And the issue that we had really with Atari users was that Atari users did not have a very good solution 
for handling things like having a Wi-Fi modem, network connectivity, and the like. So originally, FujiNet was just started as a Wi-Fi modem to take and fulfill that promise. And it grew into something much more once we realized that we could have far better control over the serial bus because the hardware designer had the forethought to say, well, let's just hook everything up that we have access to. Very uh, good. That's it. I think that's all the questions I have for now. Uh, if I could take a second, I'd like to highlight the shirt that you're wearing. Mm -hmm. And if, Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Because this is from a couple of years ago, but it holds a... Uh, a place in our heart for a lot of guys here. So this um, t-shirt was um, Dan Raganti. The picture of the guy on there is Dan Raganti. He was our member since uh, the beginning when we were uh, March in 2005. He was one of the founding members. And he did a lot of our t-shirt designs, earlier t-shirt designs. And so he was a very beloved member for a number of years. And unfortunately, um, he died of cancer about two years ago. Um, and before I died though, we, I had um, a friend of mine design this t-shirt in of him on the shirt of Dan, yeah. of Dan, of Dan Ragani. And it looked like his, you know, his likeness and like what he was like in his shop and has his cat there and little like, you know, things that he's doing there. Cause like he's an engineer. So that was to honor him. Um, and he saw Didn't that someone, um, uh, discreetly ask him what his favorite computers were and things like that. And all that kinds of things are included in the, in the design. Is that correct? Yeah, I think there was some of that. We, we had asked him what, you know, what his favorite computers were, but we sort of knew, but we did have, you know, discreetly do that. Um, one of our members had, had, did, had done that. And uh, so that's, we paid homage to that. And you could blame me for the color. <laughs> Some people like it, some people don't like it. The, the orange with the purple, I thought it would be different, but uh, we get mixed reactions on the color t shirt. But anyway, the, the design was in honor of Dan Raganti. Um, it's about two years now he passed away, he was a great guy. Um, and we paid homage to him and all the t shirt designs and everything that he did. He, for me and him, we were we actually did a Commodore exhibit. Um, we were going to make a eight player game. Um, using a network game. We never finished it. So I'm thinking about releasing what was left of the code so that someone else can finish it. But that's the t-shirt. Um, and then Chris, Chris has the, this year's t-shirt. Yeah, yeah, first Thomas, I just want to say thanks for letting us interject. And uh, since you're wearing the shirt, I already did a uh, costume change today. Oh, dude, so this, uh, I, I, of course, this is, uh, this is important to me too. And I understand the significance, it's all good. So yeah, this is this year's t-shirt design. Cool. It comes in two colors, green and amber. Um, we're selling it online or through our website. Um, but Mike Brightman actually designed this. Um, has a lot of little Easter eggs there, a little vintage computer. It has um, different, different bugs and has the Tron and the bit bucket and the little teapot from the... Um, what was that? The B box, I think it was the B box. So it's a lot of little artifacts in there that are interesting. So it's a great t-shirt this year. Um, anyway, that was a little aside. But thank you, Thomas, for FujiNet. It's a really great product. Now I can see why everybody's like so excited about it because I saw it in action. We have it in our museum now. Uh, Andy set it up on one of our Atari's in the museum. It was great. I was like, wow, that's really useful. And it puts together a lot of t different technologies. And I hear from Chris that they're making one for the Commodore well, 64 because I was just something it's something not new, but that someone in general. Yeah, I yeah. want to actually clarify that. We're, Jeff and I were jealous that Commodore doesn't have this. Is that in the works? That's correct. I mean, here's the deal. Uh, first and foremost, as, I, as I've alluded to in the QA, we want people to steal this thing. We want people to take and pull pieces from it to adapt it to other systems and whatnot. And that's already starting to happen on the Commodore 64 side of things. They have a, uh, there are at least uh, three or four people that are looking at the code that we have and merging it with things that they're working on uh, to take and produce an equivalent for the Commodore 64. And I don't know if it's implied with all the questions that Stephen has been asking in the QA channel, but uh, he, he, he seems to be genuinely interested to see if some of this could possibly be adapted to the bus structure of the Apple II. And all of this is uniquely possible. I would love to see this literally go to every single platform imaginable 
So everybody that's out there that's hearing this, come to our GitHub, steal the code, use it, please. Yeah, that's the that's the great part of like VCF's mission is to share uh, different things with people and to promote the hobby. And that's I'm glad that you're doing that to help promote it across all the different machines and platforms. And it just makes it nice for everybody. Yep. Yeah. No. No one I've come across has been stingy with information. It's it's wonderful community. Yep. All right. Thanks again, Tom. And um, we, if you want to ask some more questions, there's a FujiNet channel on the Discord. Yep. I'll um, be so Thomas will be there monitoring that. Uh, so we have to move on to our next topic. Our next topic is the history of Camp Evans. So a lot of people come here to VCF and they're like, what is this place? They're like looking around, like does there used to be a base or something? And so I'm like, I give them a short answer. I'm like, I don't really have time. There's another guy here who can answer all these questions. He's like done a lot of research and he knows all the history. I'm like, because there's a lot of history here, um, different technologies and things like that. Um, so um, Fred. There. So this, this is, is Fred, Fred Carr. Carr. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, he was the director of InfoAge for about 25 years. And now he's currently at Princeton's physics department in Simon Observatory. And he's going to tell a little history about Camp Evans, where InfoAge has now has the museums, and this is where BCF has its museum, and this is where broadcasting from. So the first question is what is Camp Evans? All right, let's go. I'm Who's gonna, gonna share some slide? All right, Camp Evans is an amazing place with an incredible history that we can only touch on. But what makes Camp Evans great today is the amazing volunteers like VCF, like Jeff, like Corey, like Andy, who are saving history here so it can be interpreted for the future. And it's sort of fun because in the early days of computing work, Camp Evans had some involvement. So we're working to get the message through, through volunteers. And we had a lot of challenge to repair for education. So uh, let's, I'll tell them what InfoAge is. All right, okay? let's start with that. All right, so right now it's a series of museums. Here's one of our guides. And every year we, um, we uh, add to that. Okay. That's okay. I'm, I'm, Oh, you're jumping around. Oh, sorry about that. That's all right, because uh, I, I want to do as much in the 30 minutes I have as possible. Okay. Thank you. So uh, notice the um, or orangish kind of roof building. Uh, that's the Marconi Hotel built in 1912. Okay. And so what the place is, our third question. Why is it a National Historic Landmark? All right, Camp Evans is a national landmark for one reason out of all this history. And here are just some of the textbooks that have some Camp Evans history in it. And you see uh, the invention that changed the world. You see um, satellites, communication in space. You see electronics. You see, um, oh geez, McCarthy. You see birth of information age. You see wireless days, you see secret weapons in World War II. The history is immense, but it is a national landmark for just World War II. Because you have to fit a theme to be a national landmark. And for many years, we never fit a theme. And then Congress commissioned a six year study of World War II and the American home front not only did we fit, but 
they said that this site should be considered for national landmark status. And we just took it from there. The national landmark was kind enough to give us a professional writer on their staff whose nickname was Dr. No. <laughs> and he had already told us no for once, but that's another story. Yeah. But then he said yes, and we worked together on this, and um, it's now a national landmark. And here's one example. This is a newspaper, um, the Daily News, from the day World War II officially ended. Hmm. And a few days before, they brought uh, reporters here and disclosed the secret of radar. And they did that at other labs. And the uh, Daily News dedicated almost an entire page to it. And you'll see some quotes on the um, right-hand side that it was a laboratory victory that identify friend and foe that has been extended now that air traffic control helped win the war. It was scientific pioneers. And right in the middle, you see a picture of a radar unit at Camp Evans um, mm -hmm. out in the field. And that's one of the early radars. Camp Evans participated in the creation of many other radars. And they commissioned and funded many amazing laboratories like MIT's Rad Lab, like Harvard's uh, laboratory, like Bell Labs radar laboratory, mm. Western Electric, and their products were brought here to Camp Evans and saw that they met army hardness and battle si survivability requirements. And then they put teams together to introduce them to the field teams together to figure out how to repair them in the field, built, um, wrote the manuals here because you couldn't go to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Kinko's or someplace and have them written because there <laughs> might, there might be a Nazi spy there. Oh, All yeah, right. Yeah. So it was a soup the nuts ability to make secret devices from raw material to something to go to battle. Yeah. And on the, the right hand bottom, you see a quote, from the president, the battle laboratories held fateful risks for us, as well as the battles of the air, land, and sea. And now we've won those battles. And which president was that, Fred? Uh, Tr Truman. Thank oh. Yeah, I'm, uh, thanks for the quiz. <laughs> 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 All right. So it's a landmark for World War II, a major reason of victory radar, OK? And here's an example, D-Day. Mm. We fooled, or the allies fooled German radar, okay? There were stories where they dropped um, miniature parachutists in another area. Um, they had put spies to feed German officers bad information. Mm -hmm. They let um, dead bodies with uh, fake plans off of submarines. So they'd float into German held beaches and that would feed them misinformation. But the Germans weren't worried because they had an excellent overlapping radar network and the unblinking eye of radar would say where the invasion was gonna be. So two things were done to support the misinformation campaign is one, they sent planes, you see a picture of one in the middle, to fly up and down the French coast and identify where all the German radars were, what their frequency were, and they determined which ones they would bomb, which ones they would pretend to bomb, and because they wanted them to see things, right? Mm -hmm. And which ones, if they couldn't take them out of existence, jam them on a D-Day. And then they did one more step. They made radar generators. Hmm. So the full story was the attack on Normandy was going to be a fake to get Rommel's tanks to go to Normandy. And the real evasion was going to occur in the area of Calais that's closest to the coast that made best logistical sense to get, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of troops across in a, in a day. Right? Wasn't that a narrower 
part of the canal, the uh, channel rather. Yep, you are exactly correct. So it made sense, and you know we can make um, part German, so I can make a. That's the most economical, right? Uh, so here's the devices they made: radar multipliers. They actually had devices that would pick up German radar and send back a fake image that would make a few fishing boats look like a flotilla of battleships and support crafts. So the German radar was seeing a larger invasion fleet heading towards Calais than they saw off of Normandy. And that got them to hold back Rommel's tanks because his goal was to kill the landing on the beach. Mm. And we made him go to the wrong beach. Yeah. So, and Camp Evans played a role in that, okay? So now to protect the nation, and this is actually part of Camp Evans in World War II, that's the Project Diana site. There is a World War II series of radars. And, you know, if you laid awake at, at late at, or went late at night and studied these things, you would actually see four or five different radar models here. Um, it was really a fun hunt to find the history because when we got the site here, all the information was removed and documents were destroyed. The secret documents were destroyed as per military require, or excuse me, the top secret documents. But the secret ones, luckily, a lot of them ended up in the National Archives. And we mined those and found a rich story that um, undergirded making it a national landmark, okay? And they did things like the proximity fuse. This photo you're looking at is right out in Camp Evans. The happy story is where these devices are, a microwave radar, it's now a baseball field. So where the fate of nations were decided, kids are now doing the fate of baseball teams. Yeah, they're so, enjoying the life that there was given to them to defend the, the country and the world. Th that is so true. And, and that's why, you know, hundreds of thousands of soldiers gave their lives to have a, a better future. And in our case, behind every soldier on the front, there were 10 people on the home front. And Camp Evans represents the finest technical people on the home front, including persons of color. Mm. Camp Evans hired persons of color with technical backgrounds like physicists and mathematicians and chemists from the um, historical black colleges and universities. And this site became informally known as the Black Brain Trust. Mm. And um, that, that's an excellent, excellent story um, that um, one of our friends actually did a DVD from oral histories that he, that he, he did, okay? They did things like mortar counterfire. More of our American soldiers were killed on the um, islands of Iwo Jima and Guadalcanal by Japanese mortars than by bullets. And an emergency, uh, General MacArthur put out emergency requests to the laboratories to get a radar that would tell them where to shoot back to take out the mortar things. Mm. And, uh, and one of the teams here said, whoa, uh, a Japanese radar, a common one is this length? That happens to be perfect for the wavelength of our radar. They took one of these radar sets that you see on the screen with that amazingly complex tube that you see on the cover of Electronics Magazine, cover girl, cover tube. Um, they modified it, took it down to uh, Island Beach State Park, had captured Japanese mortars, were firing in the direction of the radar team, and they were having a level of success. And I got to do the lead of this team's oral history interview uh, Dr. John Marchetti, and um, he said that, you know, they were having having some success, but the radar pips should have jumped off the screen. And he goes, I'm in the history books. And he really is in the history books, the Army's official history of World War II. And this story is, 
but he goes, Ed Savini, he is not in the history books. And when we were out there, he goes, John, we are searching for the wings of aircraft. We're searching horizontally. These mortars are going vertically, vertically. And he took the radar screen and turned it 90 degrees. <laughs> That's so simple. Yep. And the indications, like he said, jumped right off the screen. When General MacArthur found that they actually not only had solved this problem, but they had a working prototype, he said, I need 25 of them immediately. And he was going to send General Stilwell from the Pacific Theater here to manage it because, you know, this is not a good thing. He goes, I can't depend on a bunch of engineers and scientists to get the job done. This needs military men, right? When they heard that, they said, we're not leaving. You get us food, you get us the parts, and you get us the, the teams that are going to go into the Pacific with them, and we will get the job done. And they stayed here for, I, I think it was eight days with only taking cat naps on cots. And then 25 sets were put on trucks with the train teams up to Newark Airport and flown to the um, where they were needed. And we believe they were used in a market garden, the uh, failed attempt to um, uh, infiltrate the Ruhr, like a second Normandy landing. And they were definitely used in the Pacific. And one of the fun stories that uh, Dr. Marchetti um, related was after the war, he was here and a Marine um, a colonel came here because he had searched him out because he wanted to shake the hands of the guy who's made that radar that saved his men from being killed by Japanese mortars. That's how much of a difference yeah. it made. So thus, oh, captured German, uh, German radars, figuring out a way to jam them and nullify them. Okay. Uh, saved many, many, many guys in the uh, Eighth Air Force. Okay, um, finding ways to shoot down. Um, I don't have a picture. Here. Oh, there's John Marchetti. Um, finding out ways to shoot down the V1s. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the V1 here. But the amazing thing about this is the day United States got into World War II on December seventh. Signal Corps radar spotted the Japanese planes 50 minutes before they dropped their first bomb. Hmm. Unfortunately, the Navy did not have the radar control room staffed, so the call went to a uh, guard. He picked up the phone and made the decision it must be uh, planes coming in from California, and the, um, the time was lost, okay? And of course, the World War II was ended with the atomic bomb through the luck of somebody mentioning to their son before they passed away then that the Signal Corps or Camp Evans had worked with Los Alamos on the atomic bomb triggers because they were radar triggers. Mm. We contacted Los Alamos and they confirmed that the Quad, uh, quad redundant radars that set off the atomic bombs were developed in conjunction with Camp Evans and RCA, okay, oh, uh, down in Princeton. And the other thing they told us is that the test drops of atomic bombs without the nuclear uh, equipment in it, the dynamite was substituted instead, was done in a practice range in South Jersey. With all that land between here and there, they did it in South Jersey. Now, it didn't say that this was to be near the radar experts who were part of the team, but I can jump there because, um, you know, I'm not a credentialed historian. I just play one when I'm here at Camp Evans. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Do you got another question for me? I do. What happened in World War One? Okay. W one of the fun things because this is like a puzzle. You have to go find the pieces. Hmm, yeah, because yeah, they're all over. So um, uh, when I worked for a mainframe manufacturer, uh, Amdahl Corp, um, they would send me out for three week stints to shake down uh, new introductions of hardware or um, 
work on different commands, a Unix uh, on the mainframe. So it was a lot of fun. But on the weekends, I, I would be free and I would go up to the Stanford University archives and do research. And I looked up a book on, um, I, I think it was a guy named Ernst Alexanderson. And I'm going to go back here. And here is, here's his picture in the center, right? In his biography, or a history of him actually, a story was relayed by the author about what a fanatic guy this uh, Alexanderson was. He was here at Camp Evans when it was a Marconi transatlantic wireless station being run by the Navy as the central communication point between Washington and our American expeditionary forces in Europe that he was working in the basement of the hotel, the building a few hundred feet from us, uh, and there happened to be a thunderstorm and he had headphones on. And even though they were grounded, one of the 400 foot antennas outside got hit by a bolt of lightning. And the, the author said he saw a spark jump from the headphones right into Alexanderson's head. Right. And um, Alexanderson jumped up, said a few things, sat back down, put the earphones on and went right to work. Oh. <laughs> right. And for this, the, there was a, a, a footnote on this. For more details on this story and others, look up Radio Reminiscences by A. Hoyt Taylor. He was the commander of this facility during World War I. And we had no idea that this place was used in World War I and that it was the central communication point. So this was a super discovery. And along the way, there's been many angels that we've encountered and bad guys. Most of them are in green uniforms. But um, one of the angels was in the Navy uh, library. And um, when I, I couldn't find this book, so finally I said, he's a Navy officer. Let me try the Naval Research Laboratory, called up and they called back a few days later and said, we're sorry, we, we have the last copy and it's under glass and only our staff are allowed to touch it. And so sorry, you can't see it. So I explained the situation and um, the lady said, I can't promise anything but I'll see what I can do. And I've learned that when somebody says that, your results go up <laughs> real high. If somebody says, no problem, I got this, it's like, uh, all right, forget about it. <laughs> right. So about a week later, an entire photocopy of the book showed up and there was a wow. chapter called Belmar. Yeah. And it talked about this place during World War I. And that just opened our eyes. They even had a contingent of Marines protecting this facility because it was so important oh. to the World War I effort. And some of the first radio propaganda went through here. Uh, uh, President Wilson's 14 points that were um, broadcast without code. So German citizens who had wireless equipment, because this was new equipment then, not everybody had it. This yeah. was like uh, homebrew computer days, right? could hear the president's points and that would stow civic civil unrest in Germany, which yeah, psychological warfare, right? Yeah. Which, yes. it, which it did. Right. So amazing, amazing. Now, where did the messages come? If you see the uh, picture on your left, my right, I'm, I'm all confused here. Uh, it says wall, New Jersey. Look at the bottom. That's a horse and buggy. Right. <laughs> And look at the size of the persons up, up uh, nearby the first antenna. Those were 400 foot antennas. There were six of them. And they were made to capture messages sent from Carnarvon, Wales, right? And you see the map on top. That was the wireless girdle around the earth. And this place would have started work in 1914, but unfortunately, the war had started in Europe. The British seized the Carnarvon station 
because it, it was so strategic to be able to blast wireless messages in code to as far as the equipment would work, right? Um, now, one of the great inventors here, um, he started right before this station was going to go online. He was named Edwin Armstrong, and he um, was at Columbia University, and he made an invention that revolutionized wireless and laid the foundation for commercial radio. Something else was needed, but that will come later, all right? This was called regeneration, feeding a tiny um, signal from what you pick up an antenna and boosting it through mm. electronics. And some people call this the birth of modern electronics, done, again, done at Columbia University. Yes, I think there's something that we use call a repeater to, to boost signals. Yes. Same idea, yeah. all right? And he had invented this at Columbia University. Um, when Dr. No first came here, he, he was funded by the IEEE to pick a site related to Edwin Armstrong to make it a national landmark under the famous American inventors theme. And um, when he found out some of the unsavory past here, he closed his notebook and said, nope, we're not taking this any further. And he went to Columbia University and made that a national landmark, which was a good thing. But that invention was brought here, demonstrated to David Sarnoff. He was the Bill Gates of that day, right? He was the one who, even though he didn't invent the wireless music box, he got it into the public mind. But there was another problem here, and hopefully- David Sarnoff found, he was the uh, founder of RCA, right? Or, or no, who, who, where did we go after TCF that was uh, right next door there? That was Sarnoff. That was Sarnoff. Was that RCA or was that? It was RCA. Previously RCA. Okay. And um, here's how RCA came about. And this may not be accurate, but you know how uh, somebody's trying to take over TikTok by buying, you know, forcing it to be sold its yes. American subsidiary? Yes. Yes. Well, at the end of World War I, the Navy wanted complete control of wireless and all its patents. So they went to Congress and said, we want this. And Congress said, no, no, no. Wireless and this thing called radio is a commercial thing and it'll stay commercial. You butt out. Well, not to be told what to do by Congress. The Navy went and made a deal with companies like Westinghouse and General Electric and said, you like our fat Navy contracts? You buy out all of American Marconi's stock and we'll tell you what to do. <laughs> and when they bought out all the stock, they renamed that company Radio Corporation of America. Uh. And David Sarnoff, who was a manager and a very important person in Marconi American branch of wireless, he, he became a, um, a vice president. And um, a, another gentleman, I'm sorry, his name escapes me, his papers not Sarnoff, but the other gentleman's papers are at Princeton University Library at the Firestone Library. And um, he, another person was the first president RCA, but then Sarnoff, who was a great at self-promotion, he became the second president of RCA and was the figurehead of the company. Um, people recognized, the only thing that recognized him more was the, um, the, the, the dog. Now, so, so you want to talk about the Marconi days? Yeah, perfect. Now, here's what happened that made wireless able to go to radio. During the war, or in original, the reason you couldn't use wireless, and you'll if you Google on the internet, you'll see people who said, oh, in 1900-so, we, we broadcast radio on the wireless. And they feel that they did that first and they invented that. But the reality was that old fashioned circuitry, just like static and old uh, computer circuits, anytime there was lightning or a sunspot, the old circuitry picked up that static hmm. 
And there were times, and there's uh, station logs from this facility on file at the Smithsonian that they drowned out the, the Morris code for as long as eight hours, okay? And the best time is when you were at night when the sun energy, those particles coming from the sun weren't hitting the atmosphere and creating fake radio waves picked up as static. This gentleman, Roy Wengant, on your uh, screen invented static elimination hmm. between here and another site in North Jersey. And when he had it perfected, he invited Mr. Marconi to come and see it. Mr. Marconi was at uh, Hoboken at the time. And in a book at, at Princeton that never got published, he goes, you know, so many people have told me that they've solved this problem. I'll go down to the Belmar station just to humor Mr. Wagant because, you know, he's that important. Well, he came here, they put headphones on him and he heard, he heard, he flipped it on and the static like blasted his earphones. And in the account, Mr. Marconi threw the headphones down and gave Wagant a dirty look. Right. And Wagant goes, no, no, put them back on, put them back on. <laughs> right. So Marconi puts them back on. And he switches on his new device, and out of the static, you hear perfectly clear wireless. Mm. So now you could talk on the wireless, mm. and you could sing on the wireless. So you know how history repeats itself? Remember in the early days of the internet? Yeah. You could Google, and you could find real information, and you didn't see ads? Yeah. Well... Now that you can talk and sing on the wireless, you could now have commercials mm. and the money poured in <laughs> and an industry was born. All That's right. Funny. So, you know, I, I kid my grandkids that I'm old enough to been part of the enjoyed the Internet and they have to suffer with the Adonet. All, All right. right. So one more question. Uh, how did Camp Evans open the space age communications? All right. At this site, see that large antenna there? The, the war is over. And a, a, um, a team is put together to pierce the ionosphere because the whole Marconi network was based on, let's get back, bouncing radio waves off the ionosphere. So the basic feeling was we were in a, a, an atmospheric bubble that pre prevented us from communicating out of space, right? Well, with the right energy level, right frequency, you could pierce the ionosphere, but nobody believed it. And they took a special microwave FM radar that Edwin Armstrong did, Mr. Radio Regeneration, Mr. FM Radio, super inventor, brought it down from his um, facility at Alpine, New Jersey, reinstalled it in one of these buildings, and they were able to bounce a signal off the moon in January of 1946 that proved you could do communications in space, right? And the history didn't end, okay? They had Cold War stuff here. They brought V2 scientists. They brought the Nazi radar and communication scientists over here. They did a Cold War listening for atomic tests underground and made devices detect um, nuclear isotopes in the atmosphere that would blow away. Oh, here's Project Diana. And one of the fun things along here is this is Dr. McAfee with an army general at one of the anniversaries. And to be a scientist, uh, and a person of color was unheard of in World War II in 1946. So um, he was an early member of the National Association of Black Physicists and um, working with Congressman Smith, the post office that delivered his mail is now named in his honor, okay? And uh, through that work, and it entertains me, uh, I was invited the um, to join the National Society of Black Physicists. So it's that entertains me to no end. Um, so uh, it's Joe McCarthy came here mm. and what he did here was so outrageous. 
it ended his career. And Jeff, my timer went to sleep. Where am okay. I? All right. So Chris, do we have any questions? Uh, we don't have any questions. So there's one comment uh, that, you know, it's basically, I'm going to paraphrase, bless any guy who is so excited to try to pack all the history in 30 minutes. You're trying, You're trying to get, to get more out of supplies and possibly cash. <laughs> your, your, your enthusiasm is appreciated. So All right. No question. So if you want, you can finish the remaining time. Um, you can have about another eight minutes. We can you, can you can tell us a little bit more about the history. Okay, a little more. Yeah. Watch the clock because I'll go right. for hours. I'm watching the clock. All right. This is another amazing thing. And the dish that you see in here the large one that these um, generals and um, Dr. Zalin standing in front of it is still exists and it is working today. And oh, yeah. students from Princeton University are studying pulsars with it, right? But it's not just any old 1957, 60 foot dish. It actually, if you watch the Weather Channel or bring up um, a, a, a radar, weather radar app on your phone, mm -hmm. It can trace its lineage to this dish because this is the dish that um, the satellite in the center, the experimental uh, Tyro satellite, sent the first images from space to this dish. It was developed in the building that you see in the center interior pictures, the lower pictures. It worked perfect, even though they did it on April 1st. <laughs> right April Day, and, yeah. and those of you who've watched late night documentaries you've seen that in the early uh space launches they had launch after launch blow up okay yeah and even one of those vanguards that you see bouncing in the in the flames before it disappears parts of that were done in secret at camp evans but putting that aside you have to be you know waiting for the press to eat you alive because the press always did that not just today to do a launch on april 1st and the reason they did it is because the first weather map was published in london in i want to say 1885 i have the year wrong but if this worked and these photographs were able to be developed and everything worked and it was all experimental you would have auto magic weather maps hmm. and what a boon to weather prediction and mankind. And the extra bonus was a few days after it was launched, they spotted a hurricane. Yeah, and it was like, who, what happened there? There was the president, which was, who was the president? Um, it was Eisenhower. And then how did it happen that he, they, they gave him this, this, this they looked at it and what did they see? They, they, what did they think it was? Um, well, they saw the eye and they were sort of, you know, people knew about the eye of the hurricane because if you've ever had the eye go over you, which we have here one year, it happened at Camp Evans, um, the wind's going one way, it's nasty as things are getting knocked over, it gets quiet for depending on how lights they are, and then the wind goes the other direction. So they knew there was an eye, but they couldn't imagine you could see it from space. So when they saw that first hurricane, it was a revelation and hurricane tracking was born down the street here at Camp Evans. <clears throat> and before that, the first photograph taken was given to a helicopter pilot just uh, in the large parking lot. He flew it to a nearby airport where a jet, a fighter jet was waiting. They handed him the photograph. It was uh, flown down to Edwards Air Force Base zipped over to the White House, and they handed it to President Eisenhower three hours after it was developed that same day, because it was such a leap in science. Okay? Wow. And again, and it's thrilling that thanks to the Princeton Physics Department, who pushed about $50,000 into getting this baby working again, it is not only a, a giant artifact that you can't put in display case, it is now, again, a tool of science. All right. They did nuclear research here. They, they had a 25 foot deep um, uh, containment vessel, not a reactor. And the team from Camp Evans learned about electromagnetic um, pulse of an atomic bomb. 
And this is one of the areas where they learn how to harden communication circuits from that pulse. Okay. What does hardening mean? It means if a burst of energy comes from an atomic blast and in, you know, at the 1950s and 60s, we were worried that the Soviets were going to do an air burst over um, cities oh, yeah. and that would knock out all the communications networks to like counterattack. Like something like that. Yep. Okay. And so here at this old Marconi station, this World War One site, this World War Two site, they were effectively preparing for the Cold War. And sometime when you look at uh, up, up this one gray uh, photograph or black and white photograph, you see a World War II weasel. Um, if you pair this up with a late night documentary uh, when you can't sleep, they'll talk about the first atomic bomb tests after the war where the scientists in Nevada are trying to learn about this and they go out and lead line tanks. Well, after a while, they realized that that really wasn't good because they didn't have air filtration systems on their tanks and stuff like that. So they developed a remote controlled weasel. Why a weasel? Because that was the World War II name of that kind of device that could uh, uh, go onto a landing beach and had treads. And in the World War II electronics, look at the size of the antenna, 12 foot antenna. The idea was at the test site, they would have the weasel in a hardened bunker. As soon as the bomb blew up, it, the thing would, through radio control, would zip out and look for short-term isotopes that their half-life would have them disappear in a few hours. Mm. Okay, So all in the names of physics fun. And look at the bottom center photo. Um, the... Um, it looks like hier hier hieroglyphics. Or... Yep, as, as a laugh. Uh, they thought their underground um, open air t uh, chamber looked like a, an e Egyptian tomb. Yeah. And um, the uh, scientist, his name escapes me, which uh, bothers me. Uh, he had a relative who was into Egyptology. And as a joke, he painted this and it became uh, world famous among physicists. Okay. So... Oh, oh, there oh. we go. The most important part. Moby oh. Dick. Tell me about Moby Dick. What what, what is that? How does it relate to computer technology? Well, it's it's one of the great granddaddies of mobile computing. And uh, the the inside story was that one of the units here wanted to buy a computer for their purposes, and the budget office said, sorry, no, no money for computers. Too bad. OK. And, you know, bureauc bureaucrats, they don't care. And for some reason, they couldn't do the politics to order them to find money. But there was a lump of money for mobile army field equipment. So they bought the mainframe of their dreams and a tractor trailer and put the mainframe in the, uh, uh, you know, in the trailer. And you remember the story about IBM and the seven dwarfs? Well, yes. one of the dwarfs was Sylvania. So that was the main contractor at the time. And they jokingly lined up the name so it worked out to be Moby Dick. <laughs> so it was uh, creative funding procurement, I guess, or however you want to word that. Yes, it was. And the lore is that, you know, when the laughter died down or the anger went away from the accounting people, <laughs> um, they had to do the standard mobile army field tests. And the urban legend is, whether it's true or not, is that the computer worked fine, but the truck broke down because the computer was overweight for the truck. Wow. Okay. So that's Moby Dick. And it created, they created a thing called field data for it. And what's field data? Field data was building upon a, a communications code for early radar systems out in the field to get their data back with a code that was reliable that had a level of, of error correction um, to that level of processor, be it mechanical, you know, electromechanical, or later um, vacuum tube computers. So as I understand it, field data was a precursor to ASCII code. So it was a standard symbolic code where you can exchange it between different computers because in those days every computer was unique there was no standards every you couldn't communicate so that was a way to share data with different computers yes 
Yes. Isn't that great? Yes. And we have a model of this Moby Dick in the VCF Museum. And courtesy of CHM, Computer History Museum, we have a video that has video details of Moby Dick. Yep. Um, so one, 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 one more. One, I got to do thing. one more. One more thing. Now, okay. there was this professor um, who was at Ursinus College, and then he went to U of P. And as a professor, and I get to see the Princeton, you have to find money for projects to fund your uh, group of graduate students and postdocs and all that. So they're like little little tribes of invention or innovation, right? So while at U, U of P, um, Professor Malkley or Dr. Malkley picked up a contract to analyze radar coverage diagrams because Camp Evans wanted to know where did radar energy go at this distance, at that further distance, and it was a whole bunch of simple, but hundreds of thousands of calculations. And he realized that he could conscript every computer person with a calculator called a computer at the U of P and he couldn't fulfill his contract. So for years in his head, he had bouncing around the idea of making an electromechanical computer system, a system to replace the computers and now he had the motivation. So in a oral history that he did at the Smithsonian, he said that that project was the inspiration for getting his ideas out of his head and onto paper because he, he thought the army would fund it to get their radar coverage diagrams. And his fellow professors um, looked at him and said, no, 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 the army's not going to fund that. When you go to the Army Funding Board and you say radar coverage diagram, you're going to get the hook. Let's figure out something your machine do that they'll pay for. And that was gun firing tables. When you get a brand new gun and you can cast the barrel with the same um, molten metal on the same day with the same mold one after another, and you take it out to a test range, when you fire that shell, it will not go to the same spot as the gun made five minutes before. So they have to take them out to a test field, see where they shoot and do every permutation of uh, humidity, wind speed, and they create this big fat table. So during World War II, guns would sit in the field longer than they wanted them to waiting for the gun firing table calculations to be done. And that was the promise that led to the funding of ENIAC. Awesome. I, yeah. I give up. Well, thank okay. you, Fred. I mean, we could like, talk for like hours. Well, there, there is a question. If, if, One question then. It's a maybe, it's a maybe question because okay. you don't, may or may not want to elaborate on the uh, rest of the anecdote about Senator McCarthy. Okay. Senator McCarthy got bogus information that there was a spy cell um, acting in West Germany or East Germany, and they could get documentation out of Camp Evans at their will. Okay. I didn't, I didn't think they used the term on demand, but it was sort of like that. And the FBI had investigated and found out that the sp spy was lying. He did actually have a manual, top secret manual from Camp Evans on a microwave radar, but we gave the Soviets the manual, the radar, and trained them on how to use it. Because as Machiavelli would say, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Mm. And the Soviets were our friends. So the story was debunked. But somehow McCarthy didn't care about that. He just heard Tom Cell and Camp Evans, and he put a fact-finding team of uh, congressmen together, and they came here, and we have pictures of him. Unfortunately, the sound was lost on the video, walking out of the parking lot to the front of the Mark Money Hotel, walking up to the, the step of the hotel. But there's pictures of him in the lounge and pictures of him at the front gate. And when he came to a nuclear detection project, and he was already pre-ticked off. 
because he had reporters with him and people without top secret clearance. And when you're elected to, Cong elected to Congress, you get top secret clearance. Isn't that scary? Um, but anyway, putting that aside, the, when he would come through with his entourage, people would lock documentation away and close things because that was the rules. And for some reason that annoyed him. Hmm. And when he got into this project in a small building that's still here, building 9400, where they had computers, not computers, because they weren't up Person, to this. people instead of machines. Right. Computers were pe people, computers or machines. When data would come in from clandestinely hidden devices, it would pick up seismic vibrations from underground so Soviet nuclear tests that data would be crunched into where the test was and how powerful it was. So we knew if we had the uh, biggest firecrackers on the block and McCarthy was shown that and he came out and said, this should be declassified. Let the reporters in where this should go to the public. And oh, you, God. you, the, <clears throat> the army decides what's top secret and secret. And this broke the rules. And the guards inside, armed guards, said, sir, you can't order us to let people without clearance in the building. I don't care. I'm a member of Congress. And we interviewed one of the guys and he said, what do I do? Shoot a reporter or somebody or get court marshaled, uh, go to Levensworth and my family starves. Right. But luckily, the congressman backed down. Right. And a fellow with him, I, I want to say Roy Cohen, swore to get vengeance on the army. Well, the army was so annoyed that they used politics to get the army McCarthy hearings. They say it's the first reality television, but they destroyed McCarthy on public TV. But if you buy that, uh, I bought it as a VHS tape, right, and listen to it, you can hear McCarthy go, if you only knew what's going on in our secret and... Um, the fellow who's sort of uh, prosecuting him shouts him down because even though everybody knew this was the radar laboratory, it wasn't big on the, you know, public thing. Public the, awareness. Right? right. So that's the McCarthy story. All right. Well, thank you, Fred. I mean, there's a lot of history here. Um, you, people can come here to Camp Evans, an InfraWage Science and History Museum. Um, there's a lot of different exhibits and museums here, World War II history, uh, antique radio, shipwreck museum, electronic warfare is a very interesting one. So um, I encourage people to come and visit. We're open Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday, 1 to 5 p.m. Pay admission and come in, support our museum. It's great. And I really appreciate you coming in. And finally, you can tell our vintage computer audience some history of Camp Evans. Thanks, Jeff. It was my pleasure. You're welcome. Um, so the next thing up we have is the C-256 Phoenix by Stephanie Allaire. She is a great um, little oh. All right. Did you get the whole thing? All right. Ready to go with Stephanie Allaire and 256 Phoenix. Oh, big it so. Uh, my name is Stephanie. I am the creator and designer of the C-256 Phoenix. Uh, welcome to this uh, presentation. Um, before we begin, uh, I would like to uh, give some thanks to uh, Jeffrey from VCF East for inviting me. I mean, I'm talking to Jeffrey on a regular basis, but I would, you know, um, you know, give those thanks to everybody that was involved uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to be here today um, to present you this this uh, retro computer and its inner working. And um, I hope you'll find it interesting. Uh, thank you for being there and spending the time to watch this. I hope you'll uh, you'll like I said you'll enjoy it and you'll find it interesting. And hopefully you'll join in uh, for the future of this uh, of this endeavor. Uh, because I certainly need more people to get involved to make this more uh, success and to to keep this going. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, I would say that early on the the in at the beginning of the year, 
in April, I was supposed to give like a full class on the C65, uh, 865816. I'm going to chuck it down a little bit and, and put a little bit more stuff around. Um, uh, but I still want to talk about my experiences dealing with the 65C816. I think that was uh, quite interesting. And considering that the, the, the day's theme was supposed to be about the 6502, um, I think that is very suitable. Um, so at this point, I guess I should present my agenda. So today, well, sorry, it's slides, but I'll try to make it a little bit more interesting. So I want to talk about what is the Phoenix. We'll spend about 15 minutes on this. Uh, what is it? Where is it now? What happened? Uh, I'll do a couple of demonstration to show you on the machine uh, a couple of demos that uh, Daniel uh, created. We'll talk about Daniel later. Then we'll go in the heart of the presentation, which is really about the processor. What is what are those challenges? What I had to face? Um, my hubris. I think I we we're going to talk a, lo a lot about my hubris, and you know because I'm a hardware design engineer by trade. I've designed like a countless amount of products. Uh, you know, did some you know schematic PCB debugging. You know the whole nine yards FPG design, mechanical design, the whole thing. So when I got it started in this, I was pretty well equipped. Um, but you know, sometimes, oh, a processor, 14 megahertz, you know, what could possibly go wrong, right? So at this point, I want, I want to end the whole presentation with good news and new stuff and exciting stuff. And again, I hope that you'll be joining in, um, in the future for the future of this project, because I think it's, it's, um, it's really exciting. Despite the fact that at some point I kind of decided to stop, but we'll talk about this later. We'll keep the drama for, for, for later. All right, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. So ultimately how this computer started, the development of this computer started, I've been telling this story so many times. It's about David Murray, the 8-bit guy on YouTube, uh, the Gigatron episode in April 2018. He talks about his dream computers at the end. He laid down a list of stuff he wanted and figured that, hey, maybe some people out there will do it. And I guess a couple of people did, and I was amongst those people. Um, so it took me a while. It took, it took like a few weeks to think about it and say, okay, how I would do this. I was definitely in the retro mood and getting like a, I was about to get myself a, a C64. And I said, you know what? This is interesting. Let's do this. And basically how I went about it was, you know, David laid it out and I was going to play it out but I was going to spin it my way because I realized that, okay, I'm going to spend a lot of money on this. I uh, have my own vision of what he wants. So I will spin it that specific way, which was probably not David's way. But anyway, um, it's like any writers, screenwriters getting their stuff being produced, right? The director spin it their own way, you know? So it's the same thing. Um, my, so the vision, I, at this point, I could say, what was the original vision? What I wanted to do? Uh, you know, I'm coming from a place where I've designed a lot of different products. I want to honor, to a certain degree, Commodore's legacy without designing anything Commodore because I didn't want to cut with, you know, copyright infringement, stuff like this. So I, I'm going with, I take David's idea, I said, okay, let's create something that could have happened. Something like a a different timeline where, uh, you know, Jack Jamil doesn't go, doesn't, doesn't get kicked out of his own company, go and at Atari and uh, Commodore buying Amiga. Let's say that none of these things happen. Um, and let's say they decide to, okay, we need to get on the 16 bit bang wagon. Let's design something. Um, and I think it's very unlikely that Commodore would have let go of the C64 compatibility because they were going to with the C65. So they were really, really, really on, hanging on to this. But I'm taking a different path where they would, because Amiga was really this next generation where nothing was compatible. So they did, in a way, sever this tie with the C64 um, by buying Amiga. So I, w I am heavily influenced by Amiga at this point. So I decide to to go and say, oh, I want to use FPGAs, even if David is not uh, so much for them. For me, FPGAs represent the ASIC development of Commodore, which was a 
paramount to their success. Without these custom ships, without Jack buying, uh, you know, the the ASIC division, uh, things would have never happened that way. So I'm taking um, a part of this and saying, bringing it back here and saying, uh, those FPGs will be considered as ASIC. And it's the reason why there was no reason for me to share the, I don't want to share the FPG content because allowing people to modify the FPG as well would be counterproductive to the idea of these things need to be fixed in time to support every uh, software uh, programmer so they always have the FPGA to be the same. I decide to go along with the 65816. This is a good choice. It's the right speed, not too fast, not too slow. Even at that point, it's very comparable to a 68,000 at 7 megahertz. Um, I have access to 24-bit range. This is great. I can do like my graphic implementation makes sense. So I go with this. And finally, I decide, okay, it needs to have a lot of, sorry, it needs to have a lot of graphics and sound. Very important to me. Because at the end of the day, uh, you can have like a, a lot of people use like a small 8-bit processor these days, and it's great. They put some memory, they put some, you know, flash, they put like a, a CIA, and then they have a serial port and everything is good and dandy. Uh, but the problem is that it's kind of limiting. And I think it's without sound, without music and graphics, it makes the experience less interesting, I think. I think having access to these things motivate people to go do more uh, because it's more stimulating, of course. I mean, the sound, seeing a sprite appears, moving a sprite around is very, you know, um, involving. It really gets you to to go the next step. Otherwise, just, you know, there's just so much you can do with text, right? So anyway, uh, so this that, that meant also that I had to design my own custom ships, which was part of the, the challenge, I guess. So I go on and I start. So this is the rundown of what happened. By the way, I have a Cintiq tablet here, so that's why I'm kind of shaving. I'm touching my tablet. Maybe you don't see me, but anyway. So that's why I'm looking down. The whole thing starts in April 2018. I take some time to think about it. Uh, at this point, I'm kind of, okay, I'm going to do this on the ground. I'm not going to bother myself with the whole politics and everything. But along the way, I start collecting all the parts. I use Snappy DA to get my parts. Great company, great stuff, by the way. Uh, shout out to them. But as an happenstance, I end up being the 100,000 subscribers. Natasha, the CEO, decide to make a, an interview with me, and then the word gets out. And then I get a lot of attention, which influenced a lot the, the deployment of the first platform, which was a, a amalgamate... Uh, of what I wanted and what people wanted, which was weird because people were thinking, oh, that's another C64 or it's going to be compatible with C64, like a, a, a more advanced C128. And I didn't want to do anything with C64, you know, playing, you know, Choplifter or playing like Blue Max is great, but, you know, there's plenty of possibilities for people to play Blue Max on DC64 these days. So I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to get myself into making a perfect replica for 6567 that mo that a lot of people did already. I didn't want to revisit. I wanted it to be its own thing. I believe in the idea that I wanted to create a new platform for people to rekindle with the idea of discovering a new machine, uh, learning this new machine, this you know, developing new stuff for this machine. That was the goal. That's still my goal to this day. Create a new library of games for a new machine. But obviously that machine needs to be successful in terms of, but they're interlinked between each other. Software, support, machine, uh, availability, and you know price and everything. I'll come to that later. Anyway, so in October, I finally, I, I go to the Fall Retro Expo. I meet with David. It's great. We sit down. We talk about it. Uh, we have similarities in our ideas. We have, you know, divergence in our ideas. I talked to a friend, Yuri, that I met at CRX a few months before. He gets me straight and said, you know what, this is great, but it's not really what you want to do. And I come back later, a few months later, with the B2 version, which means I spend this spend this thing a couple of things, a couple of times to arrive to this this version. And it starts to look like I want like what I want. Out of this I meet great people, Peter, Daniel, and Mike, and, and Nadia, which are great, helped me achieve a lot, and they're still here to this day, and they're doing awesome. Um, 
this is in spring 2019 and then I go down the rabbit hole. This is really my hero's journey and I'm going into the underworld where I start creating these different versions and they all have issues. I bring in these new chipset, like these new sound chips and it's really a nightmare for me because I feel the pressure because I already start selling it. The, the promising to have like a C version and I'm promising stiff putting more pressure on me which just leads to almost like a depression and then finally I emerge out of my underworld uh, in fall 2019 it's kind of surprising considering the fall is supposed to be going in the underworld and anyway I'm getting out of it and then finally the C4A in January gets starts to be shipped by April 2020 I think everything is shipped and then I start selling the C4B. But at that point, I didn't implement the whole Viki, new version of Viki I wanted to have. It's not finished. And I say, hey, I want to ship those boards only when I'm finished, which is the case, should be the case by the time we, we, we you see that. So um, this is where we stand. So quickly, this is the overall block diagram. So the whole process got me to, to today to this configuration, which is uh, you have an FPGA, uh, which is Cyclone 3 to drive like a, a four banks, well, four chips to get 32 bit wide memory bus because I'm limited to 100 megahertz speed with the RAM. So I need to get more bandwidth to do a lot more to do bitmap tile layers and, and sprites and all these things together. I need to have more bandwidth. So I expand my, my bandwidth by having more chips, but more bits per chips. That's what video cards do these days anyway. I put a little bit more extra memory, so four megs. I integrate two chips that I used to have, which was Beatrix and Gavin together. I create Gabe, which end up being the system chip, plus mathematic, like math blocks to do float and fix to help the 65816. And I include all these beautiful unused Yamaha hutches because they're complex to be dealt with and most people don't use them, which is kind of ironic. OPL3 was my choice and I kept I stuck with it, but then I had up the other guys. And then I, from the very get-go, I wanted to have the Super I.O., I wanted to have the floppy, the MIDI ports, and so on and so forth. Because I saw the Phoenix early on as a very, uh, like a like a music box, like somebody wants to do chip tune, that would be the box to, to use it for. It's an high-end machine. It's meant to be used for development also. Um, at this point, I want to talk a little bit about um, I want to talk about the the Viki 2 chips just to give a glance. Uh, so it's now it supports multiple uh, video uh, video resolution. It's with it did the pixel. It has uh, lookup tables that you have 24 bits per byte, so you can have all the colors you want, but you're limited in number of colors you can see at the same time. Um, 524. Uh, 2K colors at the same time if you use all the lookup tables. Uh, you have two layers of bitmap, four layers of tiles that you can scroll, uh, 64 sprites. Sorry. You have an SDMA block that does DMA uh, for the internal memory. And then you have the VDMA, which does the, um, the uh, DMA for the uh, video memory. And when you want to transfer stuff, they talk to each other. You can really, you could literally run both at the same time. Um, so at this point, finally, this is in a nutshell what how the graphic chips deals with. So layers, you can have sprites in, in between all those different layers. You have the layer for the uh, tiles. You have the layers for the bitmaps. So yeah, it's pretty uh, comprehensive. There's, it's, it's yeah, a lot of work in there. Um, and like I said, support different resolution. It's, it's pretty complete. At this point, Gabe has interface to all these magnificent chips. Like I said, these guys are a pain in the butt to get because there's a lot of them that, you know, China has been going on this rampage about stripping off all these chips out of all those boards, wasted boards. Um, but some of them don't work and they still sell them. They re they re laser them. Um, it's very difficult to find working chips. You know, you get chips, they're not real sound chips. They've been re lasered like they were chips, they're not sound chips. There's something else, it's crazy. Um, so, funny enough, the PSG is amongst the chips that are real, and they probably somebody has stock still somewhere. 
Um, there's also inside the unit the SID. It's a Gideon version. Thank you very much, Gideon, for letting me use this core. Um, it needs to be fine-tuned, but it's there. Um, so, you know, like I said, a lot of graphics, a lot of sound. That was the point. And this is what it is today. So if you're getting an FMX, that's, this is literally what you get. Then this is on top of having the SD card, expansion bus, like I said, the MIDI. Um, so much potential here. And the price is still pretty reasonable. $320 is, I think, is fairly cheap. So at this point, I'm going to break the, the rhythm a little bit. I want to show you um, what it's like to download something. So I'm going to bring something on the screen here to show you. So this is the Phoenix IDE, which is a, um, uh, a software that allows you to, div to do some developing uh, as an emulator. You can run your code in there. It supports the graphic chips and all these things. The sound is not there, but um, most of everything else is there. So you certainly can do a lot of development there. And uh, an interesting part of it is that you have uh, the ability to download your code straight in the machine through the debug back, the background debug mode that I call. And, um, and I would like to show you. So I would like to show you first the tracker. So I'm going to um, put the screen. So I'm going to cut the uh, output of the unit. I'm going to unmute the sound. So I'm going to cut that in. So hold on, I'm going to put this next door here. So usually you're going to, we use a 64 task to, as a compiler. Um, and then we create an X file with certain things, of course. And then we can load it in the machine. So I have a machine running next to me. I can, I can probably show you here. So there's this, the keyboard, there's the machine working here. So I try to not, so I'm back in the screen. So at this point, what I would do is simply uh, run the, send the data in. So this is the tracker that Daniel Trombley designed. It start gets the uh, OPL3. Um, so what I would do is literally uh, control load, control L, and I'm going to choose a file. I don't see clearly on the screen right now, but I'll take one. This is a rad player, and then I would start the, the tune. All right, so this is an example. Um, so what do I, what I would, would sorry. At this point, what I, I'm going to reset the machine, and I'm going to look for the Tetris game. Hopefully it's going to work. So this is another uh, software that D Daniel designed. Um, he's been migrating the software from uh, the Viki 1 to Viki 2. Um, so I think there's some still some issues. So because if I'm trying to move the part, I can't. So probably a bug got introduced. But yeah, otherwise it's supposed to work. So it's a Tetris. And with sound. It's really cool. They, Daniel did a wonderful job. He's been a hard believer since day one. I'm really grateful to have him on the team. So this is what it is. All right. So I will uh, cut that out. So let's get this out of the screen. Um, I will remove the sound. I will cut it out and I will remove these little guys and we can move on. Okay, so we're 20 minutes in. I took a little bit more time. Let's... All right, so the CPU, let's talk about the 65816. Okay, so at this point, the reason I used it is because it was part of David's requirement. Like I said pr pr uh, previously, one of the reason I, I stuck with it was... Sorry was because it was perfect. It was fitting in the vision. 6502 based, fast. Sorry again, fast, 24-bit uh, range. And, you know, it's, it's, it's perfect. 68,000 would have been like a stretch uh, and 6502 would have not been enough. 
Um, so it makes perfect sense. Little did I know that I was going to struggle. And and here is I here I talk about my hubris. You know, been doing design for many years, been dealing with PCI Express, SD RAMs, and not DDR RAMs, like two, three hundred megahertz speed design. And I'm I'm going to design something at 14 megahertz. You know, yeah, it's slow, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to do a disclaimer here. What I'm about to talk about is my struggle with the part. Doesn't mean that it's difficult to interface with. I think there's a bit of me. Uh, it's there's a little bit of me uh, pushing the edge, uh, the design and the part, and creating a lot of problem for myself. So it's in no ways <laughs> Bill's fault at this point. Uh, I think it's really about me, but uh, uh, doing what I do, which is really pushing the boundaries of things, and I get myself a lot in trouble. So the first challenge, so I'm gonna talk about three challenges. The first challenge was the multiplexing. And the multiplexing has its own challenge because one would think that, oh yeah, the CPUs run at 14, and in reality, it does work at 14. But when you talk from a system perspective, it's not quite 14 megahertz. In reality, it's actually 28 megahertz because the way the 65816 works is that in order to be compatible, pin compatible with the 6502, it had to have this capability to use the normal bus as a 6502, 64K, but then being able to expand with the 6816 was to use part of the clock cycle to introduce this extra byte of uh, bank number, if you will. So the bank address is actually supply on the first part of the clock. Okay, so if this Phi 2 runs at 14 megahertz, when the clock is low, then the bus address has been supplied. And I totally understand why somebody would have done that this way, because, you know, package limitation, we we're back 30 years ago, it makes sense, right? Um, and then the, the actual transaction with the bus takes place on when the clock, the clock cycle is high, going from high to low. Again, would make perfect sense, right? Uh, but it does. It's just that it's very limiting in terms for many reasons. First of all, there's a lot of like legacy parts like the flash is a 70 nanoseconds flash. Um, and the clock, normally, if I would have had the whole clock cycle, then I would have been able to access it, get the data out, and it would have been great. But that's not what it's happening here because I only have 35 nanoseconds to get the data out of the flash. And considering that the the, the, the clock cycle is uh, only th using 35, then I don't. The flash doesn't have enough time after the address has been chosen, the chip selects has been turned on, to get the data out in time. So I would have to stretch the cycle a second clock. That means that anything I would run from flash from that point would be running at seven megahertz, because I would have to stretch the cycle one more one more clock cycle to get enough time. And then it brings its old bag of shenanigans, which I'm going to talk a bit in my third challenge or second challenge, well, anyway. So this is something I overlooked. You know, I started doing this thing, saying, oh, it's 14 megahertz, they have a multiplex thing. I didn't think about it at first. When I started implementing it, oh, I, I realized that, oh, this is cutting down my time. And it's kind of tricky uh, because the window of time where the CPU needs to get its data valid and so on is very short. So it's a slow processor, but the intricacies of getting the data on time is complex. So that was a challenge for me uh, because I just put a lot of stuff on the bus and that's something I will be talking about as well, bus loading. And, and that was one of the, my first challenge. So uh, I've tried many ways. So I, I, I was, the, the deal is at early on, I, was, I wanted to use the FPGA to do the, the, the Nimuxing internally, then feed everything. But because of the FPGA nature of not exactly all the lines and everything being the same, uh, it would take a lot of work to make it the same. It was just creating a lot of problems. And I'm, I'm, I'm fairly good with FPGAs, but when it starts in the timing tuning, I hate it. So I tend to be lazy. So, you know, I made my job easier. And by later just introducing the uh, latch outside, because latching in FPGAs is just a pain in the butt. Anyway. That's what I did. Again, my part mostly, but it's it's tricky. 
And I was warned about this early on. I didn't listen and say, oh, no, no, it's going to be fine. You know, 28 megahertz, not that fast, right? Anyway, which brings me to the second challenge. So the challenge number two was the extension of the bus. Because one of the things that took me another time, another little bit of time to understand is that at some point, when you're actually extending by bringing the, there's a line on the CPU, the relay line that gets the CPU to stop completely, statically to stop and say, okay, you want the bus? Fine, take it. Try state all the everything. Just, okay, use your thing, do your thing. It's all good and dandy. Uh, and what happens is that you need to keep this I value valid. So at first I didn't keep that value. So I was getting the latch to latch every cycle of the wait time which was getting me to have false data, disabling the chip select, and it was a nightmare. And it took a while to really make it work properly where, okay, so when the latch is on, when the ready line is on, then the latching needs to stop. Because you want the chip select, the high part to be valid, so the chip select will be working, so I can actually have the data I want. And I was driving, for example, the RTC chips I'm using need some extension, need some uh, way more than 35 nanoseconds to, to actually get the data out. So I need to extend the cycle. The Super IO was super slow. It takes 10 clock cycle to get the data out, uh, considering that I have to go through mistability, um, you know, flip flops flop to, you know, because I'm crossing clock domain. I don't want to go there. That's another kind of worms. So anyway, if you see on the graphics, um, here, there's, here's a cycle. You see the chip select gets enabled here. AF is the I part of the address I'm targeting. 800 is where the RTC is. And you have the output enabled. That's another thing. You want to have the output enabled to only be enabled while the actual data needs to be out. You cannot have the output enabled getting the data out of the chip, the, the device you want, while you're updating the address so there would be a conflict. So there's these little intricacies of, okay, when you want to extend the bus, you need to make sure that all these things happen. So this is an example here where the ready lines has been pulled low. Then you have the, uh, the chip select being enabled. And then you need to be able to supply the data at the right time, at the right clock moment for it to be fetched by the, be sampled by the CPU at the right time. So, that was a challenge. And it was not a small challenge per se. It was like, I struggled many weeks on this to make it work properly and was like, um, and, and, and disclaimer, I'm gonna say something, it's not a critique. It is, well, it is a critique. Uh, Bill, I'm sorry. The, the data sheet is very simple when it comes to timing information. It's one timing diagram and if I would have been able to tell Bill 30 years ago, okay, uh, dude, uh, you need to make this a little bit more detailed. You need to put more information about how the ready line system works and when and how, uh, because this one timing diagram and the spec sheet is so, uh, there's so much stuff in there. It's very difficult to really grasp the, 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 the idea behind it. So anyway. Sorry, I don't mean to hurt anybody's feeling. Um, as a developer, if I had a complaint to do to the creator of this part and in terms of documentation was, okay, that timing diagram needs to be better or there's need to be more like a read cycle, a write cycle, a ready cycle with details, how it behaves and where where's the window where the data can be valid or not. I mean, this information is there, but I overlooked, you see, I'm asking for a better documentation. I don't read the damn thing. So it's my fault. Anyway, so that brings me to the challenge number three, and that's basically my fault again. So you see hubris, hubris, hubris. So uh, the deal is that early on, I had one part, three FPGAs. Uh, the bus was driving all those FPGAs, uh, plus the memory, plus the flash. So there was a lot of loadings. And what the loading does is stretching your rise and fall time. And if you see on the, on the right here, you see that when the signals, and I'm exaggerating the graphics a little bit here, but you see the point is that if you have a signal coming and it's really fast going up and down, then you, you get to be recognized as one at the right time. If for some, some reason you have a lot of loadings on your bus, then the rise time 
take more time because there's more capacitance on the line, then everything starts to be a little bit slower and slower and slower. So your 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 the time that the gate sees your values to one has been skewed and it's been recognized before, and then it's recognized after. Um, and sometimes it's a good thing and sometimes it's a bad thing because if this thing stretch like a lot, then you can have issues like for the clock cycle that was an issue. And I was also an issue with the ready line because the ready line was an open collector input and it had a, a, a resistor, a pull-up resistor. And that pull-up resistor with the line loading was really like a long uh, rise time and fall time. That's the nature of those, unless you really put like a really small value for the resistor um, to make it like, dry, like a drive a lot, uh, those rise time and fall time are, are long. So by loading the ready line, I was really stretching it to the point where I could literally offset the whole thing by one half clock cycle. It was terrible. And that was a big deal. And that actually made me change one revision of board to another during my nightmarish time in 2019. It was really a doozy. Um, and so the solution to that was ultimately to get all those ready lines coming from different devices to be uh, sent to one device and the, all that device would or them together in a normal fashion, and then only one device would drive the ready line. So then not loading the whole thing. Because if I was going to put an expansion, that things would have gone out the window, and that would have not worked. The system would have not worked. Uh, it happens because I designed this piggy, this stutter card for your audio sound, and, and that didn't, didn't work. I did the mistake of using one clock cycle, one clock signal for everything, and I had the same problem with the clock which made me realize that the 65816 is very sensible to where and when the data needs to be uh, uh, valid. Because if the clock was going to be skewed because there was more or less load, then the moment the data would appear or disappear would be very critical. So that's one finny, finicky part about the 65816 is the fact that it's, um, it's very specific about when and how, so if the clock is skewed uh, and the ready line is too long, then everything goes down the drain. And that's what I've experienced. Um, I was going to say something about something, but I guess I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, so we're 30 minutes in, and, and this is what the experience of the CPU was about. That, these were mainly my biggest issues, and like I said, half of those problems were created by me, by, uh, well, probably, you know, 90% of the problem were created by me, by not loading, by loading the bus, which means that I should have had more uh, buffers to allow to, to the CPU to not drive so much, um, to have uh, like one clock driver for every device, uh, have one ready line drivers, but these are the parts of what the whole design is about, you know, the debugging part. Um, overall, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of everything else, from the moment it worked, it worked. Then all the grievances I could have, well, I don't have that much grievances after that. I think software people have grievances usually about the different, um, you know, different new registers when you're extended mode. But I don't want to get into this. This is another, another chapter. And I wouldn't want to go there because I think it's irrelevant to the discussion. Uh, so that leads us inexorably to what's what's going on next. Um, in in June, I I put out a video saying that I was going to stop. Well, I was going to stop. Yes, um, uh, time was tough because I had like I felt I put a lot of pressure on myself, and some people were complaining. I was tired of the complaining. It's like, listen, if you don't like it, just, you know, might as well go get something else. There's plenty of solution, design your own, you know, because I'm a pleaser, I want to please people. And when people are not happy, that puts more pressure. And those machines are taking a long time to build. I mean, the surface mount machine was taking an hour just to, 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 to create one, to surface, to put all the parts on, I mean, the surface mount machine was about 15 minutes, but then everything else I needed to put on because it was not big enough to put everything. I had to put everything else, take an hour. Uh, from that moment, it took another five hour to actually getting everything done and finished. So that took a toll on me and I was like, okay, this is, needs to stop. 
But in my mind, I was not really stopping. I was just really putting an end to people coming to me and saying, oh, I want this, I want this, I want this. Uh, so in a way, I wanted to keep going. And I, was, I, was, I wanted to give me some time to finish the development of Ikitu, which I'm almost done with. And then my, love, my, my, my life... Um, my life changed my, you know, like a lot of people's life changed job wise and everything. Although that was a choice for me to leave where I, I am. I was, uh, in September. So, well, yeah, left in September. So I think I decided to give a second chance myself, a second chance with that project. Uh, I think the Phoenix will rise from its ashes and I want to bring something new and I want to present it to you today, uh, because the FMX is great, but the FMX is, um, a very fancy machine. It's very complicated. It takes a lot of time. And I want, if I want to make this a success, I wanted to grow my own audience. And that's one, I want, one thing I wanted to do, which means that I wanted to create, I started doing some streaming. I need to do more. I need to have a little bit more time. Um, and I want to find a way to get this in more, uh, to get this in people's hand because that's part of the deal. Having software, the idea at the beginning was let's get a unit out, let's get people to develop, but you know, life happens. So maybe half of the people got a unit are actually doing stuff on it. And sometimes they're just, you know, tinkering with it. They don't know doing anything really like meaningful for people to use. And it's perfectly fine because, you know, it's their, you know, uh, prerogative to decide to what to do. Um, uh, because I see the need of having software in order to put it together for, for a platform to be successful. Unfortunately, I don't have David's audience. So I just figure, okay, let's inspire people to do more. And so I started the streaming, creating games that we know and to use them as use cases to implement a new game and to get the, the code to be free and for people to download, to use as an example, to get people kickstarted and, and that's the idea. That's what I want to do. But for that, I need a machine that is more accessible um, and cheaper uh, because apparently price is a good is a big deal. Although you would think that in this world of hobbyism, uh, price is no problem. But, you know, some people manage to get in people's mind that pricing is important. Uh, people are paying $300 for a keyboard, but they're not willing paying $200 for a computer which doesn't make any sense to me. But hey, that's the nature of the beast. But anyway, so I'm ready to announce today that I'm going to release in the, probably in December, the Phoenix U, which is something I've been talking about for a long time, which is the user version. The user version is a cheaper version, uh, a smaller version, uh, which at this point will include pretty much what the other one had, albeit a couple of things that would not be there. Um, so let me talk to you, run down the differences, same CPU, same speed, half of the memory. I think, you know, already two megabytes is a lot for both, which is a total of four megabytes on the system, mind you. Vicky, Fat Vicky, I'm calling her, you know, making a link with, with obviously with the Amiga, but it's basically Vicky heating Gabe and having one single FPG on the board, something I didn't want to do, but this, the U version is a version of the FMX without the bells and whistles, uh, all the restriction that I gave myself in the beginning. It's really like, okay, let's get this thing manufactured by third party. I don't have to do it myself. It's really, I take it from one hand, I'm gonna give it to the other, just test it, make sure it works and get the price down. The PL3 will remain. These are still very much available. Uh, I get parts of reels, so I know reels exist. Uh, till they're not available anymore, I'll keep the real part. I think it's important to have a genuine sound. Uh, I will be transferring, if possible, the open to a pre-em and PSG into the FPGA. Uh, somebody did the design. I need to tell the person to get the permission to do this. Gideon Sid is still there. Uh, the SD card is there. The ID is still there, as you can see on the picture. And I put a star there, like an asterisk, to, to say that there's a connection, this connection here, is to put a dollar card with the LPC to put back the, LP, the Super IO to get access to the media again, the serial ports and the floppy if one would care about having these things. Um, obviously the joystick is going down from four to two. I think two is enough. Uh, the, the, the connector, the expansion connector is compatible with both. So if you design something for the FMX, it will work with the other. The background debug mode is still there. Something I wanted to remove, but I figured that it's the best way to open up the, 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 the ability to develop with it would be to keep it. Um, 
the product will be sold without enclosure. I might offer a model with an enclosure. The size of the board is literally half of the, 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 what, the other one, almost, in terms of surface. So now anybody can draw, 3D print their own enclosure. It's small enough for any 3D printer out there. I mean, the decent one, of course. We're talking about a price of 199 Obviously, if the module, the, 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 uh, the overall uh, uh, quantity is there, then, you know, I'm thinking about maybe doing a Kickstarter. The price could go down. Uh, and basically, from the moment the Vicky 2 design is finished, almost, almost finished now, the only work I have to do is to integrate both FPG together, and I'm done. So the development time between the FMX to the U is very short. So I can probably, uh, unless there's any supply problems, uh, be able to start selling uh, in December 2020. And the deal is that by October, I should announce it officially and I should be able, you should be able to do pre-sale um, in November. I start pre-selling in November. So by the time I know it's working, I start the pre-sale to make sure that I'm not selling a vaporware, but this is certainly not vaporware. I'm literally full-time on this now, so I'll be accessible. I'll create more content for it. That is my goal, uh, to really create like an ecosystem for it. I want to literally develop uh, expansion boards for it, Ethernet connectivity, which should make some happy. Please don't put Linux on this, please. Uh, <laughs> there's a whole, you know, story there. I don't want to go there. Um, create a board to put a real estate chip. I still believe it's a sandbox. It needs to remain one. I need more developer, uh, people doing conversion maybe from Super NES or creating new games. That's what I'm targeting. I want more content for it. It's a great machine. We need to create a community. I want to create a bigger community for, for that platform. And I will work very hard to get there. Uh, Super IO data cards. I'm also thinking about to help those CPU people that want just to design their own CPU, to use their own CPU, to create a VQ2 module to get people access to this VQ module, uh, this graphic engine for people to use in their own projects. This is something I want to do. Um, the, the trick with this is really to ultimately uh, find a way to having one platform and be able to deal with multiple different processors, which means that I would have to test those processors. And so that will take a little bit of time. But it would be like a single modules with a connector and everything, a piggyback that you could put on your breadboard that you could interface. Uh, obviously, if you're dealing with a 6502, then I would have to put like some kind of uh, uh, mapped register, bank register that you could change to address all the register you want. Make it like a low, low overhead to address all the memory. Um, I want to do a full game development on the platform. I started doing my own version of Jumpman. My first use case of my streaming is Jumpman, the original jump, Jumpman, but I don't want to do the whole game, just want to do a couple of levels just to inspire. Again, I really want to inspire people. I would like to do also a 68,000 version because it's dear to me, which is would be called the, A2, the 2560. And that version would be with the keyboard, but it's for longer towards the end of the year. It's going to be on the back. I don't want the pressure. I don't want to make the same mistake again. Um, so at this point, um, I'm drawing to an end. This presentation is drawing to an end. I'm almost at 45 minutes. Um, I, this is my goal for the upcoming months. I uh, really spend most of my time on this. I get the word out, get more people in. I think $200 is a fair price. I think it's a great platform, a lot of potential. Don't underestimate the value of challenging yourself to you know, target a new system. That's what I'm selling. I'm, I'm selling the idea of going back to the time where you're getting into a new machine, you need to discover it, you need to poke at it, discover its uh, texture and essence and try to get the best out of it. And I know some people are waiting for their units right now to actually do that. Um, demos, if people would get into doing demos, I think it's a great machine to do demos. So a lot of potential. And I'm not denigrating anybody but else. I think the market right now in terms of new retro is awesome. I mean, the Mega 65 is great. Uh, it has its own niche. Uh, the Commander has its own niche. I mean, it has a lot of, uh, like a lot of uh, people going in there. It's great. Um, uh, there's the Neon uh, 816. It's a different angle. It's great. 
all these projects are great for the community and I think it's a great time to do retro. But for me, I'm coming from a place of I want to discover, rediscover this passion and I'm so looking forward to go back and to actually do my own games and to rediscover this 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 pleasure and I want to bring people with me on that on that journey and I hope you can join me and um, I'm really trying my best to get this out there and I need your help hopefully you can be there thank you very much for your time again Jeffrey thank you very much to be there to invite me into this event hopefully next year I can be there locally um, and meet you all and uh, if you have any questions please uh, ask the Q&A and or you can go on the website. My email address is Steph, S-T-E-F, like Frank, at c256phoenix.com. Uh, there's a Discord channel. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Very easy to find me on Twitter. I have a page on Facebook as well. So Facebook and Twitter, pretty much where you're going to find me. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful show. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you again. VCF people, thank you again. Everybody, thank you again. And I will talk to you soon. All right. Cheers. All right. That was C256 Phoenix with Stephanie Allaire. Um, that was really amazing. It's a crazy, amazing part of the product that she made there. And I was glad that she can give us updates on where the project is. I know there are a lot of issues and a lot of history with that. Um, so we're going to take questions and answers. Um, uh, do we have any questions for Stephanie? Yes. Uh, let's see. So first question, the U model with the fat Vicky, does that have half the video performance in any sense or the same? Um, well, hi everybody. Um, thanks for watching. Uh, to answer the questions, the U version is a watered down version, which is basically less memory in terms of, uh, uh it's in terms of performance is the same thing. Uh, everything is integrated. Uh, so instead of having four megs of video memory, there's only two megs. And instead of having four megs of SRAM like code memory, there's only two megs, but the hard drive is still there. The SD card is still there. Um, uh, it should go as fast, if not a little bit more, because the part is more recent. Um, so I could stretch a little bit. Um, yeah, so for the time being, for the first card to be released, the first, that would be the version with the SRAM, I'm looking for maybe to do a SDRAM version, which could give a little bit of a boost and uh, reduce the cost of the card as well. Okay, second question. How fast is the FPGA clocked? Some multiple of 14 megahertz maybe? Um, the, the system runs at 14, uh, the bus runs at 14, uh, but the video portion, there's a section that works a hundred, uh, all the memory accesses are done a hundred megahertz. Uh, the bus is 32 bit wide. So that's gives us like 400 megabytes of reading, uh, reading bandwidth. Uh, and there's another section that works at 200 megahertz, which is like the output portion, like the gathering of all the information and the processing of all those pixels to find out which one is in the front. So. Um, yeah, so the core, the, the graphic core engine, 100 and 200, and the bus is at 14. Okay. Um, just some other comments that came in I thought were worth reading. Somebody says, this is super cool. I totally hear you on the comment about people willing to spend $300 on a keyboard, but not on a hobby computer. And that's coming from someone who spent about that on a hobby mechanical keyboard. <laughs> Uh, and then the hobby communities can have some toxic people, but you got to stay in the game for the reasons that you got in it in the first place. Got to be something you love doing, uh, which I think we all do. Uh, someone else says, thanks for the work you've done. And another person says, looks like something that would be just a just right thing. So, okay, good there. And thank you, Stephanie. I didn't know this machine existed and I am excited about getting one. Cool. So, Do you want me very, to comment on any of these things? Yeah, sure, absolutely. I, I that's all the questions at the at the moment. Okay. So go ahead. Uh, um, yeah, no, I was going to talk about, but I'm not sure if I want to go there about the whole idea of spending three hundred dollars on a keyboard and and being, uh, you know, uh, crying about the fact that a, a like a computer, like a new retro computer, would be so much more expensive. Like it's like. 
there's a paradox there, but this is a hobby, right? So it's difficult to justify people's expense or how they value what they want to have. I mean, it's, it's, oh, I want this. I'll pay any money to get it. I get it. And some people, when it comes to new retro machine, and that's what I was trying to carry on with the, I'm, that's basically what I said at the end, where what I'm trying to replicate is not to replicate a Commodore 64. Something is to bring something new, to bring us back to when we started with the Commodore 64 for anybody who was, was born before, you know, around, six, you know, 1970s and, you know, the the, the, the Gen X people, uh, where we, we just presented that computer and said, okay, what is it? Uh, and we, we spent years to discover it. So that's what I'm trying to sell, basically, the idea of going back, but also the discovery part. And that's why it, I'm trying to bring the, the, the cost down to, I mean, it's never going to be cheap as a, as a Raspberry Pi, but it's still a fairly, I think the, 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 the cost or the price proposition for what I'm offering is very good. And I hope people can get on board. I know people, there's a bunch of people interested, but they're waiting for other people to create stuff for them to use. And that, that's what the FMX was about, was really to bring a bunch of people. But uh, there's about 50, 60 units out there. And, you know, life happens as well, you know. So you think that, oh, 50 people, there will be 50 people doing stuff on it. And at the end of the day, maybe there's like only 15 because, you know, like I said, life happens, people get busy. And if something is missing and for somebody, then they might stop and never come back to it. So anyway, so in, it's, 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 it's a bit infuriating sometimes to see people spending so much money on stuff like this and not and crying about the fact that the cost is so high, which in reality is not. So if you compare the dollar of 2020 and the dollar of uh, 1987, um, but you know, I guess this is what it is. And, and to the other thing about, it's difficult to deal with people because the people that aren't satisfied are the one to talk and the people that are happy are not going to say anything. So sometimes it's difficult to grab on, uh, positive, uh, ideas or, uh, people because the positive people are busy doing stuff on your machine. They're not complaining about it. So for the creators, it's, it's it's difficult sometimes because you have to deal with the people that are want more and more and more. Um, so it can be taxing. And it was at the time. So hopefully things can get better. Uh, I think you do have new questions here, so I don't want to pay too much time. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, I think there was somebody who said, uh, does it have something like an OS already? Well, there's the kernel. Oh, that was in the different, different thread. Sorry about that. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. Uh, uh, in terms of OS, I mean, there's a kernel that we're improving every day. Uh, there's the basic interpreter. Uh, and there was Mike was doing an OS. He was got busy, and then he's, he's about to go back to it. So, yeah, the workbench is something we're still working on, and ultimately we'll, we'll have to uh, uh, something to offer in the upcoming months. It's something I don't control, obviously. Okay, now that you drew my attention to that, there's another question. Will the Phoenix uh, FMX and the Phoenix U be supported in parallel, or is the Phoenix U the latest going forward? Uh, well, the FMX is still a, a, a the base platform. Um, the both designs are pretty much the same, although they're getting mature, I think, by going to the U. Um, I will, in the U, I need to integrate both chipsets together. Um, I will probably improve on some things. So I really want to bring them both together. Although at some point I won't make any FMXs anymore because they're very uh, tedious. It, it requires a lot of time to fabricate them. And I would need a machine, which I don't have anymore because I don't work where I used to work anymore, where they would, would have machine. So they, they will become this very rare uh, units. I mean, we have, I might have like 10 more to sell, 10, 12 more to sell, and that's about it. Then I'll focus solely on the U, but if there's some um, uh, backward compatibility issue, I will fix both. I'll maintain both because I think uh, the FMX is still a very good development machine because it has so much more memory. And and again, like I said, that was the point. The FMX was supposed to be this development machine, which has more resources to be able to help develop uh, applications and software. Um. You know, and I was going to say something personal about the value of what you're doing and, and other people in this hobby who do that kind of thing, that if, if you're just looking at it superficially, you don't understand. Like I, it's funny, I, I was uh, working part time doing IT support in a school and I stepped into a classroom and the teacher let me talk a little bit about, it was a math class. I talked a little bit about Ohm's law and stuff like that. And, and a couple of kids were getting into it and a couple of kids were like, is this going to be on the test? And I'm thinking that's not the point. The point is it's something that you'd like to do. And it's something that you see the value in, in a personal level. 
Um, and then along those lines, a comment just came in to the chat. It says, thank you for this presentation. It may sound odd, but I found this to be so reassuring today, despite bureaucracies that refuse to fund technologies that have not yet proven profitable and self-serving politicians interested in nothing but increasing their own personal power, hardworking scientists persist, often in the basement or back rooms, working to develop the new technologies that will win, win wars, create new industries that later employ millions of people, and otherwise make the world a better and more interesting place. The contributions of so many unnamed heroes, including the work hidden figures like the Black Brain Trust are why we have the freedoms we have today. Thank you for working so hard to document and share their stories. So that was uh, actually, you know what? I think I just realized I copied that from the wrong thread, but it's, it's, it's funny that it fits perfectly with what we're talking about. That was actually from the history of, of uh, Camp Evans, but it, it's, I, I actually thought I was on the right, um, the right thread here because it fit. Uh, so I think what I'm getting at is there are people who understand the value here and appreciate it. So don't lose hope. Even if there's a million people that, that think it's stupid, there's probably a billion that don't. Well, thanks for that. But you know, as a creator, it's it's uh, you're you're doing. I mean, obviously, there's a part of fun on my end. Although I kind of created myself a lot of pressure over time, uh, trying to satisfy a need. And I think there is a need, and I think there's a lot of potential who, who, for anybody who wants to get in there. Uh, but uh, it, it's the the paradox is like I said, it's like there's there there's a portion where as an individual, you're creating something for yourself. You want to, you're very excited. You know, I, I, when I started doing this, obviously it was, it was about David Murray and the desire to have something. And then it became my desire, which was not exactly what I was targeting at first. And I transformed it. I changed it to something else. Um, but then I created that pressure for myself thinking, okay, I need to give that machine. I want it. It's like, there's the portion where you want to design something for fun. And then there's a portion where you see it to be bigger than what you thought it was. And then you get into the bang wagon. You say, oh, people will get on board with this. And you realize that it's not as, as um, black and white as you think it is. It's, it takes time, take adoption. Even today, people still don't know what this thing is about, which is really weird. But uh, but so that means that the, the 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 community is huge and it's very difficult to tackle and get. Um, and uh, for any creators, you know how difficult the process of getting something out can be, uh, even with your own self, you know, you know, self doubts and everything. It's it, it can be a real uh, issue. And so if you have people around, I, I ended up, I was lucky because I ended up having a bunch of people around me that were still supporting me fully and it's great, but you always have this desire. I wish there would be more. And then you get disappointed because sometimes you don't have more, but anyway, I think you're right. And um, it's the process and hopefully uh, the Phoenix can rise again and we'll see how it goes. Hopefully the VCF East uh, will help on that matter. Hello, Bill. All right, um, Chris, um, we're going to start wrapping up. Do we have any more questions? Maybe we can take one more. Um, let me take a look. There is one comment that I do want to read, but let me see if there's any. All right, we'll read one questions. comment, and then uh, fortunately we got to move on. We're running late. So okay. Like so the <laughs> some uh, someone says Chris is so right here. I appreciate that. Girl, Girl. power to <laughs> C two fifty six Phoenix. She will always go against the stream, and so should she. Uh, makes for unique dialogue and learning, and I agree. Excellent. Hi, <laughs> Yuri. <laughs> yeah, Yuri is a friend of mine who actually played a big role at some point when I was talking about the the, the beginning of the presentation at the uh, at the uh, retro expo in uh, October 2018 in uh, Portland. And uh, we sat down and we talked a lot and he, he shook me up a little bit. I said, okay, what are you doing? Doesn't make any sense. You need to change that stuff. So Yuri played a big role and I thank him a lot for this. So well, thank, thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you Stephanie. I wanted to say I was really disappointed in June or whenever it was that you, you uh, said you were going to stop the project. And I'm really pleased that you changed your mind and that Phoenix is going to re-rise, right? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We need to talk to the two of us. Well, you know what, Stephanie, we haven't talked yet. This is the yeah, first time we've talked. Exactly. Yeah. I wish we could have met personally. 
Well, yeah. And so, you know, if you have any questions, you know, about any of this stuff, like mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier, that you, you want more information in the data sheet. And I agree with you. And actually, we're looking at ways of improving that. But you've worked yourself through figuring it out. Right. And uh, anyhow, but Stephanie, yeah, I yeah. really, I really enjoy what you, you're doing. And, you know, the price point is an interesting thing, because I don't think there's any price. It's priceless what you're doing. All right, Bill. Sorry, Thank I you. have to cut you off. We're running 10 yep. 15 minutes late, so we have to move on. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. And there's thank the you guys. channel. You can answer more questions there. We really appreciate it. You're welcome, guys. Thank you very much for everybody watching, and uh, we'll talk soon. All right. So next up is Kay Sabitz. He is the guy who helped me process all these wonderful pre-recorded videos. So everybody submitted them and it said, here, Kay, and he processed them and fixed them and, and massaged them out and gave them to me so to be ready to go. He created Atari 8-Bit Bot and Apple II Bot. So we're going to show you this video. Hi, I'm Kay Sabitz. Oh, take like it to away. Show you my newest project. It's called Atari 8-Bit Bot. It is a Twitter bot where you can tweet code at it in Atari Basic or any of four other Atari 8-bit computer languages. It will run the code in an emulator and then tweet back to you a video of the code running in the emulator. Let me show you how it works. I'm going to uh, write a tweet to Atari 8-bit bot. And I'll put a little bit of a basic code in there. Over here in my basement, I have a Raspberry Pi uh, running a uh, script that I wrote that checks Twitter every couple of minutes for new mentions. And when it finds one, it downloads the tweet, imports the code into the Atari 800 emulator, which is running in an X virtual frame buffer, uh, which is basically a uh, monitor that doesn't exist in the brain of the computer. Uh, it runs the code for a few seconds in the emulator. It records it using a program called FFmpg. Then it uploads it back to Twitter. And back on Twitter, you can see here's my little program running, bug and all, uh, in a five second looping clip. It's a fun challenge to figure out exactly what you can do in 280 characters of code. In addition to Atari Basic, the bot can handle four other languages: Turbo Basic XL, Logo, Atari Pilot, and even Assembly Language. one more thing. That was it. That was the video. I was done. I submitted it to VCF. And then a friend said, hey, can you do a bot like that for the Apple II? And I said, I think so. And then I did. So similarly, if you send your code in AppleSoft Basic to at Apple II bot, that's Apple II bot, it will run it in an Apple II emulator and then send you pictures of that code running. And oh my goodness, the Apple II people have been real impressive in what they can do. I should say that both of these bots were inspired by BBC Microbot, which is a bot that has been around for a while that runs uh, BBC Basic uh, in, the tw in Twitter in about the same way that these do.
Like the Atari bot, this is running on an Apple emulator in an X virtual frame buffer on the Raspberry Pi, the same Raspberry Pi that's running the Atari bot. For people who know assembly language, it's pretty easy to stuff an assembly language program into the computer via AppleSoft Basic. I mean, easy for them, not for me. So that's it. I hope you enjoy the bots. Check them out on Twitter. You can find documentation and more information at atari8bitbot.com, uh, same URL for both bots, and I uh, hope you have fun with them. Wonderful, everyone. I hope everyone liked that uh, Atari 8-bit bot and Apple II bot. And we're going to go to Kay and get, answer some questions. Chris, do we have any questions for Kay? I'm looking at the stream. I don't see any in the mainstream. I'm looking at the hard stream. Well, someone asked, why are the Apple II bots so much cooler than the Atari? Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> And yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, but you know, uh, different systems do definitely have different uh, uh, capabilities and 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 different advantages. Um, some of the stuff on the Atari bot absolutely could not be done on the Apple, and and some on the Apple hasn't been done on the Atari. Um, it depends on the 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 like I said, the two systems, and then the the capabilities of the programmers who are, are hitting them so and they're both real new and people are still discovering them so i, can, I think it will remain to be seen what turns out what is the code out. somewhere such as uh, github the code is not yet on github it's it will be eventually it's still a total mess and i'm changing it every day and uh when i'm less ashamed of it it will be on github for sure I do also want to say that uh, when the Apple II bot uh, um, was announced, uh, it currently has more than uh, a thousand Twitter followers, and the, in the in the day that it it launched, everyone was hitting it, and my little Raspberry Pi was was heating up uh, because it was doing so much uh, video processing, and uh, the the temperature hit like eighty five degrees Celsius, and I didn't have a a real way to, to cool it down. I've I've since bought, but not yet installed these little little fan hats that that uh, you know will will go on top of the Raspberry Pi to, to cool it down. But basically, I I took the it was in a little plastic case. I took the top off the case that helped a lot by letting the heat escape, uh, and that, but it wasn't enough. So I took the only way to cool it is I had a a, a room a, a small box fan for the room, and I just like pointed it straight down at the at the Raspberry Pi, and that did the job. So, but since then, uh, it's still getting used, but it's not getting hammered like it was that first day. So, cooling has not been an issue. Okay, uh, don't see anything new coming in. Um, Pretty straightforward. Yeah, no, a lot of exciting comments though. People seem really, really uh, good to see, glad to see this. And there's Jeff. All right. Well, thank you, Kay. Thank yep. you for all your help with the videos and. Atari 8-bit bot is is really cool. I love it. Um, so um, there's a Discord channel if you want to stay there and watch for a little bit. Okay. Um, and we're gonna have to move on to a live stream. To we're gonna go to Amiga Bill, and he's gonna do internet streaming with vintage computers. Ready? I'm ready. All right. Here we go. Yeah. You know, so or as I say, gotta go, I like the cough button. Yeah. <laughs> The cough button. Yeah. I have a wireless, but I'm like, for this thing, because I'm, I'm basically tailored to the camera anyway. Right. What? What? So we are go. We're live. Okay, cool. Awesome. Uh, well, Corey and Jeff and everyone at Vintage Computer uh, Federation, you know, congrats. This has just been an amazing event, and I'm so lucky to be here, and I'm so uh, thankful that you guys invited me. And you're doing an amazing job. This has been, uh, you guys called the Audible here, and you're doing an amazing job. And uh, it's, just, it's just a pleasure to be here. And welcome everyone who's watching. Uh, my name is Bill Winters, but I'm also known as Amiga Bill because I like Amigas. Um, I do Amiga streams on Twitch every Sunday at 2 p.m., and people um, keep asking me, they're like, we, we would love to see, like, 
how do you how do you stream from your Amiga? So that's what gave me the idea for this exhibit. So today I'm going to show you quote, how to stream from your vintage computer. Now when you're doing a stream, uh, and of course with vintage computers, there's so many variables, so I'm not gonna be able to get into everything today. I'm also not an expert with every vintage computer, like I'm not sure how to stream from your Apple II. I'm sure I could learn and figure it out, but I don't know. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna focus on what I know today. Um, the Amiga, I've got an Amiga 1200 here and a Commodore 64. Um, so when you're doing um, a live stream, basically um, there's a few, main like, components involved. First, you have your vintage computer that you want to show. Um, second, you have your audio, which is really important. So we're going to talk a little bit about audio. Um, third, you have your camera. You don't necessarily need to have a webcam when you stream, but I think it's really nice to have a face cam because a lot of streaming is interaction with chat and having a connection with the person who's streaming. And then the fourth component, of course, is the actual computer that's doing the streaming. So I'm going to take you through um, my setup here um, like I said, lots of variables. Uh, this isn't always the way, I, this isn't exactly the way I stream it when I'm in my studio doing the streams on Sundays, but this is a great portable setup. Um, all right, so, so let's get started here. Um, so this is an Amiga 1200 computer, and the big challenge, like when you're, when you're dealing with the vintage computer, um, you have to get it into the computer that streams. My personal favorite way to do it is to figure out a way to get your vintage computer to HDMI. The reason why I like HDMI is a standard these days, and there's tons of video capture cards um, that use HDMI as an input. So you have a lot of options. You have uh, the, you know great price point for HDMI capture cards. So my personal favorite way to do it is to get it to HDMI. So um, in the back of the Amiga, I've, I'm taking the Amiga RGB output, and the Amiga RGB output is getting converted to something called SCART. Now SCART is actually a European standard connector. Um, and it's really, it's really, really awesome. It's an RGB connection, uh, super high quality, and it will, it will also take audio as well as video. So um, going from Amiga RGB to SCART has just been awesome. Uh, and the device I'm holding in my hand is called the OSSC, the Open Source Scan Converter. And it's basically, it's basically a line doubler. So um, whatever resolution you're feeding it, it's increasing the number of lines, uh, and it spits out an HDMI signal in, uh, in 1080p. And one of the cool things about this open source scan converter that's really important, especially if you are playing games, is there's, uh, there's no lag. It's a zero latency scaler. And that's super important when you're playing games because a little bit of lag and it makes the game uh, unplayable. And it also does a great, great job uh, with the upscale. Um, it looks beautiful. Uh, there's, of course, there's, like I said, there's many variables when it comes to streaming. So this is just one of many ways to do it. But, so, but not only does it have the SCART, but like I said, maybe your vintage computer, you can't get the SCART. It's also got uh, component video input. Um, it's also got VGA in, so if you want to do some streaming from like a, a vintage PC, plug in, in the VGA, that gives you a lot of options as well. Um, so I highly recommend the open source scan converter. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. Um, so then like I said, it's scaling it, it's uh, sending it to um, the HDMI, and then from the HDMI, I'm going to my capture card. This is called uh, a Magewell HDMI Plus. Uh, Magewell is the brand. Um, it's got an input. So it's got the open source scan converter going into it, and then it's got a pass-through. The pass-through goes to my monitor so I can see what I'm doing on the Amiga or any vintage computer. And then um, the input is a USB 3 connection that's going to my streaming computer. And that is the essence of how I get the computer in. Um, then uh, as far as audio goes, you, there's a few options. Uh, you can get a USB microphone or you can get an XLR microphone. USB microphones are getting better and there's getting to be more options, but if you go with the XLR route, XLR is a professional standard and um, it gives you so many options, so many great microphones, all the best microphones are XLR microphones. Um, so I've got an XLR microphone here and then the next question is, okay, how do you get an XLR microphone into your streaming computer? Well, at home I have a big mixer and it's an XLR mixer, it's got eight inputs and it converts it to USB. For this, for this portable um, exhibit, I have something here called the, the Shure um, X2N, and it's just very simple. It's got one XLR input, and it converts it to, to uh, USB. Uh, I think this is USB 2, and then I take the USB 2 and put it into the streaming computer. So this is a, it's a really nice way to do it when for you know, run and gun on the road, but there's nothing like using a mixer. Like I highly recommend using a mixer because when, you, when your profiles get more complicated and you have your, your audio, you have your Amiga's audio, your computer's audio, maybe you have a guest on the show, you get so many inputs, it's just a mixer makes it so much better. But for today's purposes, I just have uh, this little guy, which is, which is uh, one input. So we got the computer, we got the sound. Um, the next thing is the, the webcam. Now normally, <laughs> for this exhibit, I was gonna put a webcam here 
on my computer, forgot the webcam at home. Fortunately, I've got, I've got quite a large webcam here. <laughs> um, but it's pretty cool. You've got, when it comes to you know, getting video into your computer, you've got a lot of options. Um, like a, a $40 like Logitech C930 is a great camera. Um, this is a Canon um, C300 Mark II, which is a professional video camera. Um, the, the, the silver lining in the cloud here is I can show you another cool little device. Uh, but when it comes to like camera choice, uh, it's, lighting is always the most important thing, right? If you have a $40 camera with great lighting, it's going to beat a $1,000 camera with terrible lighting. So lighting is the most important. You know, don't let camera price get in the way of you wanting to stream. If you get um, like a $40 webcam with some good lighting, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look fantastic for you. Um, so this C300 uh, camera is running at 1080p, 60 frames per second. I'm taking an HDMI output, and I've got another video capture card here. This is the, uh, the, another Magewell. It's the USB capture HDMI. Then the only difference between that Magewell and this Magewell capture card is that this one doesn't have the pass-through. So you wouldn't want to use this to, to capture the output of your vintage computer because you really want the pass through so you can also see what you're doing on the monitor because in your streaming software, there's always going to be a delay. And like I said, for games, you can't, you can't have any delay. Even sometimes there's such a big delay, even like using the mouse to click on an icon is, uh, is challenging. So I got the C300 going into this, this Magewell capture device and it's a USB 3 input. I got it going into this hub along with my audio. Um, and then that brings me to the next big part. That is the actual computer that's doing the streaming. Uh, in this case, this is just a MacBook Pro. You know, you can use um, any computer that runs this piece of software called OBS. It's called the Open Broadcasting Software. And it's, it's really, really wonderful software. It's a free piece of software. Um, there's a lot of options. There's many different um, programs that allow you to do live streaming. But OBS is free. It's a great place to start. It's a very lightweight program, and it's very simple to use. Um, so once we're over here in, uh, in the OBS, um, I love to set up profiles. I guess one of my favorite things to do. I love like, the template of my stream. I'm a, I'm a visual guy. I like things to look good. Um, so I made a little template here. Um, you can load in different, different assets to the open broadcast um, software. So the first thing I did is I made a background. This is a Workbench 1.3 background that I made. Uh, I did some photography and brought it into Photoshop, and I, that's just kind of like my background. Um, over here, this is the open source scan converter going into the Majual HDMI Plus. So this is the actual Amiga over here. Um, and then here is the webcam. <laughs> that, I, I feel like that many times when I stream. I feel like that chicken, let me tell you. <laughs> um, but I got the camera aimed at this chicken, and, uh, and he, that's my, my webcam. Uh, and then I put a frame around it. This is a Photoshop image. This is my actual uh, 1084 monitor. And um, I just brought it into Photoshop, and I made it into a PNG. I put a transparent layer in the center. So I got this nice little frame around me. It, it's, uh, it makes it a little bit nicer visually. Um, if I was actually live right now, I would have the chat here. Um, talking to the chat is a big part of my streams. I'm really lucky I got some, like, so many amazing people that show up in my streams, and the interaction with the chat, it's like, um, it's like coming to a Vintage Computer Federation meeting where all your friends are here, and you can, you can have a great time and talk about stuff. So um, I would have the chat here. Um, and that is just, that's a very, very basic profile. Um, at home, in my studio, I have many more inputs. I've got I, I'm a camera guy. I got cameras all over the room, different angles. It's good. <laughs> and I get a little carried away with it, but it's, it's a lot of fun. But this is a very, very basic setup. Again, uh, you got your, your webcam slash face cam, and then whatever you're streaming uh, with, whichever computer you're streaming with, and then uh, you know, your background and your chat. Uh, again, there's an infinite number of ways you can do it, and uh, I, I, love, I love designing uh, profiles. Uh, it's really, really cool. Now let's say um, you're, you're a Commodore guy. You also love the Commodore 64. Streaming from the Commodore 64, uh, again, the concept is very similar. My goal with the Commodore 64 is to get it to HDMI because that opens up so many possibilities, like I said. Uh, and in this case, I'm not using the open source scan converter. I'm using something called a retro tink. And this little device is awesome, very similar to the open source scan converter. It's got zero latency. There's no lag. So when you're playing your games, uh, you can, um, you know, there's no, there's no lag. It makes it super, super easy. Um, so I've got a special cable that was made. It takes the, the video out from the Commodore 64. This is the Commodore 64C. And it splits out the audio. So I've got left and right audio. It also gives you composite video, which I'm not using right now. Um, and it also gives you S-video, YC, which is great. So I'm using the, the uh, S-video input on this retro tank. Uh, and then it outputs HDMI. And then I put the HDMI into the Magewell HDMI Plus, just like uh, I'm doing for the Amiga. So if you want, I can show you this. Um, I can, 
Uh, this is my Amiga setup here. If you want to switch over to Commodore 64 mode, uh, at home I would have a switch, but I can just show you. I'm just going to disconnect the HDMI cable from the open source scan converter. I'm going to plug it into the retro tink. There we go. And then this is cool. I'm going to come around. I have to come around to do this. I, I'm going to change my profile. I've got a different profile set up. So instead of having Workbench 1.3 back there, I got the Commodore 64 style going on. Click to my different profile, and there's the Commodore 64, uh, the retro output of the retro tank. Um, I got a nice little background that I shot off my 1702 monitor. And then I changed the monitor. Instead of it having an Amiga 1084 checkmark monitor, I got the, the uh, 1702 Commodore 64 monitor. And um, you know, that's, that's the basics of it. That's, that's how I do it. Um, there's di many different platforms you can stream to. You can stream to Twitch, which is primarily a gaming platform. It also um, focuses on games, but it focuses on live streaming. Of course, there's YouTube. YouTube is more of a pre-recorded video um, place, but it does a lot, there's a lot of great live streams on YouTube as well, like the one you're watching now. <laughs> um, and it's just been, that's, I mean, that's basically the, the, that's the basics of it. Um, there's so many, like I said, there's so many variables. Um, there's there's going to be variables depending on the computer that you want to stream, depending on the cameras that you want to use. Um, lots of different variables here, um, but it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, live streaming has just been, it's been great because there's this amazing community. Like if you go onto Twitch, there's this amazing retro community and I've made so many new friends doing the live streams. It's been, uh, it's been an awesome experience. And, um, and that's about it, man. That's the basics of the setup. I know uh, there's a way people can ask questions. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to ask. If you want me to go into more detail about anything, I'll be happy to. But that's just a, the brief general overview of how I do my streams uh, from the retro computers. And it's been, uh, it's been awesome. Hi. Um, so you know, I think we're going to ask if there are anything from the, from the discourse. Um, can you uh, just, I want to hear what's, if there, is there anything from the discourse uh, conversations? D discord? Excuse me, discord. <laughs> we know what you meant. Well, well I say discourse, discourse, I'm assuming people are arguing yeah, on it, right? There's good discourse in discord. Been, yeah. That's true, yeah. Um, so, yeah, but, you know, like, like I said, you ready for questions? Uh, yeah, we're ready for, um, hold on, I gotta, I gotta tell them we're ready for questions. Pretty good, man. 17 minutes. That's... Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, sounds great. Yep, we can hear you. Lower it. Down. Yeah. Uh, Corey? We can hear you. Yep, we can hear you. So, I guess we, uh, we're going to... Somebody said, what capture device do you use for your Mac after the OSSC? What do you sure. pipe it into before the Mac? He missed that part. Sure, no problem. Um, so out of the media goes to the open source scan converter. But the, the device I used that's doing the actual video capture, this is called a Magewell HDMI Plus. And um, it basically takes the HDMI input. Um, it's got a pass through. So it takes the HDMI out, and it puts it to my monitor so I can see what I'm doing. And then it's got a USB 3.0 output. And the USB 3.0 goes into the Mac. Or it can also go into a PC, you know, any computer that can take USB 3.0. Um, another nice feature of this card is that it's got, um, it's got a quarter inch plug for headphones. So you can plug your headphones directly into it if you want to monitor the audio. And you, if you want, you can also plug a microphone into it. But that's not how I do it. Like I said, I was showing you, it's got the, I've got the XLR microphone. But it's got a lot of options. It's a really nice card. It's the Magewell HDMI Plus. The other thing that's really important to know is um, a, lot of these a lot of these vintage computers, they, uh, they, they output strange resolutions. So um, there are some great companies like Blackmagic. They're a professional video company. Um, I love their cards a lot, but they're not necessarily the best cards for your vintage computer because they're expecting like a professional clean like 1920 by 1080 signal, where sometimes the resolutions coming out of these vintage computers uh, is, is quite different. And I found that the, uh, that the Magewells, uh, work really well with handling different resolutions. Um, other good companies uh, for, for capture cards are Avermedia makes some, some really nice ones. Elgato makes some really nice ones as well. Um, I just went with the Magewell because um, I know it worked well with the Amiga, and I like the, I like the flexibility of the USB 3.0. Um, at my studio at home, I've got a four-channel Magewell. Um, it's a PCI card that I plug into my streaming PC, and that's, uh, it's great. It's great to have it. At home, I use a PC to stream. But when I'm on the road, this, uh, this MacBook Pro works great. But yeah, it's a Magewell HDMI Plus. That's the name of the one that I'm using here. 
So actually, we're, before we see if there's any other questions mm -hmm. online, I actually have a question myself. Okay. So you mentioned that lighting is really the yes. most important thing, and yeah. I think that gets overlooked a lot. People want to go out and buy like, oh, I've got to have a DSLR so right. I can go do my streaming or whatever, and they don't realize, as you mentioned, you can do a $40 um, you know, camera. Can you explain a little more of kind of how they might want to arrange the light, or what should they do about lighting, you know, to, to make it look better for streaming. That's and, great. You know. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, I probably, in, in retrospect, I should have brought some lights with me to show you that part, but I was kind of just showing you the, the setup. Um, well, basically, if you're, the stream you're looking at now is probably the worst case scenario for lighting, because I'm standing in front of a bright window. <laughs> um, if, you, if, you, um, at, if you, let's say you're at home, you can start with, the idea is to have like nice soft light on yourself. Um, I generally don't like to aim like a hard light directly at a person because you get hard shadows. Um, so what I like to do is I like to use a lot of bounce light. You can get something very simple, like you can get little LED lights and I like, bounce them into the wall in front of you and that'll just give you like a nice soft glow. You want all the light to come from like the front. So as you're looking at your monitor, as you're looking at your chat, you have some nice soft light hitting you from the front and you want to minimize the light behind you because otherwise if there's a lot of light behind you, you'll have like a silhouette look. And yeah, like Corey, like you said, it, the lighting is the most important part when it comes to the camera. Um, like I said, like a $40 webcam with great lighting can beat a $1,000 camera with terrible lighting. Um, if you're completely backlit with a $1,000 camera and shadowed, it's not going to look good. If you're well lit and front lit and have some nice soft light on you with the webcam, uh, it's going to look fantastic. For, for me personally, I use, um, I have these, they're one by one light panels, well, one foot by one foot. And I take one and I literally like bounce it into the wall in front of me. My wall happens to be like a beige color, so it gives it some nice warm light on my face. It's a very, rude, it's a very crude way to do it, but it works and it looks really good. And then I have another one uh, aimed at me that kind of gives me a little bit of an edge light. Um, but I get a little bit fancy with the lighting on my streams. But as long as you have nice soft light on your face, um, you'll be good to go with your webcam. Thanks very much. I think that was it. That to me, honestly, because I'm always curious about that, how you can, you know, watch someone with a camera and. You know, you see them writing on something in a Sharpie, you can see the Sharpie, but you can't read the print on the page. Because exactly. the lights are just all wrong and you think they're like writing on a blank page. Um, so I'm going to ask again, uh, is there any other questions coming from uh, the internet? I think some questions incoming. I hear, I hear I some discussion. I, Everyone should know that we're actually in a completely different room than the guys who are actually doing um, the show, and you know, instead of in Jeff and those guys. So we kind of got a, uh, a very crude way to are talk. You, guys ready or you need more questions. I'll take into more questions. I'm on the Discord channel now. Um, okay, so you can read the questions. That might uh, be let's say, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I, I say, um, uh, okay, so there's people talking about stuff. Um, oh, okay, uh, Big, what's up, Big Ed? Uh, Big Ed is asking, uh, is there live coding in the retro community on Twitch as well as gaming? Yes, Big Ed, absolutely. Um, if you go onto Twitch, Twitch is broken down into different categories uh, or different directories, as they call it. So let's say you're playing like uh, Destiny 2. You can be in like the Destiny 2 category, but there's one um, there's one called retro, and that's the, that's the section that I stream in, and that's anything retro. It can be retro gaming, it can be retro coding, um, and there's, a, there's a, great, a great person who streams Commodore 64 stuff, his name is Shallon50k. He does live coding. There's great demo sceners who also do uh, live coding in the retro directory. Um, uh, one of my favorites is a guy named Ferris, Ferris Stream Stuff. Uh, he's a genius. He's uh, with uh, a group called Logicoma. He does live coding as well. Uh, but if you go to uh, twitch.tv and you look at the retro category, uh, you can, that's where you can find uh, most of us doing Commodore stuff, Atari stuff, uh, vintage PC stuff. There's a lot of uh, Nintendo stuff going on there too. So it's uh, Twitch. Go to twitch.tv and you can go to the retro category. Um, let's see. I'm going to... I'm, I'm just, I don't see exact questions. Uh, what's... The fridge, the fridge is clearly for your beer. I mean, they, they, knew, they know me here, so they put me next to the beer fridge. <laughs> actually, I'll take responsibility for that one. Um, we, actually, I don't, we actually had something covering the fridge, so you guys wouldn't see that we, we are human beings and need to eat. Uh, and we borrowed it and forgot to put it back. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that's mine. I'll take the hit for that. You can actually see that we, we actually have a stand which did have a black on it. And we probably should have blacked out your the poor lighting of the open window. But, you know, once again, it's all about the vintage stuff and 
The technical stuff, that's my bad. Oh, you know what they're saying? I think what happens, I think on my, my microphone's in the left channel, so they're saying the left channel sounds great, the right channel doesn't. That's because my, I'm in the left channel, and I think you had, you had your mic in the right channel, and it was turned off. That's why, yeah. Yeah, I go back and forth. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a really important thing, too, when you're streaming, uh, knowing your different channels. You know, using a real mixer is, is huge. It allows you to control all of that. Um, the guys here at the Federation are doing an amazing job today, it's, but it's their first time ever doing like a live stream from VCF East, so uh, th that's the other thing with streaming, right? Streaming is, uh, it's very, there's a little bit of black magic that happens with streaming. You can be completely buttoned up and ready to go, and uh, you t everything can be technically perfect on your end, and then something will go wrong that's out of your control. So like knowing how to deal with issues on stream is a big part of streaming as well. Do you recommend a headset? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so the, Hold uh, on, we should repeat that one. So, repeat it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the question is, do you recommend a headset, uh, headphones? And I absolutely 100% recommend headphones. That's a great point. Uh, the reason being is because when you ha have a live microphone, if you have uh, speakers in the room that are on, you're going to get feedback. So having um, headphones on your head will eliminate the feedback. So the room is quiet. Um, but you can hear the game and you can hear um, anything else that you'll be playing. I also, um, when I do my streams uh, at home, I, hear, uh, I have my microphone going into my headphones to make sure that I'm not over-modulating or anything. So I'm monitoring myself, which is tricky and takes some practice, as well as uh, what I'm doing on the Amiga. And I usually, when I'm like reading something, or if I'm reading some Amiga news or something, I usually have music coming out of the Amiga. And then, of course, when I play the games, I have the game sounds coming out of the Amiga. So yeah, headphones, that's a great point. Headphones are really, really important. You don't want to get the feedback or echo. And with any vintage computing, um, I think you also keep the fire extinguisher handy. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I've seen if, I've seen one or two streams where the guys don't realize and there's a little bit of smoke coming up in the background because you want it you want to catch that early so you don't you know keep it family friendly with the language. Um, are there any more questions on uh, the Discord oh, channel? Yeah. So Jerry Jerry said why do you use headphones on the broadcast instead of PC speakers? That's exactly what that's the reference. So exactly, yeah. so actually uh, we should that's actually why we're completely disconnected with the other room. Uh, we want, in order to avoid the feedback of our microphones and other things, there's kind of a disconnection with the other room on purpose. And, um, and we're not wearing headphones in here. Um, so that's the exact same thing. You always have to be careful. Yep. Yep. I'm looking at the, at the questions here in the Discord. Um, does see the, fr the fridge would make a great bounce guard because it's white. <laughs> Lots of people type in. Cool. Um, uh, just, you know, another, another, here's another piece of equipment that I didn't show you that's pretty cool. Um, I also do live streaming from my video toaster. The New Tech Video Toaster is a live video switcher for the Amiga. And um, when, I, when I take some of, the, some of the cameras that I connect to it, um, I need to convert to some of the vintage computers I use with the vintage cameras I use with the toaster. You know, they have uh, composite video output. Uh, but if I want to go directly, if I want to, you know, from the toaster to, to my Amiga, I mean to the streaming computer, uh, this is a little box here. This will convert uh, composite video to HDMI. Uh, so that's, uh, this is a cool little device. This is uh, a very inexpensive device. It's a, it's a Ghana. It's something I picked up on Amazon. Uh, the downside to this device is that it makes everything 16 by 9 aspect ratio. So when you, you, know, when you bring in like a 4 to 3 vintage computer signal, it's going to stretch it to 16 by 9. But you can just correct for that in your streaming software and just get it back to the 4 to 3 aspect ratio. But this has been a really handy little one, especially uh, when I take the output of my video toaster and I want to stream the output of the toaster, or if I want to take one of the, the vintage cameras that I connect to the toaster and put it directly into my streaming computer. Um, I have something, I've got a VHS camera that I use as my webcam. I call it VHS cam. And this is how I get VHS cam into, into my uh, streaming computer. It's got a composite video out and then it converts it to HDMI and I correct the aspect ratio in, in the OBS. Okay, is there any other questions? If not, um, Bill can... Lang, Bill Lang, I'm expecting, we got to do a stream together, Bill Lang. I got a lot of people are asking about Atari 8 bit streams on my channel too, so we all know that Atari 8 bit, um, Jay Miner, Joe DeCure, father of the father of Amiga, also father of Atari VCS, so uh, we got to do that, Bill. <laughs> Yeah, we should set up something like that for, uh, for you know, we'll have a vir another virtual something in the middle That'd to be get cool. everyone together. That would be great, especially yeah. if we can do it from the studios yeah. so that, uh, you know, uh, us semi-amateurs like me who keeps uh, walking in front of the camera yeah. and you know, bouncing chickens yeah. in front of the lenses. The, um, <laughs> so they're talking about the channel swap. With my, so what's happening, guys, here is um, the output of Corey's camera, Corey's shooting this, it's got a stereo output, right? So it's got left channel, right channel. So I'm in, I guess, the left channel, he's in the right channel. Now 
what you can do in OBS in the other room is you can set that input to mono, and if, when you set it to mono, you wouldn't have that left and right um, that stark separation between the left and right channel. Um, so yeah, so we learned. <laughs> but I don't separate. It's so funny because Amiga is also the Paul chip. It's got hard left and hard right channels. Some people are like, oh, I love it when it's like everything's, you know, I love it that way. Or you should play it in mono because I prefer the song to be in mono. So it's, it's an interesting one. Yeah, we were doing some of the mixing on the camera, and I guess it messed them up a little bit, and oh, gotcha. I was trying to play around with it. Gotcha. So it's, once again, this is the live streaming kind of it, stuff, right? It, yeah. Where, you know, you, you, you never know till you get there, and it seemed fine before, and now it's not, and so we have to adjust some stuff. And, you know, but, it's great to get like, feedback from, from people, too, like on the stream, because it's when you're doing it all by yourself, it's really hard to, like, do all this stuff and monitor yourself at the same time. Like, are my levels okay? Does the stream look okay? It's when you're, when you're doing, like, all by yourself with the one person band, it's really hard. So it's always nice when someone, if someone chimes in, it's like, oh man, it's, um, you know, the, the, your stereo separation uh, isn't right, then I'll, I'll be able to fix it. So you Yeah, know, and like instead of finding out later. Right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, it's like, yeah. it's like shooting a wedding and then finding out later that uh, you know you had your you know the audio down or too high up. Yeah. Not much you can do about it then. But in a stream, you, as long as you're on your feet, you can you can adjust. Yeah. Um, yeah I think we have time for one more sure. question, uh, and then we really have to turn it over to these guys. Sure. So um, take the question. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ten mark. I think uh, I think the retro thing uh, was up to you. It's, it's great. I love the retro thing for the. It works for the uh, the Commodore. It works great for the Atari. You just need a different cable because the pinout on the actual like Atari like 800 XL. Uh, there's fewer pins than like this Commodore 64C. Uh, but there's a company uh, there in the United Kingdom. I don't have the name handy, but they make these great cables um, that convert it to S video, and uh, it works great. I haven't had a, a ton of experience with the RetroThink yet, um, but it's so far it's been it's been really good, and the quality is great. Um, obviously, when you can see the difference between the S video quality and like the RGB output, <laughs> you get spoiled with the RGB output because the RGB is beautiful. But the uh, the retro thing does a great job, a really really great job. Um, yes, and I am rocking the Vicky Pixel Vixen Amiga 500 T-shirt, which is gorgeous. <laughs> um, well, th thank you very much for for everything. Um, we're we're just about out of time. Um, yeah. I do want to you know introduce the fact. Oh, thank you, really. Oh, yeah. I, I learned a lot, and I really want to you know do these kind of streamings and just have to learn so much. There's so many uh, variables. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so right now, uh, I think we're going to talk about the uh, the PDP8. Uh, I and peripherals and the CalComp plotter. Uh, Dave Gesswine will be uh, presenting that. And, um, you know, thank you very much for, for really showing us some cool stuff. And really, th that Amiga is amazing. I just got to tell you, that that is just the coolest. Hi, I'm David Gesswine. I showed operation of the original PDP-8 model for VCF West, uh, running the uh, basic paper tape system. Uh, I'm going to show you a nicely configured 8i with uh, several peripherals for this uh, video. Uh, this configuration is much nicer to use. Uh, it can assemble a previous demo in 9 seconds and this demo in 30 seconds. Uh, the 8i is the first PDP-8 using integrated circuits. Uh, this 8i has 8K of memory, the extended arithmetic element multiply divide option. The high speed uh, paper tape punch and reader, and a plotter uh, interface. Uh, the plotter you can't currently see. The PDP 8i was introduced in 1968. Uh, attached to the PDP 8 is a DF3232 K word uh, disk drive, which I'm actually going to use this time, and a X08 laboratory peripheral. And I'm using a VT52 uh, terminal instead of the teletype. Uh, the VT52 is uh, from 1975. The DF32 is a fixed head disk with five four pole heads, giving it 20 tracks, with 16 used for data. As the heads land on the disk surface, deck recommended not powering off the drive. I have had it working, but it was not terribly reliable. I'm using a board that emulates uh, four DS32 expander disks and stores the data in battery backed SRAM on a board I made. Uh, that gives me 128K words of storage. Uh, the drive is not divided into sectors and can read and write down to a single word. The x 8 is a multi channel uh, ADD converter. There are four inputs on the front, and I'm using one of them. 
It also has digital inputs and outputs, uh, crystal clock, RC clock, which I'm using as a sample clock, and a point plot uh, display generator, which I'm using to drive this RM503 oscilloscope. What I'm going to demonstrate is capturing a signal with the AX08 and displaying it on the point plot, uh, doing an FFT and displaying the spectrum, then plotting the signal and spectrum on the plotter. PDPAs were frequently used in laboratories and industrial control where they would be doing similar things. Uh, the FFT I'm using is DECAS 8143 uh, from 1968. Uh, DECAS was a digital equipment users uh, group which people could submit uh, programs to uh, that DECAS would distribute for a nominal cost. The write-up has an undated change to improve the rounding and one from 1973 submitted by a person at a Turkish University Electrical Engineering Department uh, that corrected a error in data scaling that could cause overflow and incorrect results. Uh, my plotter is a Calcom 563, which we'll see later, uh, probably made in 1973. Uh, this manual was from 1969, so the model dates back at least that far. All the smarts for the plotter are the software running on the PDP-8. Uh, the instructions are just generating X, Y, or both step pulses, which the uh, plotter uses to drive the stepper motors. Each step is 0 0.005 inches, and you can plot it up to about 1.5 inches per second. Uh, later pen plotters were intelligent and much faster with the HP model I checked, capable of doing 32 inches per second. Uh, pen plotters have been superseded by uh, inkjet plotters. When you're plotting data, uh, grid paper like this was available that uh, allowed you to then uh, accurately measure the uh, points on your plots. And here's some of the accessories where you have these optical sights that you'd use to align to the grid. And there was also an adjustment wheel on the plotter uh, you would use to match its motions to the exact uh, grid on the paper, since paper uh, size changes slightly. There were a number of options. Uh, this is a pressurized ink uh, ballpoint. Uh, it's basically a smaller version of the Fisher Space Pen that, that was available in a number of colors. They had normal ballpoints. And we had the liquid ink pen with the liquid ink. and felt tip pen. And the various uh, pen bodies that they would go into. I'm now going to start the uh, PDP-8i. Uh, I'm running disk monitor system. I'm just going to uh, restart the operating system that's still in the non-volatile core memory. Starting address is 7600, load address, and start it running. I'm now going to uh, load my program. Uh, I'm going to load it in multiple parts. The first part is the FFT routine itself, then a patch file for it, and then my uh, program. Now tell it the starting address of my program, which is 200. And tell it to start executing. Control P. Now you can see on the oscilloscope, uh, the sine wave that I'm putting in from this function generator. Each data sample is one of the dots drawn by the point plot. Now if we crank the frequency up, it's a little harder to tell it's a sine wave. We'll freeze that. And then take the FFT. And you can see here 
the primary frequency of the sine wave. And the rest of it is uh, no significant energy. Started capturing again. And we'll crank up the amplitude. So now it's uh, significantly clipped. Freeze it. FFT. And now you can see the primary frequency and the harmonics that have come up from the clipping. And it tells me that I'm sampling at uh, almost uh, 20 kilohertz. do a follow-up presentation. He had done the, the PDP-8 demo, and now we did the PDP-8 slash I, uh, this time with peripherals. Um, so it's great that he could do a follow-up to that video. So we're going to move on to questions and answers. Um, Chris, do we have any questions for, for David? All right. Um, David, do you have any, uh, any extra comments um, based on what you were talking about? Anything else you wanted to add to uh, your demo there? Oh, I could. Yeah, while I was filming the video, of course, the computer decided to act up, which was you know, this uh, A604 board in the uh, AX08 peripheral. Yeah. It looks very similar to some of the cars that are in the Univac 1219B in the boroughs. So the, all the peripherals on this are, you know, the discrete uh, transistor-based uh, logic. The 8i itself is the uh, IC-based. And back then, they hadn't even standardized chip colors. You had some nice blue ones. But, uh, you know, the failure was one of the transistors. It shorted. and took out the, uh, you know, the push-pull pair. The other one was wounded. So after I replaced the one transistor, it sort of worked, but the waveform output was still distorted. And I figured out that I needed to replace the other one. But that's the one uh, problem of trying to use old computers is. Yeah, yep. hey David, somebody uh, commented, it's basically a giant microcontroller. And then they ask how fast can go with the sign S Y N E, or maybe they meant to say sync. Uh, yeah, the, how fast can it go with the sync? Yeah, if I'm sampling at uh, 20 kilohertz, you know, Nyquist would limit you to sampling a 10 color sine wave, is the, the highest you could uh, sample accurately without it aliasing. Okay, does the 8i have lamps or LEDs? Those were uh, lamps. Because that was from what year, roughly? Uh, I think, uh, what was it, 68? Uh, oh, yeah, LEDs uh, would have barely been LED lighting up. Uh, but it was introduced, I think, in 68. Yeah, sorry, the, the question earlier was, the, he corrected, it was sine wave sine. It meant to say, how fast can it go with the sine? So I had the, you know, it sampled with code, you know, it doesn't, you know, directly do any sort of DMA type things into memories. So with the code I wrote, um, it's about 20 kilohertz is as fast as it will run before it, it will start dropping samples. Uh, with little, you probably could restructure the code a little bit. Uh, I have it actually doing uh, one of those knobs on the front I read to use as the threshold for a trigger. But that extra logic to do that then slows down how fast I can sample. If I just just did sampling, it can uh, get somewhat faster. 
What operating system is the PDP-8 running? Well, I was running was Disk Monitor System, which is a very simple operating system uh, that would run off those uh, DF32 or RF08, which was a bigger version of the DF32 or deck tape. Uh, the most popular operating system for the PDP-8 was OS8. Uh, that requires uh, 8K of memory. Uh, I wanted this demo to also be able to work on the uh, straight eight, uh, which only had 4K and disk monitor system will run in uh, on a 4K machine. Uh, what language are the apps written in? I wrote that in the PDP-8 assembly language. There was a Fortran 2 and a Fortran 4 compiler available for it. Uh, somewhat of a subset of Fortran, but it's reasonably usable. I, uh, on the bigger machine, I used that because there was a nice uh, library for driving plotter that came with it uh, that would you know, do text and axes and stuff like that. Um, there's uh, Focal, which is sort of a basic-like language with entirely different sy syntax, but serving the same purpose that DEC created. Uh, it did have a basic available for it. Uh, there was uh, a, a Lisp, um, and a Snowball. There were a couple other oddball languages that were available. And it had uh, what Dieball, which is sort of a COBOL-like language for business use. So there, there are quite a few operating uh, languages available. Are you emulating any of the subsystems in the 8i? The only thing I was emulating is uh, the D DS32 expanders due to the uh, issue with uh, the actual using the actual platter on that drive. So yes, I did have the board with solid state uh, memory instead of using the real platter on the drive. And it actually, the, the one DF32, which was a master, could have three slave DS32s to expand the capacity. My board is really pretending there are four slave DS32s. So I'm not actually using the uh, disk in the master, but it's using most of the electronics except the low level uh, stuff that directly interface to the platters. The rest of it is real. We have a big thank you. It's lovely to see a real PDP-8i running. I can uh, echo that. And I guess the other cheat I did is you know, the, the clock board for the serial port they only supported 110 baud for a teletype, but it's just a simple RC oscillator. So I changed the capacitor on it. So I'm actually running at 4,800 baud. And how much power does it require? Um, the whole setup runs fine off of a 15 amp outlet. Uh, it does not share with too many other things at VCF when I've had this there. We've had the uh, good old, uh, we need to rearrange who's plugged into what outlet. There's oh, yeah. Too many things on the same circuit. Yes, yes. Very interesting and fun times. Okay. Uh, double checking. I think that's all we have right now. Anything else you'd like to run by us before we go to the next one? Um, not that I can think of right now. All right. Well, thank you, David. That was uh, wonderful to see you do that. And uh, as you can see, the you know, because of the virtual show, we could do a lot more with people that have their stuff at their home already set up and working and looking pretty, too, because, you know, you fix up those things over the years and and you often find it difficult or impossible to move a lot of stuff so it's great that we you could show off the stuff that's in your house there um so this is a perfect opportunity to show off all your your great little toys there for everyone to see um and maybe uh we can see the next vcf east um or maybe a small subset of it but uh i was i was thank you for uh showing that off um we like to have like the older computers, uh, the 60s, you know, we have a lot of micros, but, you know, we like to see some of that stuff. And um, 
I, I enjoy running the, the museum's PDP eights, learning how to key in stuff. And because of the first, when I first saw it, I was I grew up in the micro era, and you know, early '80s, seeing something like that is like I don't know how to do it. So I was glad to learn how to program that and to run programs on that. So thank you for your video. David, and, just, I should comment that in the last 30 seconds, there have been a flurry of thank you, very nice, good demo, and 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 things like that. So I uh, just uh, I want you to know, and we definitely agree with him, with that sentiment. All right, David, I don't know if you're on the Discord channel, but if you are, then there's a channel there for you to answer any further questions for people. Um, but otherwise, um, how would people get in touch with you if they've had any questions about your your equipment and and your in what your your video was about? Yeah, my website's uh, www.pdponline.com, and you know my email is djg at pdponline.com. All right, thank you, David. That was and wonderful. The uh, cat's name is Pi. Pi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love the cat. I love the cat. That was one of the things I noticed. All right. Well, thank you, David. Um, hope to see you again soon. I know you're going to be helping us out with um, uh, various things here. Um, maybe in January you'll have to be able to come back. Uh, so I will see you around, and thank you for the video. You're welcome. All right, so the next video up we have is Jason Perkins, and he's going to be showing off uh, some of his printers. Um, I believe there are inkjet and bubble jet type printers. Um, it's really interesting. He's going to, you know, you'll see what, what, what it's all about. So I don't want to spoil anything. So uh, without further ado, we're going to show Jason Perkins and his vintage, vintage printers. Hi, I'm Jason Perkins from Springfield, Virginia. I'd like to welcome you to my VCF East 2020 virtual exhibit on printing. I'm going to show some various types of printers. This is a Canon BJ-130E. It was Canon's first bubble jet printer. This machine was introduced in 1988 and was Canon's second generation inkjet technology. To see inside we have to disassemble the printer so we'll do that now. The print head is automatically capped and cleaned by the machine. An engineer at Canon accidentally touched a soldering iron to a syringe of ink and noticed that it spurted. Inside the print head are small tubes and small heating elements which boil the ink and push drops onto the paper. Ink is fed to the print head by the tube. and drawn by capillary action up from the print cartridge. Waste ink returns through the tube at the top of the assembly. Like the earlier piezo devices, the ink cartridge lives at the front of the machine along with the waste ink absorber pad. This is a Panasonic side writer LED printer. Similar to a laser printer, it uses toner and has to warm up before you can print. This printer uses the PostScript language and runs at 300 dots per inch. It has two megabytes of RAM, what we're Seeing now in sped up motion is the printer processing the job. That's called the raster image processor.
It's quiet and the output looks quite nice. In this print we see a kind of common malady of some printers where it will suck the entire paper tray through the machine, but it didn't jam. The built-in font also looks nice. Let's see how the device works. Toner is loaded in from this cartridge on the paper side. On the other side of the device is the imaging drum, which we'll remove, and then we can see the LED element. Each dot on this strip is an individual LED that will expose one pixel on the imaging drum. This is a Cato 8510, here branded as the Apple dot matrix printer. I like to call these machines old reliable. Uh, I don't think you can actually kill one. This is a 9-pin dot matrix printer. Like all dot matrix printers, it uses a nylon ribbon, which is impregnated with ink. It gets pulled through the cartridge as uh, the head moves. You can see the little spring-loaded drive there. Let's take the print head off. If you look at the end of the print head, that kind of shiny diagonal line are the pins, and inside you can see each of the individual wires. Those go back to a magnet that fires the pin. This is an Apple Daisy Wheel printer. It was manufactured for Apple by Q. This is sometimes called a formed character printer. Inside the machine is the typing element, and on the element are all of the individual letters. These get struck by a hammer to be imprinted on the paper. Let's install the cut sheet feeder on this printer. It's only slightly ridiculous. Can't forget the paper out tray. Okay, now we're ready to print. Daisy wheel printers offered vastly superior print quality to a dot matrix printer using the same type of element as many typewriters. Here's a 240 frame per second video 
of a similar machine printing. Notice how the movements are not stepped. This machine uses servo control to run as fast as possible, 30 characters per second. Here's printing a full page of text. NEC put a slightly different spin on this technology with their SpinWriter series. This is a SpinWriter 7720 printing terminal. Like the other printers, there's a ribbon in a cartridge that gets pulled through by the machine. There is a hammer to strike the printing element. And the printing element itself is referred to as a thimble. Like the daisy wheel, all of the characters are preformed, and there are two, uh, two levels of them. The machine can shift the wheel up and down. The buzzing sound is the servo control on the machine fighting me as I shove the pieces in. This machine is really fast. Let's look at a 240 frame per second video of it printing. Since this is a terminal, let's connect to YRC. I had some problems with the ribbon jamming on this, which quickly becomes a problem. If the machine is fast enough, it'll just burn through the ribbon if it gets stuck. Notice that the machine moves the print thimble and ribbon out of the way when it's done printing so you can see the paper more easily. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoy the rest. BCF East 2020.
All right. Welcome back, everyone. That was Jason Perkins and Printers. That was pretty awesome. Um, I loved how you did the super slow mo with the different um, uh, impact printers. So we're going to have some questions and answers for Jason. Um, we're going to we're going to see on the Discord channel and the microphone. Uh, send us your questions. Uh, but Jason, you want to add anything to what you did, did there, like how you did it and, and how you collected it? Um. Well, I guess I say about collecting it that uh, I was actually talking with Ian Primus the other day. Uh, we were bemoaning someone on eBay wanting a lot of money for an old broken printer. And he's like, I think 75% of the people who would actually be interested in that machine are in this conversation. <laughs> so, um, Do you find that there's a lot of people interested in printers like as a, as a sub, um, subgroup of vintage computer collectors? I, I don't. Um, it seems like a lot of printers, you know, for the longest time, think about at uh, VCF Midwest, the free pile, you can put anything in there except printers. Um, for, for a long time, it's like the, the, I think the printers kind of were the castaway devices. They weren't, they weren't uh, considered worth saving. And I always find them interesting, just the, uh, you know, the mechanical nature of them. Generally, you'll get them there not working at all. You can go through it and get it working as good as new. So, so how does the, 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 these type of printers relate to your interest in typewriters? Because I know you have some, what is it, Sylvania printers? What is the kind of printer? Uh, the the Selectric. Yeah, Selectric. Yeah. yeah. So, so how does that relate to the, these printers, the, the typewriter, your interest in, in uh, vintage typewriters? I don't know. It's just kind of interesting. The, 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 a lot of the printers that I've collected, uh, relate back to the Appalisa. Like I have, I have every printer supported by the Appalisa. There are four. <laughs> uh, and one of them I actually saw it mentioned was the Canon PJ 1080A. Uh, that is not an impact printer. It is a piezo inkjet. Um, and I, if you look on my YouTube channel, I actually have a video detailing that, that printer. Um, it's it's kind of interesting. It only has four nozzles. Uh, then it goes and prints like one line at a time, so it takes about ten minutes to print a full page. Wow, <laughs> ah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty slow. Yeah, but uh, it was uh, that was Canon's first color inkjet, very wow. early tech. Wow, very nice. Mm -hmm. So it, you done a, you, was it you or someone else who done an exhibit years ago with the, the printers? I think was that Mouse who did that? Did like the whole exhibit with printers? It could have been. I, yeah. I don't recall. So, Chris, any questions we have so far? I think that uh, you must have done such a good job that everybody's just, yay, good, ex good exhibit, yeah. but uh, no questions about it. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, this is uh, Bill. I don't know if you can so, see me. Hi, okay. Bill. Hi. Oh. Hi. Excuse me. I, I just wanted to know, I know with the daisy wheels, it's very hard to restore them. I just wanted you to maybe... Um, review the the common faults with a daisy wheel printer and if somebody comes upon one today what steps should they take or where where would they get resources for how to restore them I, I see them from time to time and I've kind of gotten to the point where I just reject them because I don't feel like re going through the process of restoring them but maybe there's um, maybe some tips you could share sure so I guess the first thing is as soon as you get it the thing hasn't been run in probably you know 10 20 years you need to go through and clean it and a lot of these old devices, um, they have a lot of moving parts in them, a lot of bearings. Uh, you got to go through just clean and oil everything, a go general mechanical refresh. Uh, the other problem you'll find, and this is really common to that, uh, that Apple Daisy Wheel printer, uh, the drive belt, like so many other rubber belts, that the thing that moves the head back and forth, the belt will turn to goo. And... Um, I uh, had started down the path of trying to source a new belt for that, but unfortunately, I think it's uh, standard spacing on the on the belt teeth, and I was only able to find metric belts. Um, so the the reason that machine works is I actually found a new a different new old stock Cume printer, parted it out, and fixed the Apple Daisy wheel. So I think I, I'm comfortable in saying that's maybe the only Apple Daisy wheel that's running in the world. At this point, 
is certainly not a very small minority because they all broke. Yeah, that, that was my thought as well. They're not. They're not. What you've yeah. done is uh, to get them running like that. Um, I certainly am interested in printers yeah. too, but those uh, daisy wheels are tough. The the other problem that daisy wheels have is the typing element is plastic, and as we all know, plastic gets brittle over time. So, like one of the print wheels I have for that Apple Daisy wheel. I was printing away with it. And then suddenly I noticed that squares were printing instead of letters. And then it was more squares. And I looked in the printer and the, and the pins were breaking off as it was printing and the wheel was self-destructing. Um, so that's certainly a concern with, uh, with any of the regular Cume or Diablo printers, the wheels are very readily available. So you can find th those continue to be made for a long time. But for some of the less common printers, that's a real issue. Um, I was going to try and work with Alex, Alex Jaycox actually, and try and 3D print some new print wheels. Make a make a um, a Comic Sans print wheel for the uh, Apple Daisy wheel. See if we could do that. Couple questions. Hmm. How did the Lisa work with a Daisy wheel? Uh, so if you go on my YouTube channel, you can look up uh, a video I made of the Apple Daisy wheel, and that. Cume printer was a very it was a very high end printer. It was like three thousand dollars when it was new, and it can position the head very accurately back and forth, roll the paper back and forth. It will act on the print wheel. There is a metal pin, and it'll use it like a one pin dot matrix printer, and just move the head back and forth, move the paper around, and it can print graphics from the Lisa with the Daisy Wheel printer. Wow. That's actually really amazing. Yeah, it, actually, I could drop a link to that in the Discord. Um, while you're doing that, someone said they are most impressed by the LED printer and want to know what year those were in production. So that particular LED printer is from the, the early 90s. I believe that technology started being used maybe very late 80s, early 90s, and I think it, it's still in use today. Some color laser printers are actually LED printers. Okay. Tony Bogan, who we know, our de facto point person here, we joke about, he asks, have you had problems still finding ribbons for some of your printers? And do you have any tips on where to look? And it's a so, question I have as well. So ribbons can be a real nuisance. Uh, <laughs> Tell me because you can go online and find oh here i've got this these new old stock ribbons they're still in the bag and they're dried out so what i have found is that on and on a dot matrix printer the ink that is in the ribbon is oil based and lubricates the pins as the printer is going so you have to use a, an oil based ink and a lot of times stamp pad ink will be oil-based. So on the machines you saw in my video, I've re-inked those ribbons using stamp, uh, liquid stamp pad ink. Uh, that is a tedious process. Uh, what I end up doing is uh, I, I stretch the whole ribbon out uh, like across the yard on a, on a warm day. And then wearing gloves, you dot the ink all along the ribbon and then run it through on your hands to get oh, it wow. evenly spread, put it all back in the cartridge, let it sit for several days, and then it'll even out. On the, uh, on the spin writer, I did that and it like made the ribbon swell a little bit so it wouldn't actually move through the cartridge anymore. So I had to cut about, I don't know, 10 feet out of the ribbon and then um, I heated up a piece of metal and, jo and, and joined the, the ribbon back together because it's nylon so you can just melt it back together and then dilute and then I sprayed it with a little bit of WD-40 to thin the ink out. Um, I've read online where you can reactivate. Somebody, somebody says that's dedication. Go ahead. Yeah well I guess it's it's a it's it's a thing of having or using more free time than sense. <laughs> um, now, I, I just want to 
talk about a personal experience I had. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine had an original Macintosh, and he had a little device that he would put the ribbon into with with a little ink reservoir, and it would wind. You didn't have to pull yep. the ribbon out. I haven't seen anything like that since then. So that's called the Mac Inker, and it has a little like uh, one RPM clockwork motor in the bottom of it that just drives the ribbon around. Yes. And then it has a tube with a few little holes in it that as the ribbon goes past, it would absorb it into the ribbon. Um, when I'm working on ribbons, a lot of time I'll just use a cordless drill and with a, with a screwdriver end to, to spin the ribbon around. Okay. But you have to be careful with that because the drill can go really, really fast. And the ribbon is not designed to go really, really fast. And you can actually like burn out the, the little <laughs> rollers oh, in there going too fast. So Jason, if you have any interest in another PJ1080A, it could use a new home and some love. I think somebody has one that they're offering. Oh, Just cool. wanted to mention that. Somebody asked, what's the name of your YouTube channel? Uh, so I pasted it in there. It is uh, Comp285 is my YouTube channel name. Here, I'll, I'll post a link to that. Just my channel in there. I'll just say it one more time for the people watching the video. It's very original. Compu85. Okay. And if, yeah, if you look in there, there's a lot of various different things in there. You mentioned 3D printing uh, a daisy wheel, I think. I think somebody mm -hmm. asked a little bit more about that. So this is, I'm like very much in the beginning stages of that. Uh, the so a usual daisy wheel is 96 characters and apple wanted to lisa to be kind of an international machine and so they didn't want people to have to be changing the wheels out if they were printing in german or printing in french or whatever so they they went from a 96 character print wheel and they had q modify their printer to accept a 130 character print wheel so those Apple Daisy wheels are unique. You can't, you can't get them. Uh, but uh, there's, a, uh, there's a really good video on YouTube that I will paste in where Xerox Diablo goes over how they, um, how they made their print wheels. Uh, so my thought is we've you know, now that we have home 3D printing, we can see how they did it with the way they lay out the, the characters and everything. I was able to measure a uh an existing good wheel and make a make notes of where all the characters are as, as, on the wheel and so i'm hoping knock on rock that we can just uh just try and pre 3d print one i don't know if it's going to work i don't know how well it's going to hold up but i am very interested to see what comes of it All right. Well, thank you, Jason, for that great video and answering some questions about that. Um, really appreciate that. It's yeah. a good video. And glad that you're helping us out in a lot of other ways, too, here. Thanks. You're going to see Jason uh, tomorrow. Demo or Xerox Star. And the uh, Apple Lisa. Uh, so that would be great. Um, so. Uh, the next video up is Will Lindsay. He's going to go talk about the chip. And afterwards, we'll have questions and answers. So as you're watching it, you have your questions and answers ready to go. All right. You ready, so Andy? This talk is about All right, how a virtual machine from 1978 wound up in a university game design program in 2020. And... I want to talk about what led to my unusual mixture of vintage technology and contemporary teaching practices. And for this audience who knows the history so well, I want to string together some loose and interesting moments and relationships and explain why this technology is still so important. My research here builds on a history that you may be part of. And if so, I'd love to hear more about it. There's always more to learn. Let me start by talking a little bit about who I am and how I arrived at this moment. My name is Will Lindsay. Currently, I'm the program director at the Game and Interactive Media Design Program at nearby Ryder University. It's a brand new program. It's been running for about a year, but I've been teaching game design and interactive media for about 13 years. I'm very lucky because I've been able to design most of the course content 
for the new program. And as you've imagined, I value history quite a bit. Beyond being an educator, I engage with an unusual area of performance and historical research. So I work with historical technologies to create new creative spaces for artists and musicians. I do this because I want to engage people to think about how we interact and change with technology and how sometimes technology changes us. Some of you may remember a performance I was involved with in uh, 2009. This is a music and visual performance using early game systems and computers. I had an opportunity to do this performance at VCF East 6.0, and it was called Eight Static Invades VCF. For this performance, I wrote software for Toshiba T1000 LE, and it generated live rhythmic patterns. Uh, this was the backdrop to music written on Game Boys, Segas, and Commodore 64 SID chips by live performers. The year before that, I took an interest in the RCA Cosmic VIP, released somewhere near 1977. Most of you are familiar with this one. It was designed by Joe Weisbecker in our own backyards. Uh, it interested me because it was a regional history about New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Now, teaching contemporary game design is frankly a new world. I spent a lot of time learning and teaching about 3D modeling, motion capture, high-end libraries, and game engines that do all the heavy lifting for us. In my philosophical approach to teaching, I think history is central to what we learn and do. In technology, social and cultural history informs our current cultural landscape. It's especially important to teach the history of the technology itself because it informs us about roots of our current practices and workflows in the digital design world. Why do we use W, A, S, and D instead of North, South, East, and West buttons? Why memory still matters in a world of gigabyte programming sloppiness? As a teacher and historian, I follow a system of analysis in game design referred to as platform studies. This was conceptualized by Ian Bogost and Nick Mott for around 2007, and I think a lot of game design professors follow it. The concept behind it is that video games should be analyzed in the context of the technology that they are delivered on. So, in other words, the hardware informs the software, and therefore it informs the designer's choices when they create games and software. And that informs the results as entertainment and a cultural experience. So the key to this concept is that hardware is central. So let me go back to the hardware. Those visiting VCF in 2009 may recall an exhibit by Christian Liendo on the RCA Cosmic VIP. Again, most people are familiar with the system. It's an RCA 1802 based single board computer. It's coupled with a very interesting CDP 1861 display controller known as the Pixie chip. It has a hexadecimal keyboard. You can put a speaker in. You can save the cassette. It even has optional boards such as the VP550 Super Music Board or a translation of Tiny Basic on ROM. To me, the most important element of this hardware by 1978 was the fact that it shipped with a book with several games written in a tiny interpreted language called Chip 8. So what's Chip 8? Well, it's a tiny interpreted game language. It's coded on top of the 1802 hardware framework. And this is highly contestable, but I refer to Chip 8 conceptually as a virtual machine, though the original hardware never really existed. It's sandboxed. The users can create custom code. It has facilities for a display, audio, key input. It has a stack. It has timers and program memory. The language to Chip 8 has 31 hexadecimal instructions. It's small and simple. Compare that to 91 opcodes for the 1802. There's a few undocumented ones, and they were supported only because they passed information to the 1802. There's 16 one-byte variables. There's 256 bytes of display buffer in RAM. So the nice thing about that is you don't need to time the horizontal and vertical blanking of NTSC. 
There's a 64 by 32 pixel screen space with on and off pixel mapping. You can have eight by eight binary sprites and there's a very simple draw and erase command. There's collision detection built in. And there's a little over a K of program space on a 2K machine. I find this language incredibly elegant. As a miniature interpreter, it takes only 512 bytes, making it extremely portable. I believe Weisbecker and RCA were thinking about forward compatibility of games, so they could play the old games on future hardware platforms. This concept still isn't rewarded in the game industry. Like many hobbies of this era, the Cosmac had a small newsletter-based community, so users could trade concepts and programs through the Viper newsletter. This was published between 1978 and 1984. This spawned some very interesting extensions to the language. For instance, uh, there's one called Chip 10. It was created by Ben Hutchinson and it was published in Viper. It effectively doubled the display size of Chip 8, but it needed a major hardware mod and it was at the cost of programming space due to the increased video buffer size. Later, Tom Swan, the editor of Viper, created an addition to the language called High Res Chip 8. This is really an amazingly clever display doubler. It had no hardware modification and it actually had a faster runtime, but it was at the cost of changing a clear screen command. And that unfortunately killed backwards compatibility for most games of the time. There was also an extension called Chip 8X. This one was by RCA and it was introduced in a rewrite of the VIP game manual uh, by RCA in 1980. Uh, the unfortunate part of this one is that you needed the VP590 color add-on board, and you also needed an additional sound module. This was a great idea, but it was a little too little and a little too late. You have to remember by 1980, this was up against the TRS-80 Coco and the Commodore VIC-20 and even other computers. I love the community involved here, but there's a big problem with this sort of hacking. So speed, which in this game engine was based on the time that it takes to process code became different for different versions of chip eight. This is a huge problem in game design. Everybody experiences the same game differently. And it might be one of the main reasons that chip eight never really moved forward. There were other projects like this. In 1979, there was a project published in Electronics Australia by Michael Bauer. He outlined a DIY project called Dream 6800. It's based on the Motorola 6800, and it heavily leaned on chip eight in its design and the future articles related to it. It even had an EEPROM OS that he called Chip OS. And there was a large series of articles in Electronics Today International. So between 1981 and 1985, uh, these articles outlined a DIY project called the ETI 660. It was also built around the RCA Chip 8. It improved the audio a lot, and there was also a color video implementation. But again, this caused more variations in the interpreter, and ultimately I think it made it difficult to share code. So the concept of Chip 8 faded from popular consciousness for a few years. That is, until the heyday of graphing calculators in the early to mid 90s. Specifically, the arrival of the HP 48 changed everything. It had a 131 by 64 pixel resolution screen. That's double chip 8's resolution. It had a very interesting Saturn processor that could handle 20 bit width addresses. And depending on the HP 48 model that you had, it had more than 16 times the memory space of the original Cosmic VIP. In 1990, Andreas Gustafsson ported the Chip 8 interpreter to the HP 48 calculator. He called it Chip 48. I think this mesmerized high schoolers. They could now sneak video games into school where the well-known Game Boy of the era often wasn't allowed. This interest in Chip 8 also coincided with the rise in the popularity of the internet through AOL, Prodigy, CompuServe. So people had access to libraries of old games and new tools were available to anybody with a computer. 
Most of this information was shared on Usenet, making distribution of ideas incredibly quick. In early 1991, Christian Edgbert released a DOS assembler called Chipper to Usenet. To me, this is one of the most important pieces to this history. Edgbert describes it as a toy assembler for a toy language. It was a 31 instruction assembly language. It was incredibly readable and it allowed labels and binary format data. That's making sprite drawing incredibly trivial. This brought on another slew of interesting expansions to Chip 8. By this time, there was one that was clearly adopted by the community. Chip 48 had removed the VIP hardware and the 1802 machine language references. It also changed the memory limitation to a seemingly unlimited memory of the HP 48, 32K. Later in 91, SCHIP48 was published on Usenet by a programmer named Eric Brintz. It increased the resolution of Chip 8 for the HP 48 screen. It added taller sprite sizes. It added a scrolling screen. But it reintroduced that speed problem. The HP 48 processor is faster and the code base is very different. There was an effort to normalize speed by reviewing versions of the game, but not on the Cosmac. They were reviewed by comparing emulators on HP48 and DOS. So the Chip 8 virtual machine was now based entirely on a virtual implementation. Another piece of this history worth noting is that sometime before 1996, a gentleman named Dave Winters archived his work on worldnet.net. Finally, a web page. He had links to his own Chip 8 emulator written in DOS. There was a slew of new games for Chip 8 and he released Unchip. This is a disassembler that reverts Chip 8 back to Edgebert's assembly language. And frankly, I think Winners had some of the best documentation of Chipper to date. This spawned many emulations, including Paul Robson's vChip8. This is a Chip 8 implementation in VGA. Um, by 1997, there was a Coleco and Amiga port by Marcel de Kogel. Jonas Lindstedt released Palm Chip for Palm OS in 2002. There was Dr. Chip 8 on Game Boy Advance that was also released in 2002. There was even a Rockbox port by Frederick Devernay in 2006, and this allowed you to play Chip 8 on the iRiver MP3 player. There's also contemporary phones and devices. Frankly, there were too many ports to mention here. Jumping forward in history. In 2011, I decided to start using Chip 8 as a hands-on teaching tool in my game history course. Game students are often visual artists, and they're rarely engineers or mathematicians at heart. But hands-on learning works really well for this group. Doing it is more important than reading about it. There's other advantages to teaching Chip 8. I'm able to introduce the concepts of processors, opcodes, mnemonics, and basically simple assembly language. I get to teach the relationship between the game and the underlying hardware and the history. Chip 8 graphics are also a very fun way to start learning about binary and hexadecimal in a visual way. The ones and zeros literally represent pixels being turned on and off in a sprite drawing. So my students started making games. I should mention a dirty secret here. I've never owned or used an actual RCA Cosmac VIP. I'm on a teacher's salary, and there's some scarcity and collectability to these older technologies. My students never see their work on the original hardware, and I think they're okay with that. So let me introduce you to our unorthodox tool chain. We code chip a in text on PC or Mac, and then we move that code to DOSBox and it's assembled via the chipper assembler that I mentioned previously. Many of these students have never seen command line before, let alone an entirely text-based OS, so there's a lot to learn from DOSBox as well. 
We then test the uh, chip eight results in a Java emulator. Yeah, another virtual machine. We're running a virtual machine inside a virtual machine. The finished code though, can be moved to emulators and interpreters on Android, iOS, PC, even Nintendo platforms, Linux handheld, Raspberry Pi. In fact, in 2017, it was even ported to the entry badge for the DEF CON 25 hacking conference. As a side note, I think Chip A may be the most ported game system ever, even more than Doom. This is important because students can share their code and that creates more interest in learning. We also have an orthodox approach to assembly language. It's good and bad. Because of all the changes through this strange history, we've lost sight of the memory limitations. Also, some opcodes are missing, others have been added, and sometimes not in a useful way. I try to stick to the original 31 opcodes, uh, less the 1802 subroutines. I think it's important, but the loss of that restriction allows students to create games beyond what we could dream about only a few years ago. I've had to create object-oriented like templates to help students relate to systems they've seen before. This causes less compact code, but it's much easier for beginners to learn. I've also disassembled a few classic programs and heavily annotated them for my students. This is one of the earliest games I found, UFO, originally published by Joe Weisbecker in Byte Magazine in 1978. He has an incredibly clever way of dealing with projectiles and collision detection on multiple objects. There's also been tutorials built for many common tasks, basic input, cyclical motion, timing, collision detection, four and eight way motion, sprite flipping, and more advanced examples like animation, sharing variables, and jump routines for characters. So let me take the last couple of minutes and show you what my students have done with it over the years. This is Salem Witch by Jenna Dittis. One of the more difficult things to deal with is meeting the challenge of creating recognizable objects with so few pixels. This is Lumberjack by Cody Lynch. It's unfinished, but it shows a very clever way of using collision detection based on input. This is Duck Run by Verily Kriegmer. And you feed the ducks bread so they don't attack you. It has an unusual narrative and very good control over the difficulties associated with player projectiles. This is 8-Bit Operatives by Vincent Nelson. This is one of the only Chip 8 games I've seen that has a virtual space larger than the screen. He created his own font to make a story-like narrative. It's not quite finished either, but at the end, you get to pick who you think the murderer is. This is Pirates of the Carl Bean by Ray Osterman. This is one of the largest games created in my classes, and it's got incredibly detailed graphics uh, tiled to make larger images. Uh, he did all this without using the S-chip expansion. This game's over 3K, and sadly, it would never run on an unmodified VIP. This has been quite an adventure. Thanks for listening. All right, that uh, was great. Um, Will Lindsay with Chip 8. It's a great uh, little video that we had. Um, so Will, do you have anything else you, you wanted to add to what was on the, the video? Or you want, I know you had cut it short, the video. Um, you didn't include everything you might want to have included. Um, do you want to elaborate more on like on like the game design or, or how your students thought about this old, you know, technology and, and programming, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been doing this for about 10 years and it's been interesting. Uh, I kind of pull them when they come in, you know, what, what, uh, game console they grew up with. And, uh, 
I'm feeling old now. I got to tell you, um, <laughs> this, this this is so far back that they don't even have a, a a consciousness of the history. So you know, to me, it's even more important that we're we're teaching this kind of thing, and um, I focus on it a lot. I don't think they realize the connections. You know, how things uh, how things from 40 years ago can affect what they're doing on Twitch today. You know, they just, they just have no idea of it. But it's been interesting. Uh, I just, uh, a lot of the, the work that you saw is from past semesters, but this semester has been the first uh, full COVID semester. So I'm teaching entirely online and um, the students are doing great with it. You know, we're on Discord every day, we're on Zoom every day. Um, and it's been, I think for a lot of them, it actually gives them focus. Um, so they're, they have more time by themselves. So they're spending more time playing with the code and trying to figure out how things work. And it's, it's awesome. It's really cool. Just had a question come in. Does this have anything to do with the pocket chip computer that was released a few years ago? I think, uh, actually, personally, I think I uh, got that through a Kickstarter or something similar. Yeah, yeah, though, I, the, the names, uh, the names related, they actually had a tiny retro virtual console on there. Um, but it was a complete departure from chip aid, its color, its higher resolution. Um, no, it, it doesn't. Yeah, it's uh, it's the word chip, I guess. <laughs> yeah, there's been, it's, I, I wouldn't be surprised if chip eight had actually been ported to that console. Um, I noticed it seems like this is the new version of Doom. Every, every piece of hardware that comes out, somebody tries to squeeze chip eight on it now. Um, that's great for my students uh, because they can actually show off this code, you know, even though it's, it's like I mentioned in the video, it's uh, legacy hardware that, you know, even, even I haven't gotten a chance to play with, but uh, they've definitely never seen. I see, uh, yeah, somebody never heard of the chip eight. Glad to see, glad to have seen this. How does the history of this intersect with the Pico eight, if at all? So Pico 8, I think, is the virtual console that I was talking about that was on the um, the chip handheld device. Um, and again, I think there's a lot of inspiration there. There's been a real move lately to do these, uh, they call them fantasy consoles, but people are basically taking a lot of the concepts and aesthetics from the 70s and 80s and moving them onto contemporary platforms. Um, yeah, Pico 8's a, a nice one. It has this kind of virtual cartridge, cartridge system so you can code games and trade them with each other. Um, there's a real nice uh, version out there right now um, called Octo. Um, that is basically a rehash of Chip 8 for JavaScript. Um, and that's done by John Ernest. And he does, uh, he does uh, compos where people you know, code, code a game really quick over a couple days and share it. Um, so yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of neat things going on with it right now. Yeah, somebody else commented about uh, P the chip computer shipping with Pico 8. So it's kind of a different beast. Um, yeah, all this, it's been great. I think something about these students I teach now, growing up with the internet at their fingers, um, they can get to history really quickly. Um, so they do appreciate it. I think they, they don't see a lot of it, but when they do, I think they really try to understand the context of it. Um, so a lot of these- Now, do they- you know, so I wanted to say, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, for me, it seems like the young people, those are like teenagers in college age in, that are interested in vintage computers, you wonder why are they so interested in these old computers? And I think uh, some of it is the simplicity of it and the ability to actually get some more hands-on to actually get to manipulate the different parts parts and and the intricacies and the, the you know the base parts of it whereas nowadays it's like you, you know it's just too external it's too embedded so that they can't really touch it do you yeah. feel that's the same thing with the students yeah i mean when you look at a a video game they play now so you know uh, red dead redemption 2 has a a, a crew of people um, in the hundreds that worked on that game and it's very hard to understand all the pieces and all the parts and how they fit together. But when you look at something like, you know, the games that Wisebecker produced, it's 
it's one person did everything, did the story, did the visual design, did the, the coding. And I think it's very rewarding for them. I do a, I do a demo when I start off chip eight, where I just have them draw a car in binary and just get it up on the screen. And the room just lights up that moment that I have them run it through the compiler and DOS and, uh, and move it over to an emulator and they see that car right next to the code they just wrote a few minutes ago. It, it absolutely lights them up. The, the game engines we teach, you know, that's more of a career move for them. You can code and code for hours. And unless you're borrowing other people's programs, you, you can spend a long time before you even get to see your own output. So I think that that immediate gratification is pretty exciting for them too. Another question came Another through. Question came through. Do you, do your students continue with chip eight after the course? Yeah, actually it's been interesting because I get I get emails about that all summer and over Christmas break all the time. Um, the, the student who did the multi-room one, it was the murder mystery where the character can walk around. He's still working on it and uh, it's fabulous. You know, it's not attached to a course. There's no grade involved. He, he just fell in love with it and kept working on it. So I hope to eventually, uh, I have a GitHub up and I hope to eventually move all these to a repository. Um, I need to sort out a, a better way for people to emulate uh, online. Um, and that may end up moving to something, you know, writing an emulator in JavaScript or something. But um, I, I think this code's worth sharing. There's some really good projects that came out of it. And Stephen Edwards asks, how do you balance out the time it takes students to work, learn, chip eight with other systems environments techniques yeah so that's a tough one uh there is this is basically a component that i run in a game history class or we call it game studies um you know so in the, in just their freshman year they have basically four game and digital art classes they take so this is one little sliver um rider is a liberal arts college so they learn very broadly um, and there's all these little pieces and they have to kind of figure out how all those pieces work together. It's tough, it's tough. I've taught in, uh, I've taught in more condensed programs and you know, you can spend, you know, semesters and semesters on a single programming language and uh, we don't get this opportunity. I, I think frankly, the most important thing I can do is teach them, expose them to all these technologies and teach them how to teach themselves the next thing that comes along. And that's that's including this historical piece. I, I think that's an important part of that and understanding that context. So do you find that they um, they also appreciate the power, the space that of modern computers and programming languages have? Because yours have to be very very economical with what you're doing with processing time and space. And do you find that, that it's helpful and, and, and important with nowadays with these bloated programs and, and, and such? Yeah, I, I wish. I, you know, eight, 10 years ago, that was absolutely the case. And I see that going away in my students' perception right now. Um, they're not concerned with frugality. Um, you know, we look at some Atari code um, where people do things like they'll they'll use some of the uh, op codes as part of the graphic. Um, you know, when you convert it to binary, they go back and bounce against that code and and double dip it. And it, it's amazing code. And Weisbecker did little tricks like that. And I think they're I think my current batch of students just uh, they don't see the need for that. You know, in their brain, they're like, yeah, I've got you know 16 gigabytes in front of me. I'll just keep keep throwing the code at it. It's okay. I think it releases creativity um, to work with a, a blank canvas like that. But um, you're right about that. I, I think they lose that appreciation. And I think it's, it's really valuable. And, and it might come back to bite us again. You know, new technology sometimes requires some frugality in the way you think about it. There was a comment that I uh, was just reading and it, it covers a lot of what we've been talking about and some personal feelings I was having. He said, uh, with older hardware, you're able to get closer to it when coding for it. You feel more connected to it. Modern PCs, for example, you're abstracted by so many layers, you're not at all as close to the hardware. I mean, that's why I love, you know, and I'm, I'm just getting started myself. I love machine language programming on 6502. It's just, I, you, you're there with the hardware. You're working close to the hardware. Um, so there's another question too came in. Are there any 
solutions to the timing differences between implementations? Yeah, that's been a tough one. And uh, you know, I mentioned that in the video in the 90s when everybody moved this language onto the calculators, they lost sight of the original hardware. For a while, the, the COSMAC was the, the gold standard for timing. Um, so no, I wish there was. Uh, you know, all we can do is, is try to create a standard at this point. But again, there's so many people working in different directions on chip eight. Um, I'm, I'm not quite seeing any agreement yet. Um, I'd like to, I think, you know, if another important piece of hardware comes around that might do it, but I think that's one of the problems with chip eight. It really is. I think it might've had more longevity if the timing was more standardized. Trying to read the uh, Discord at the same time. That one comment about the guy saying you could turn it on and print. So go ahead and comment on that. Yeah. Draw on screen immediately. I'm sorry, 8-bit computers, you could do print and draw on screen immediately after switching. Yeah, so it's that, it's that there's no layer between the hardware and yourself, or you know, you're very, very close to the processor. Um, for a while, I was teaching on Arduino for that exact reason. Um, and uh, I think I think people realize that blinking an LED is the first thing you do in an Arduino. Um, and again, that students had that glow of, of really understanding it, really understanding the hardware. Um, but then, you know, as, as the computers they're plugging the Arduino into got more complex, now there's more layers and just the connections and how the ID runs in a different language. And then you have to move it out over USB and things like that. So even being that close to the hardware starts to go away after a while. Somebody commented uh, what it really should have done ha had was a uh, wait for vertical vertical blanking instruction. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. I don't think my students could handle that. These are not computer science students. These are not engineering students. Um, these are visual arts students. Um, so teaching code has been exciting and interesting, but I think counting op codes to make sure that they could cycle time the uh, you know the beam of NTSC as it's flying across the screen would drive them completely insane. That would probably take a half a semester by itself. I don't know how we are for time. There's a lot of comments floating in, but I'll also be on the Discord, so I'll hang out afterwards. We do have uh, about seven minutes left, oh, so perfect. if you want okay. to keep going, we yeah. got time. Good, good, good. Uh, yeah, there, there were some comments mostly. If, if you'd like to talk, uh, you know, speak to those, that's great. I didn't see any specific questions, so it's up to you. Sure. Um, the calculators don't have vertical blanking. Yeah, and I think that's part of why Chip 8 was a, a successful port over. Yeah, it's, it's that, that's an interesting piece to me. Um, my path through life didn't put a, uh, uh, didn't put one of these calculators in my hand at the time, you know, so I arrived to them later, um, mostly as tiny little emulation machines and game machines. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they, it definitely changed the language. I think that's what what unbuckled it from hardware um, was not being sure how this was going to progress. Um, and I, it's kind of the best part about it. Timer defined, yep. There's, uh, there are a couple timers in chip eight. There's, uh, there's some horrible, horrible audio timers in there. Um, you had a choice of beep or long beep, basically. Um, somebody was mentioning in the, uh, in the chip eight discord, not the Q and A, um, the relationship to the studio too. And um, that had a little beeper on there. And I always have my students program it just to see what that was like. Um, but it was run by a charge capacitor. So as the capacitor dropped it, the tone would kind of whine off like it was crying or something, um, but no pitch control. Um, yeah, I think, I think these guys were right to call it a, a toy language, um, but it's, it's pretty interesting what you can do with it. Um, and again, I think the portability is really central to it. There's some comments here on the, yeah, the uh, relationship to logo. So a lot of us probably had logo as a first language when we were, uh, when we were kids. Um, chasing the beam. Yep. Yep. I'm sorry. I don't know if you got the question about where you can find, where someone can find um, resources, documentation, examples, snippets, source code. Is there an active community? Yeah, the, the, a lot of the community dipped off after around 2002. 
Um, right now, um, there's a great website, and I can pop the link in here. Um, Matt Nikolai up in Brooklyn uh, has this fantastic historical archive of the documentation. Um, that Viper newsletter that I showed, I think he has every copy of it digitized. Um, and then again, the, the Octo group, they do compos. I haven't seen one in about a year, um, and the code's a little bit different. So it's kind of hard to translate from one to the other, even though they're both based on chip eight. Um, but it's definitely there. Uh, a lot of, it, it was interesting doing the research for this presentation, because I ended up having to go back through Usenet archives. Um, you know, Usenet, I was kind of glad to forget about it back in the day um, when we stopped using it. But um, I'll pop that screen. link in. All right. Uh, uh, let's take a few more comments and then we'll keep going. Sure. How do I balance out the time it takes for students? Oh, I already pe passed sure. that one, didn't I? Um, whoops. How did you get the one that says uh, teaching numbering system, number systems? Oh, I that. must be looking at a different forum here. Well, I'm, I'm going back and forth yeah. between the chip eight and the q &A. Oh, boy. Yeah, I lost a whole string of comments here. That's great. Um, yeah, I missed that about the numbering systems. Oh, right. Started the lessons teaching about numbering systems. Yeah, so for this semester, um, they're going to see their first chip eight in a, about a week and a half. Um, so I've introduced them to drawing and binary um, and uh, basically being able to draw sprites for Atari and then how those would convert, but they haven't really seen the code yet. Um, hexadecimal has been a treat. Uh, I think for some reason, that's the hardest one for them to wrap their brains around. Binary seems easy to understand until you ask them to do math in it. Um, but hexadecimal just seems completely foreign. And I think it's having those alphabetic letters in there throws them off. Um, but we're in that right now. And I found in general, because chip eight is very, uh, it works very well with hexadecimal, um, that once they get their brain around the, the dimensions of the screen and the relationship to the sprite size, uh, hexadecimal starts to flow a little more easily. Um, it's definitely easier to memorize. I think they just hit a wall because it's the first thing they really see that's not decimal that they have to work with. Um, let's see, visual representation, graphics. Yeah, I, I could have talked about that for a long time. So one of the main reasons that I teach Chip 8 and Atari 2600 and NES has to do with representation and how we understand the symbol on the screen to mean something in real life. These kids are, uh, I don't want to call them spoiled, but they're very used to high resolution graphics. Um, the games look like cartoons. You can say um, spoiled. And so they, spoiled yeah, is, spoiled, spoiled, sure, right. sure. I'll hear about it on Monday. Um, they, um, they're used to that high resolution. And so when you have a very limited uh, amount of real estate on the screen, you know, I have students who are like, well, I'm going to make a vampire or I'm going to, make these three horses and they realize really quickly that it's hard to convey that in eight by eight pixels. Um, so you have to start thinking about symbolism. Uh, and then all of a sudden you have the, all these cultural connections around us that you have to think about the filtering, you know, what, what does it mean if I just stick a horse head on the screen? Do people yeah, read that I, as a horse or a chess piece, you know? Yeah, I know also that brings to mind how Lemmings was coded. They had to figure out how to, do graphics on such a small level, um, but that's very interesting. But we're ab out of time, Will. We have up. Uh, really appreciate that. It seems to generate a lot of interest, and a lot of people didn't know about it, and now they do. So that's good for you, good for us, and for good for everyone else. Uh, appreciate the video and um, coming here, and um, hope to see you in person at our next live show. All right. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll hang you. on the Discord for a while. Thank you. All right. No problem. We appreciate that, too. All right. Next up is going to be VIC-20, fully loaded. Jeff Salzman is going to show off his fully loaded VIC-20 computer, and we're going to have it live. He's going to show it live in the classroom over two rooms over. And Corey Cohen will be interviewing him. Ready? Ready. Oh, you're texting me. Guys, you're live. We're live. So we are live. Okay. So uh, 
you know, as uh, some of you guys have learned, we have a, a strange connection with the uh, with the uh, broadcast room. So we are live. So uh, I guess you can start. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeff Salzman, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about something that's near and dear to me as a uh, computer collector. In fact, this is uh, pretty much my very first computer. Not this one, but this one's a nicer looking one. Commodore VIC-20. Came out in 1981 in the U.S. Um, this, by the way, is my actual first computer. I, uh, it, it, it's yellowed a bit, and it still works, except for this left shift key. Um, but this is where I learned really to get into the computer stuff uh, if I wasn't playing at, at a Radio Shack store with whatever they have on display. So as an um, introductory computer for most people, uh, they, they came out about $299, $300. They came out at $300, and for most people it's considered a toy, and I guess to some degree it is, uh, but it is capable of doing an awful lot more. Uh, to get people started into computers, I was uh, 15 years old when I got mine, so I'm learning to program in basic. Uh, let me turn this thing on now, show you what it looked like, what we had to work with. Ah, there we go. We also got old TVs here, so bear with us. That was our screen, all 22 by 23 character display. Real easy to read. You get on one of these things, you type uh, in basic 10, print, oops, print. Hello. And 20 to 10. to do something. However, some people found these to be a low-cost computer to do some real work. And that's what I'm trying to demonstrate here, is that the computer, the VIC-20, was capable of doing an awful lot for not only games, but also productivity, even schoolwork. Uh, and of course, to get into the career of computer programming, which is what I do for a living, and thanks to a VIC-20, that's what I got started with. So you bought the VIC-20 for $300 and you wanted to start writing your own programs in BASIC. But to do that, you had to find something to store it on. So you basically bought a cassette storage unit, which is a very popular option at the time for most home computers. That's about another $100. I think they actually dropped in price. This is my original tape cassette, too. I think they dropped in price shortly after the computer came out. So I can write my program. I can save it on standard cassette tape. And then. Mom and Dad says, hey, that's a neat little thing. Can you do our, can you keep track of our uh, checkbook for us? Well, they did make software for home financing. So already this little $300 computer, well, $400 with the tape player, now becomes useful to keep, for Mom and Dad to keep track of their financing, or their finances. And then you get older, and then you're in school, and you have to write reports and papers and stuff like that. Well, before we get into the, that stuff, let's get into the fun stuff. You're in school. It was not uncommon to get all sorts of cartridges for the VIC-20. It was a very popular thing at the time. This one is the visible solar system. You just pop that into the back, into the expansion slot of the computer. And if it doesn't flake on you. The problem with these machines when they get old is all the contacts start oxidizing. And we, as collectors, we learn to deal with this, and it, and it happens. I even tested this cartridge earlier and it did work, but sometimes you just have to wiggle it in there. And there we go. Now we can learn a bit about the planet Earth. Um, let's see. It's been a long time since I used this one. There we go. Look at planet orbits. So I can learn a little bit about space, about the solar system with this cartridge. I can, and these, these cartridges usually sold for about 25 bucks at the time, 1980, 81 to 83, 84. And we get companies like uh, Imagic that used to make a lot of Atari 2600 games. They make stuff, uh, some of their games for the 20. So you have fun with this. So this one works when I plug it in.
not bad for games. You saw some games earlier. I think you saw Defender earlier uh, today uh, with uh, Alexander and, and um, uh, Jonathan had their 6502 thing. Same kind of Vic 20. And then you had those who got serious into programming. So, let's see if I can find the right one here. They wanted to start doing graphics and maybe some sound. So they have a special cartridge which gives them a little extra RAM. It started out with 3,500 bytes, now it has uh, 6,500 bytes. A little more to program in with BASIC. And then they wanted to load some programs, but they got tired of working with tape. So they bought themselves a disk drive, which went for about $400. Uh, this isn't an original age VIC-20 drive. This was like the next year or something like that. Uh, the original would be a VIC-1540. This is a 1541, but it looked very similar. And if you got really serious, you went and bought a second one. So you have two of them. So we're in this for how much now? Nearly $1,000. We're starting to build up to uh, productivity. And so we have, uh, we want to get serious and, and ready to go programs. We write software using cartridges that let us have special access to graphics and sound on the computer. And I have one on here. I'm going to load it up from this disk drive here and cross my fingers that it works. Okay, this one's plotting sine waves and, and, and other trigonometric functions. But then a seasoned programmer or somebody who's really into this would change the formula and, and plot this stuff maybe for calculus class or, or something like that. So it, it doesn't have a very high resolution display, but it still has a very good purpose provided you, of course, get the appropriate components uh, to either make the job easier or to, or to make the job fun. So now that you got done looking at the, uh, you got done playing your games, got to get that out first. You got done looking at the solar system and you started working on some calculus stuff. Now you want to do your school reports. So hopefully you can go out and get the $500 printer. And then we're talking 1982, 83 prices. The uh, Commodore Vic 1525 printer, and then you spend about 50 bucks for a word processing cartridge. Yes, the Vic 20 did do word processing. There's not many programs out there that do that, but their cartridges like this did give you that capability. Now it doesn't start up in the word processor. That's one of the drawbacks to the Vic 20 is not every cartridge auto starts. You actually have to type a command to get it started. This program, the Right Now word processor, actually came with keyboard overlay, so you know which function keys and other keys did what. To start this one, it's you have to basically launch a machine language program, and now you're in a word processor. Not much to it, but you can you can do. Um, I'll just do a hello there. As I type my text, it gives me control codes to let me know that I hit an enter there. Uh, I can hit tab, um, I can back up, I can do other kind of formatting. I can do what most word processors do with formatting text, copying, erasing, moving blocks of, of um, text, uh, primarily as indicated by this function key template by using combinations of the Commodore key or the control key and, and also the function keys, I can um, do pretty much basic word processing. So I go to print this, I hit the print function, it asks me how I want my print margins, I just leave everything standard. And actually, let me turn on the printer first. It's going to feed a whole page out. And my ink is a little dry, but you can see it has the word hello there. There. Wow, it ejects the page. 
and we're into this almost, I think, 1400 bucks. But it is a productivity machine at this point. And you can buy Commodore branded joysticks. There's a lot of stuff you can buy from the dealers. Uh, they, these were actually sold in dealers before they were sold in stores like Kmart, Sears, uh, whatever your local department stores were. They started selling them. And it, did, it doesn't end there. At the time, there was um, online services like CompuServe. I think that was a big, one of the biggest ones that were out there. So if you wanted to get information online, you would get yourself a modem. And it will plug into the back of the computer. And then with the right software, you can dial. CompuServe usually provided that kind of stuff. And you can access your stocks or whatever. You can download things as text files. You can load the text files in the word processor to print. It became very versatile. You have two different types of modems here. Um, this is what, this is kind of what they looked like at first. This is what they turned out to be, nice and slightly streamlined. They plug into the back of the computer here. You have all these things hanging off of the back. And if you wanted to learn, maybe, maybe at first you didn't uh, know how to program, so you can get software to teach you that stuff. Uh, this is a part one, a two-part series of books and tapes to let you. Learned a program. So it wasn't just a game machine, even though, like, kind of like the Commodore 64, which came after it, was primarily used as a game machine. It could be put to more serious work. Um, some of the other things I wanted, wanted to show is some of the accessories that, that were available for it, like uh, they actually made a set of paddles for some games, like, like breakout type games that were VIC 20 branded. But the nice thing is, if uh, you had an Atari 2600 before this, you could plug in the Atari 2600 paddles or the Atari 2600 joystick and still be able to use it in here for all your games or if you have a, a program that paints on the screen, you can use the joystick for that. There wasn't much in the way of mice, unfortunately. That kind of came a little after with the Commodore 64. And one other thing I wanted to do is load a file here, something I typed up earlier, so it's always keep forgetting the file name. So I'm loading something that I wrote before this. Basically a list of retail prices for all the different uh, components. So VIC-20, $300. Tape drive, $80. The disk drive is $400. The Printer, 500. The right now software. Actually, I think I found it priced at 40 dollars. If you if you were writing basic programs, you didn't have enough memory. You can buy memory cartridges to expand the memory up to 32k, I believe. 40k uh, if you're doing machine language programming. There's a certain amount of memory that you could not access from the basic environment. Uh, so another 60 dollars for. Uh, an 8K RAM cartridge. I think it was close to $80 for a 16K RAM cartridge. Uh, pretty much any game cartridge was about $25. Joystick was about $15. And in 1983, that would have cost you $1,419 ish. That's a lot of money then. Compare it to today's prices, it's equivalent to $3,705 in today's money, I, at least according to the inflation calculator. Um, but it can still do stuff. You can you can play your games. You can learn to write software in basic and machine language. They actually had cartridges that would let you program in 6502 assembler language and make those games that were shown earlier today. If you want, if you had uh, the the intention to do that yourself, you can do that stuff. Uh, you can write your reports and you know, save everything either on tape or disc. It depends on how much money you put into it. It was more than just a game machine with a keyboard. It, it did really serious stuff, and that's uh, one of the things I wanted to do. Because this is so near and dear to me, and unfortunately I couldn't afford this when I was that <laughs> at that age, uh, but if I could, I would have loved to have a setup like this. It, uh, there's a lot that it can do. And I'm going to go ahead, just for the fun, just for the sound of that, I'm going to go ahead and print it, because we all love that dot matrix sound. And I am open to questions right now. I pretty much covered what I wanted to cover. So, ask away. If not, then we're going to be well ahead of schedule. I got the question.
Okay, go ahead with the question. Nothing yet, um, but I can ask you one. Okay. Um, so let's say you have a fixed money and you move on to a 64. Um, what's the compatibility of between the accessories and the software? Well, the disk drives are compatible, the tape drive is compatible, the printer is compatible. They all work off the same Commodore serial interface. Uh, the joysticks will work, except you have two joystick ports. The software will not necessarily work. Some basic only software, which just prompts you with text, uh, but doesn't do a whole lot in the way of graphics, will load up on a Commodore 64 and you can use that. Uh, and actually, my I have a, a an assembler class going on tomorrow which can demonstrate some assembly language techniques which are actually that would actually work between the Commodore VIC-20 and the Commodore 64. So you can catch that tomorrow at 10 o'clock. I believe I'm scheduled for 10 for that. Um, no, not yet. Um, so what, what are the main differences between this and the Commodore 64? Well, uh, starting price. <laughs> the Commodore 64 started out at twice the price, $5.99 if I recall. Um, the Commodore 64 does give you a lot more starting memory, I think 38,000 bytes uh, all right off the bat, uh, much higher resolution graphics, and, and actually graphics capabilities that were almost built into it. This can do graphics, but it's kind of a hack. Uh, what it does, it takes whatever generates the dots for the characters, and you, you would actually lay out a field of characters and then you would clear, you would copy that to RAM, and then you would erase that RAM, and then plot dots by changing the character ROM uh, definitions, and that's, that's how you did graphics. It was, it was really a hack, whereas the Commodore 64 actually had bitmap screens. Did the VIC-20 coexist for long with the 64, or did, did Commodore really just, once the 64 came out, drop the VIC-20? Well, the only thing they dropped with the VIC-20 was price. It was still popular for a while. I think the, the VIC-20 was about $200 when the Commodore 64 came out at $600. And, uh, well, the 64 came out in 1982. So I was still using my VIC-20 in 1982. I had it until I you know, got out of high school in the mid-'80s. And um, then it was after that I bought myself a Commodore 64. But you could still buy them at Kmart or Toys R Us. They were selling for hundred dollars eventually, and then they got down to eighty dollars, and people were still buying because, well, it, it's a, it was a toy, I guess, then because the Commodore 64 was more powerful. Uh, a lot of this stuff I acquired from people who used to actually use these on their VIC-20, um, and and do some serious work with it, which gave me the idea for my exhibit. But yeah, the Commodore 64, natural progression from the VIC-20. A lot of the concepts of programming a Commodore 64 uh, came from the VIC-20. Usually when you did graphics, you would use basic poke and peek commands to, to manipulate the numbers, and that went right onto the Commodore 64. It's what memory locations you poked and peeked that were really different and how you used that. Wonderful. Um, the disks were not compatible. You couldn't transfer data, so if you had a VIC-20, and move to a C64, you can only really use your accessories, or could you actually still transfer if you made if you wrote programs? If, if you wrote basic text-only software that would use some of the more rudimentary basic commands like print or to get keyboard input, that kind of stuff, would be compatible. So you wouldn't have to pre-type them in. No, you wouldn't have to. They would still load up directly. Uh, as long as they didn't have a machine language component to it, an assembly language component to it, or didn't make use of graphics and sound. So if you wrote something that, if you wrote a program that would do conversions, you know, temperature conversions or whatnot, you could, uh, you could transfer that over because you would be using the basic program print and then you would ask for a value and then we'd use a, a get function to collect the value from the, from the user and then it would process it. That stuff would work with the Commodore 64. So the cassette and the disk format were the same? Yes, they were. Besides the uh, nostalgia factor of that being your first computer, is there anything unique about the VIC-20 that really speaks to you? You know, I, I could tell a whole story of how I got my VIC-20. I actually had a choice between that, and I'm not going to get into any religious wars over things. It was actually, when I got mine, it was either between a, uh, a Radio Shack color computer, the original one, the Coco One as they call it now, and the VIC-20. And one thing that I liked about the VIC-20 compared to what was out there at the time is that it has the full screen editor. Because some of the computers I played with at the time, you type in a program, if you want to fix a line that's still on screen, you had to use like an edit command. 
this one, um, if I do, you know, I'll, I'll do print hello. And let's just say I wanted to change that out. Okay, this is my program here. While it's on screen, I can just go up here and maybe insert something like that. Full screen editing. That's one of the things that actually, when I had a choice. I just wanted to, to reiterate that because when, when I'm doing VCF events or other exhibit type things, talking about Commodore versus other computers at the time, the, the on-screen editor was really far ahead of other computers yep. on the market. It was and Chris it was Fowler talking major, in the background. Major, major feature that, that really set Commodore apart at, in that era. And it works anywhere. You list your program, you can go to it uh, like that. So. Thanks, Chris, for walking over from your desk in the other room. <laughs> well, I had more important questions than I was finding in the chat, so. <laughs> were, were we getting any in the chat? Uh, well, some people are sharing a similar story to Vic 20. That awesome. awesome. Form, so we, we I'd love to that. be able to we read that. We should mention through. that. Yeah, if you're not on the, on the, the channel, uh, people are sharing very similar stories. So I guess, yeah. you know, it all, if we're all around the same age, you're going to have similar stories. If you're a little younger, you might have, you know, gotten it. Everybody years. remembers their first. Yeah. Isn't that what they say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad I still own my first. This, this, Like I said, this really is near and dear to me. I still have the original sticker from the Computers Unlimited store I bought it from. 10-22-1981, this is 39 years old wow. in two weeks. 39 years old. And you know, that's that's the day over 30. Exactly, <laughs> it's a little tan, but <laughs> that's, that's just the plastic they used. Everybody knows about the yellowing of the old plastic. You had the original uh, pet style case too, right? This is, yeah, this is, this, I, what I don't have is the original box. The original box was the, car, the, the foam pieces with the slide on cardboard cover. I lost that a long time ago. So that's with your Thurman Munson card that somehow got lost. In exactly, <laughs> yeah. And this has one of the original board layouts, uh, you know, off the the Japanese version of this. Is that the Any one that uh, does not have the heat sink on the All rectifier? it does, this, this thing no, no, used to burn sink, my hands. There's a heat sink on the regulator, but then there's another heat sink on the rectifier, so yes, you don't have that. This has that. Okay, that's not as old. No, Just not as say. old, but it's... Uh, it, I think it came out in the U.S. market about four months prior to me getting this one, so Makes it sense. was still, and I bought it from an official Commodore slash Apple dealership. They had Pets and they had Apple IIs there, and this was actually brand new to them when we got it. Uh, they didn't even know what it did, but it called to me, so that, that's why I said it's near and dear to me. Uh, we went to Radio Shack first. Nothing wrong with the Radio Shack one, just this called to me. At least it wasn't called a trash game. Uh, well... I have an appreciation, appreciation for it now, but uh, I, I just love my back. That's Maybe I'll get a bumper sticker. Are you going to keep it original, or are you going to eventually retrobrite it? I am not going to retrobrite this. People okay. offer to do it. It's because, honestly, because of those stickers. They, that, that's ephemera. I, I just love that. I'd no, have no, to pull no, the no, sticker. There's nothing, no, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just curious. No, I... I, I could I, I could actually probably put it in one. Well, actually, there there are different thicknesses of twenty cases. They mm -hmm. this just subtle, but there are they do have and some I think have different hooks and tabs to hold yeah. them. It, it's you, got the patina. It's aging yeah. the pen. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to turn yellow too someday, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, the sentimental value of those labels is way more important than retro. Yep. Yeah. No, I know. No, I agree. I just was yeah. curious. Yeah. It is. It is your first, right? It is, it is yes. your first. Your first computer. So it's and like our first car is our first computer that we all have a... This is one of the first tapes I stored. That's my handwriting on there. That's one of the one. first stuff I've typed either. Yeah, I try to, to, try to program it myself or I typed it from a magazine like, which, like this. Sometimes you subscribe to a magazine like uh, Compute Magazine was very popular for many uh, personal computers. And then later on, Commodore computers were so popular that they made this special Gazette version, which was for Commodore computers only. So, that says something about the brand. Where's the cotton gloves, man? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, one other thing too, when you got become a real power user, and you don't want to keep switching out cartridges, you got something like this. This goes back in the expansion port. You can put up to three cartridges in it, and using these dip switches, you can switch between them, and just hit this reset button, and you're in that new cartridge. I got another question. It's like a PC sure. Junior. You have to turn it off. Exactly. <laughs> There's uh, you know, so many people making cool new pieces of hardware for the vintage computers, like SD2IC for Commodore 64, yes. GoTex on the Amiga. Is there anyone making stuff for the Vic 20? 
Well, I use my SD2 IEC for that. Oh, he uses SD2. SD2 IEC is universal for all the computers uh, that have it. Because, and it's compatible with the, the Commodore 128. Uh, and I think and the, the 16 can use yes. it too, yeah, yeah. And, the, and the plus four. And uh, there is something called the penultimate cartridge for the VIC-20. It's one thing people tell me I need to get. Yeah, actually, somebody did ask about multi-card. So the yeah. penultimate is... The penultimate cartridge, and, and they were using that to play that Defender that the earlier today. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just a nice menu list of pre-installed VIC-20 software. Plugs right in the back, has additional features. I think extra memory came with it. It has all the memory options. And, and I love to buy those things for... I, I collect more than Commodore uh, equipment, but... I love to be able to buy that kind of stuff from my other ones, but you know, it's like, it's like fifty to a hundred dollars. You know, should I spend it now or should I, you know, eat? Maybe you know, <laughs> a lot of different things that uh, got to plan. But yeah, they, 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 there's still support for these things with new. Um, well, some people are creating new games if it's not oh. just new hardware to reuse it. And I, I actually program some stuff using. Um, like a uh, Windows PC using a programming environment called, uh, was it, um, oh, I forget the name, CBM PRG, CBM Prog. Yes. Yes. Um, and it's a really good environment to write programs in basic or machine language. It has some very modern features to it for writing software. And then when you compile the program, you can copy it to an SD card and stick it on the little SD devices that you can get for this and load it straight up. Or if you're really into it, you can put it onto a cartridge, which is something I plan on doing in the future. Oh. Or maybe I'll just continue typing them in <laughs> from the magazine. How many, how, how many times did it take you to debug that? Because every time I typed in a program from a magazine, I never, I never got the one. Well, it only took me a month because the next month they had the errata page, which had all the fences. <laughs> well, if they caught it right away, but you know, considering their subscription base, people caught the bugs right away and it was always in that errors, they, they always had an errors page in the next month. Well, I think uh, we really have to thank you for showing off your Big 20. Oh, thank um, you. And all these, the really great accessories and the loud printer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have quieter ones, but it's just something about this, something right? Something about it, right. <laughs> and so, it's such a good condition. And, and it's really amazing that you have your, your childhood, your first computer, you know, that in with the original everything, really. I Secret didn't sell it to buy a 64, yeah. Uh, or, or you didn't kind of throw it away or it got chucked. You know, it's pretty pretty amazing because usually, you know, back then, you know, we didn't, we didn't think these things would be anything, right? That's true. And now it's just by happenstance because I bought a 64 in 1985. And this, the VIC-20 just sat for almost 15 years untouched until I realized, oh, wait, does this still work? And it did, I thought, okay, I remember this, and I got my old tapes out and stuff. So yeah, I lucked out with that. It's, that's why it's pretty nice to have. And you're right; it's it's great when you can you know, yep. get really into it. Yeah. So so thank you very much. And uh, I guess we're gonna turn it over to uh, to the guys back in the room. Um, so we'll say thank, thank you. you. We're live again. Um, we had Jeff Salzman and his VIC-20. There was a lot of interesting stuff that he had there. It was really great to see that. A lot of fun. Uh, next up, we have Bill Degnan. Um, he's out in the Kennet Classic. He has a little museum there that I had visited for the first time a week or two ago. It was really great. He has some very rare and unique computer items there. Um, but his video is on the Casio... Microsoft connection. So I'm very interested in seeing this. I haven't been able to chance to see it, um, but I'm very, very happy and excited to see what, what's, what is this? Cause like it's history, it's historical. So I'm always interested in looking and understanding little history uh, about vintage computers. So you ready, Andy? Yeah. Make it so. is the story of how a Casio mini calculator led directly to the formation of the software giant Microsoft. So you can see um, this is a, um, a calculator uh, from 1972 and I'm sure uh, this is going to be hopefully news to most of you as to exactly how this happened. So since the turn of the 20th century people use mechanical calculators like this one to do their science and accounting problems and you would have this on your desk and you would add your, uh, your, add your accounting up. You can see it obviously doesn't have a lot of uh, advanced technology and science functions, but this is what you would have seen in the World War II era. And over time, things got a little bit more advanced. Still mechanical, still mechanical and electrical. 
But uh, here's a Monroe 8F213 from around 1964-1965. And you can see there's a lot more um, places that you can do your math, a lot more precision, but still mechanical. Here's another one. This is a Commodore uh, mini, um, mini uh, uh, calculator. It's all still mechanical. The readout is on paper. But around 1967, that's when electronic calculators first using vacuum tubes and transistors appeared. Um, at the time, these machines were called desktop computers, as you can see. Now, would you have believed that before? Um, but there you go. 1967 uh, May, you see the term desktop computer. So when you look at history, if you put it in today's context, you're making a mistake. You want to look at history from the perspective of the time, not of today's time. And back then, computers had a different meaning and a different word as far as, you know, it was related. And obviously, people know about the, the, the term computers referring to women who used to do the math during World War II. Those were computers. So over time, this, this terminology has evolved. But in 1967, you've got desktop computers um, are essentially fancy electronic calculators that can maybe do uh, basic rudimentary functions like square root. But the display is um, in a Nixie tube or other type of uh, actual um, electronic display. This is a picture here of the uh, first uh, hand, a desktop computer, if you want to call it that. Um, of course, we today would call this just a, cal a gigantic calculator. Uh, the first one, um, uh, this is the Model 132 from Frieden, who uh, made the Flexo writer and uh, eventually got bought out by Singer, um, that could perform a square root calculation. It uses germanium transistors, delayed line memory, uh, cathode, road, uh, cathode, cathode ray tube for a display. So it's almost sort of like an oscilloscope um, sending its display out to the uh, monitor. And here's a picture that I took of one. These are all pictures I mostly took of things that you know, I've actually seen myself. Um, but you can see it's really awesome um, as far as uh, uh, how it looks and, and working with it. But what it would do is it would actually have memory. It actually had the ability to store um, a few lines of uh, numbers in memory, and you could actually run computation, computation, compu um, computations against um, uh, something that had been entered in previously. So that's a pretty new thing. And over time, uh, you could see uh, Toshiba, the Japanese, entered the market. Um, you've got the 16-digit uh, displays, uh, Nixie tubes, uh, so you're, you're getting more, more display. You're, you're starting to become compatible with the most advanced mechanical calculators, which are still being sold at this time. Um, so this one is uh, 1969, and this one would have cost $1,400. But what's important here, really, isn't so much that this, this particular calculator did anything fancy other than the fact that it's a Japanese calculator. And you're starting to see the Japanese not just make componentry cheaply, but also actually put out their own calculators. And that was, in some ways, the beginning of the real calculator wars that uh, took flight in the 70s. Here's another one. It's a little bit smaller. This is a, a Singer uh, calculator from um, uh, 1971. And it's, uh, it's one of the final uh, desktop calculator uh, footprints. This would have been about the size of a, uh, a the weight of a phone book. So, uh, you know, when you're selling this to somebody, you would say, oh, this is only as heavy as a phone book. Um, and, you know, obviously uh, today that sounds funny, but back then this was uh, cutting edge. Then, um, then all of a sudden, Casio came out with this little itty-bitty calculator. This is 1972 August, and the Casio Mini was the first handheld calculator. Over two million of these things were sold. And guess how much they cost? $99. So you could see this was a huge huge uh, uh, impact in the market. And of course, it's going to have ripples. And OK, I'm setting you up. What's the connection between Microsoft? Fit in your pocket. It was smaller than a pocket ca uh, camera. You can see back here, you've got four AA batteries um, that you could use to power the thing. Significant improvement. So the Japanese had really come up with something remarkable. And there's the, there's the manual. Just like a manual would get for a watch today, you just don't read it. Why? You turn it on, you use it. You don't need to, you don't need to know how to use it. You don't, have, you don't have to learn how to program it. You turn on the calculator and you just use it. Other manufacturers, of course, had to follow suit. On the left, for me anyway, you see the, um, uh, the, Cassi I mean the uh, Commodore, which earlier you saw that, uh, that desktop unit. They, 
they got smart, they got the money, they made a small version. Uh, Texas Instruments, of course, many of you are probably familiar with that calculator. When I was a kid, I remember um, we got a calculator. Somebody down the street got one of these calculators, and everyone went to the house and looked at it. And I remember wanting to touch the divide button, and the guy's like, no, I don't know what that does yet. It was, you know, you have to understand the times were different. And I remember actually getting in trouble for wanting to divide something. But not everybody was on board. Um, and there, was still, there were still manufacturers. Uh, two months before the Casio Mini came out, in June of 1972, a little company called Micro Instrumentation and Telemetry Systems announced their new calculator kit uh, right into the highly competitive desktop calculator market. Uh, this is an image from the July 1973 Radio Electronics article, and Ed Roberts is the name of the guy that ran this company. And here's a, here's a couple of uh, uh, um, pictures from the Radio Electronics magazine geared towards hobbyists, geared towards people who want to build the calculator themselves. It was less expensive than $1,400. You could get this thing for $250, but you had to build it yourself. You, you had to enter in the, 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 the ROMs. You had to solder it. You had to put the wires together. You had to do all the work yourself. This thing had bridge rectifiers. You can see um, caps and resistors and so on. So you, you have a whole schematic that you'd be working from. And this is actually a selling point that you would actually get to do all this. And you can see the input um, consists of an array of switches. Uh, housed in a keyboard and closing one of the switches causes a start signal to be generated in the unit response. And uh, here's a picture of, of the one that I have and you can see um, the complicated wiring and uh, this is actually a friend of mine um, was working on this, Bob was working on this to um, fix it and uh, replace one of the ROMs by building his own pick chip to uh, replace one of the ROMs. But you can just see that this is definitely not a pocket calculator. And there's the final product. Very good. Okay, so the kit sold for $200, or you could buy it assembled for $250. Um, you compare that to the Casio, $99, and within no time at all, Ed Roberts found his company Mitz was $300,000 in debt. Um, so Ed decided to take the lesson of Casio and apply it to a new idea that he'd been playing with, um, he knew that his 1440 um, calculator could be upgraded to accept up to 256 instructions. Why not make a computer? So he didn't go the make a little kind of calculator route. He, he went make a computer route. Um, he knew that in the early 70s was, uh, he knew that in his time, the early 70s, um, uh, useful mini computers were simply too expensive for the average person, but he knew that everybody wanted one. Uh, he knew that there was a potential demand and so he said, what the heck, let's do it. So he called up his friend in um, Popular Electronics, and the MITS Altair 880 was born. So he, he told them at the time he had a computer for them. They were thrilled to feature this. They gave him free press. They gave him a free cover. Um, and uh, there was a two-part feature, one in January of 1975, and the next was in uh, February of 1975. Um, the Altair was sold only to uh, early in 1975. It was extremely primitive for today's standards, um, and uh, it ran at the, a minute fraction of today's processor speed. Um, here's, a, here's a picture of it. Uh, it's about 7 inches by 20 inches. Um, the only way to interface with this thing, though, it was a computer, but you couldn't do anything with it. It had some front panel switches. It had some lights. You could turn it on. But you weren't going to play Pong with it, which was a very popular game at the time. You weren't going to interface to do word processing. You weren't going to write with it. You were going to barely be able to do machine language programming. And the only way that you could actually interface um, with this would be to write your own programs with a teletype, punch them to tape, and write your own assembler and write your own compiler and all of that. And if you were into that kind of thing, and I, I assume that Ed Roberts of MITS figured his calculator making guys would use their new handheld calculators to do the calculations they needed to then create this computer, I suppose. Um, but at least, uh, at least this, this really kicked off a revolution, but there was a problem. It wasn't really very easy to use, and it wasn't really ready to be um, mass produced, and it wasn't really for, for mass market. So. The call went out to put together a BASIC. Um, 
as you know, BASIC would be the holy grail, I suppose, for what eventually became the way that computers would operate. It would be the thing that would make you go better and faster and mass produce and general public access to a computer. Because with BASIC, you could do both calculator functions and so much more. You could write programs, and you could do those kinds of things that people were doing uh, with time-sharing computers and mini-computers uh, in the early 70s. So Paul Allen and Bill Gates um, were both from Seattle, but they were going to Harvard at the time in 1975. And when they learned about the Altair um, from Popular Electronics article, uh, they decided to make a basic for it in 4K, leaving space for, you know, for programs. Here's a picture of what they looked like back then. Um, Bill Gates and Paul Allen um, called Ed Roberts about hiring them to make Altair basic. Uh, Paul flew to Albuquerque with a paper tape containing basic on it. Uh, Paul Allen and Bill Gates um, got a contract to make uh, basic for the MITs, and Microsoft was born. And you can see a quote there. Ed Roberts, we'll give the first guy that, throws, um, that shows up with one. We'll buy the first guy that shows up with one. So uh, basically, they took them up on it, uh, and that's how Microsoft was created. Um, here's an ASR33 teletype. Bill Gates and Paul Allen, uh, first commercial software was Microsoft Basic, which was originally distributed on paper tape for use on this kind of a teletype. The teletype was the I.O. device employed by the MITS, tel uh, the MITS Altair, and uh, that's, that's how it would have been delivered. So you would have bought your Altair, you would have built it, and then you would have sent away from MITS and you would have got a little paper tape that you would be able to load. 20 minutes later, you'd have a ready prompt on your computer. And just so you know, I do have my uh, original software license for the paper tape software. So nobody can say that I've been uh, ripping them off. And there's the logo. So Microsoft did not invent BASIC or the personal computer, but they were among the first to look at the PC software as a product to be sold and supported and not simply given away for free with the computer. This was a very controversial at the time. You could also say that software piracy owes, owes its foundation to the Altair as well. And although I'm sure it would have been simply happened some other way, computers would have eventually come. The Casio Mini, which helped spur MITs to make the Altair, also therefore holds a special connection to Microsoft as well. It's for you to decide. Welcome back, everyone. That was Bill Degnan and the Casio Microsoft Connection. That was very fascinating. Um, I like the history about the calculators, um, especially the early ones. Um, it's amazing how expensive they were. But, you know, essentially, you know, computers, they were big calculators. And then they get smaller. Uh, they got it easier to, to move around at the handle. Um, so we're going to move on to questions. Um, Chris, do you have any questions for us? Not yet. So sometimes they're a little bit slow coming in. Bill, do you want to add anything to what you were talking about? Um, about the, the and I mean, first of all, how did you come up with this idea for for investigating this? How did it come about that you were like, oh wow, this is interesting? I, I did a talk at the Hope Convention, and this was something that I touched on, and so I expanded on the idea. Um, so it was uh, a while back. I, I gave a talk at Hope, um, and uh, I brought this up. And uh, um, the only other thing I'd say is that um, I said that the uh, the Freedon 132 is the first uh, desktop calculator to do square root. That's not really true. It's the first one that had a square root key. Um, other than that, I stand behind the text of the video. Much so, so if it was the first one with the key, so then other ones did square root, but they just did it a different way. Yeah, you would just like you're doing a regular math problem. You know, you would just uh, you would do the math and uh, calculate that way. You, you know what I mean? Just like you were doing on pen and paper, you, would, you, you could use a calculator to do a square root equation. Yeah. You know, do the division or the multiplication. So how long did it take you to investigate this this whole story? Uh, not not very long, I'd say. Um, I you know I used to teach computer history at the University of Delaware, so you know I came across a lot of this stuff. So rather than say that I did it all at once, it was more like a um, a collection of thoughts that hey, this would be a good thing to talk about. This is a this is a. Um, I have the, the Casio and the MITS calculator and the Altair on display at Kenneth Classic. And so I kind of thought, well, that, this would be an interesting story. Um, so I, 
I, I went, you know, just basically that's, that was how I came about it. So it was just, um, I, you know, I have a lot of stories um, and this is just one of the ones that uh, just came to mind. I had, so, I had something else completely prepared for this uh, Vintage Computer Festival. I have a, uh, an SDS 420 computer. It's a 6502 based uh, computer with twin Percy uh, 7, 277 drives on it, but it came late because of the uh, the problems in Los Angeles with the Postal Service. So I had to switch at the last Did minute. it actually come yet or is it yeah, still I on finally, its way? Finally got it. I finally it's got it. Too late. Well, hopefully next, next show we can show that off. It'll be wonderful. Um, we have a question now, right, Chris? I, I'll, I'll ask it. Did the MITS MITS, I guess you call it, 1440 use a processor or a custom calculator chip? It was all, it was all, um, it had um, six ROMs that did different functions and the rest of it was uh, TTY. So there's no CPU. Do you think that there's an overlap between calculator market and personal computer markets? Back in between 1965 and 1975, there would have been, yes. Uh, do you think, uh, wait, not that one, sorry. Um, there was a comment from Bob Roswell. Um, our invoice for the kit calculator, MITS calculator, lists the parts that were missing. We will ship the rest of the parts when we get them. <laughs> <laughs> that's So that sounds sort of like they were in a rush to get these this computer to market and they didn't have they didn't really have it complete yet i think i think what was going on at the time is is you know most people on their desk right now have a computer that's four or five years old most people don't go out and buy a brand new computer every six months so the mentality of somebody in 1972 um, was well, I have a, a an only two year old uh, desktop uh, calculator that's the size of a phone book. Why don't we make a desktop calculator that's the size of a phone book? But we'll have people assemble it, and we want to rush it and get it out. And I, I don't, I don't really necessarily think that um, uh, that they plan to not have the components available. But I don't think they were expecting the Japanese to put out. Uh, a, a small handheld calculator like that. I, I, I completely was uh, would have been a surprise to to everybody. Um, the two million units of the Casio, those mostly were in Japan. So if you want to think of it like uh, Japan was a couple years ahead of the United States at the time as far as calculators go. All right. Um, I'm not sure how well relevant it is. It says, how was BASIC written for the 8800? Um, well, it, uh, it was uh, ported from uh, um, Dartmouth Basic, mm -hmm. and um, if if somebody wants to send me a, a contact message from uh, through VintageComputer.net, I can send the differences between those. I talked about that at a, a past Vintage Computer Festival, where I compared and contrasted the original Basic with the MITS Basic performance and so on. Um, but essentially, it was a port to the 8080 CPU. And I have a question. I'm not sure what the question. You have any more questions, Chris? There's one in, in this group, but I, I don't, I'm trying to are understand. You, are you talking about the, the Casio, Casio Microsoft group? Is, Do you want yes. a BusyCom calculator? Is the is it the 40, 4004 based model? B U S I C O M calculator. Is that yeah, sound I'm yeah. sure there. I'm sure. Well, I'm sure that there was a uh, calculator uh, built with that chip. But my guess would be that it probably came out in into the mid '70s. I'm not sure if this guy is offering you one. It says, "Do you want one?" Is that what? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. It's a typo. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a typo. Do you own one? Oh, do I own one? The only forty, only only thing I've got like that is like a, a an EEPROM burner, that kind of stuff. I don't have a calculator, just an EEPROM burner with that from that from that type of uh, CPU chip. Okay, so there's another one here. Uh, it was similar to another question you have. So, uh, what was the brain of the MITS 1440? A processor, a custom chip? Well, you can go you can go to vintagecomputer.net and you can um, you can get a lot more detail about the uh, um, about the uh, calculator there, um, and you can see pictures of it and so on. Um, so I would suggest that you start there. Um, Bob Greib is the person who really mastered it, and he's the one that um, 
uh, came up with the uh, the add-on board to replace one of the ROMs. So he's really the the wizard of it. And I do have his notes and his information. And if it's not on vintagecomputer.net, somebody wants to contact me through vintagecomputer.net, I'd be more than happy to send them what I've got. Okay. Um, I, I have a question maybe you might know the answer, may not. It's uh, it's related to the calculator. There's a, you know, I had heard the story about the calculator wars between Texas Instruments and I guess maybe HP and Commodore and, you know, Texas Instruments won the calculator war, so Commodore got out of the markets. Um, do you know? Are you aware of any like good resources, books um, that sort of told that story about that um, time period? Um, I'm not as familiar with the pre um, uh, like Kim days of Commodore, um, you know, as much. But there was a lot going on with Commodore. It, with previous management so it, it was really before um some of the players that were familiar with came on board in commodore it's almost like they had a, a changing of the guard and to get into the computers um but i don't know all the details uh about that so i'm just going to simply say um i'd look it up just as much as you okay great it makes sense uh well any more questions chris it uh, looks like that's all for now all right well, I thank you, Bill, for doing that, the video. I really liked it, enjoyed it, and, and something I learned uh, from that. Um, and glad that you can participate in our show. And you have anything else you want to say? Anything, any other? Nope, that's it. Just hanging out at Canada Classic today and uh, looking for, you know, anytime want, anyone wants to come visit, please just let me know. Where's Canada Classic? It is in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. KennettClassic.com. All right. Awesome. We're like, and by the way, it's gorgeous. And he jams, I don't know how many jams so many computers into a space like that. It's really great. <laughs> All right, Bill. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on to the next um, video. The next video is Bill Hurd and Dave Haney. Um, so I'm calling this Commodore Show and Tell. They're going to uh, talk to each other about the good old days of Commodore and show off some of their rare and unique items um, that they have in their house, which they normally wouldn't uh, bring anywhere because they don't want them to get broken or stolen or something like that. So like here. Um, so um, Andy, you're ready for other video. Yeah. All right. Let's make it so. Welcome VCF East. Oh my gosh. It's VCF East 2020, the year that wouldn't end. We are here with you. I have Dave Haney of C-128 animals fame, all kinds of amigoid stuff and lots of other junk. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, say hi, Dave. Party on, man. Party on, Dave. Party on, Bill. <laughs> Can you believe it's 35 years later? No. <laughs> Jesus Christ, what happened? Can you believe I don't have hair? <laughs> What's up with that? I lost it. Like, as soon as I left Commodore, my hair left. It's like, well, if you're leaving, we're leaving. <laughs> Yeah, I had a couple kids kind of born and grown up in the pro in the in between time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the non-silicon children. You, you're gonna have to. Well, yeah. I have one of those too. So it's a yeah. hey, animals. We were part of the C-128 animals, right? That was our nickname. Oh, yeah. And what's and Dave came up with that name. I'll, I'll give full credit there. Um, <laughs> the the one thing that was weird though, and I just looked for it. I can't find my old army helmet from the 70s. My handle was. Uh, I had two handles. One was hippie. And the other was animal, and it's written yeah. on your little sweatbands. And so I was looking around <laughs> for my old animal sweatband. The, yeah, and I had a T-shirt the... that's I had a T-shirt that said the animal on it. From okay. uh, I remember from that college from college. Right. My uh, so our yeah we had a we had a chef in our in fraternity who uh, who gave everyone a nickname. <laughs> and he called me animal because, uh, of course, I had the long hair and I, you know, oh, I, usually, I bit people. Yeah, it, it was like easy Saturday to... morning. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I looked like some kind of creature. <laughs> right, right. Hey, so did you hear who I had a talk, chance to talk to for no. BCF? Bill Mensch. Remember him? Well, well we didn't oh, know yeah. him. Yeah. You know the yeah. name. Mm -hmm. So Bill's really cool. As, as you'd expect, he's a chip guy, right? He's consummate yeah, chip guy. And, and he's from an era, too, right? He, he got out of chippiness when, it, when, when chippiness was still so handcrafted, right? 
Yeah, uh, yeah, where they were doing, where they are laying ruby lith or, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, drawing well, the lines themselves or whatever. Yeah. I, I even made the comment that the engineers would spend weeks, if not months, measuring, you know, with the scale, all the different, you know, because we're doing, what, 140 up to 250 trans thousand transistors by the time we got past the big chip. Um, and and he, he was like, well, you should know intuitively if they're the right size. And that told me, I said, oh, you haven't seen the big stuff. <laughs> but, but he's right. He's right. You know, it, it was art back then. And, you know, this man had to not only invent the logic, highs, lows, pass-throughs, they had to do the work on the depletion device to pull up, right? Um, and, and we never liked NMOS pull-ups to begin with, but we learned to deal with them. But he actually invented the NMOS, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but in my mind, he invented the NMOS pull-up. So that, yeah. that was very cool. Yeah, it was always it was always such a weak pull up because it was it was asymmetric and after you know, four yeah, volts, yeah. right? It got yeah. to four volts and then it went to. So, do you remember the Z80 clock circuit? I, you know, I maybe I'll stick the schematic in here. Do you remember we try to ask Dave DiOrio, hey, get me to 4.95 volts in 10 nanoseconds because the Z80 needed a true clock, slam yeah. to the up, slam to the down. Yep. And yep. he tried. I know what he did. He tried to create a voltage doubler on the output cell to lift that gate threshold up <laughs> off five volts. It, 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 the way he said it didn't work, you'll have to do something else. I gotta believe something like the JFET went into forward conduction or something like that. Cause he said, it's not going to work. And I said, okay, Dave, thanks. <laughs> I mean, I was glad he told me right then, right? But do you remember we used 12 volts in a transistor to make it work? Yeah, yeah. I remember it was you and Frank Playa working on that, right, the, on that particular. I'm trying to think that, if Frank was, was around before, back then. Or was it before Frank came along? It might have been before Frank I think it might have been. So, I, right, yeah. because I just added the Z80, right? I just yeah, added it and we went yeah, and got was, Frank. Yeah, yeah. That was, so I we're think referring that was, to, of course, Frank Playa, yeah. the third hardware animal. The third I, animal in the hardware business. Yeah. yeah, but now I call Bowen, Ryan, uh, Vaughn. I call all those guys animals. Yeah. You you think oh, of them the same way, animals. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're animals. Absolutely, they're oh they yeah they you 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 know it's an exclusive membership, but it's not that exclusive. You know, they, <laughs> but it's the not software exclusive guys to are hardware. Loud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I love those well, guys. Well, you know, man. you I'll don't say, really have a C128 without the software. <laughs> It's it's all about the software. We're we're just, just the vehicle there. they it's, build it's, it on. It it's uh it's one of these. It becomes a doorstop. Like oh, this. Hey, I got mine. Hey, here's my doorstop. <laughs> See the scratches? This was yeah. this was literally used as a doorstop at Commodore. Um, so I tore open every doorstop right I could. Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say right about the time I started. Commodore was having a trade-in program where you sent any sort of computing right. device in and you got $200 off a of C64. It was right before Christmas. I came in October of 83 and uh, they had a whole room full of old computers and most of them were co completely worthless. There's some interesting ones there. I remember there was a Sol 20 and a few others, but these things, uh, there you go. These things got all sucked up because they made perfect door stops. <laughs> which you and me were the first to do that on my door, which I had stolen, by the way. I didn't have a door we until the, I yeah, stole one. And then marketing yeah, saw them, and yeah, everybody yeah. in marketing had them. And then yep, the, night, yep. the night that I needed Z80s to, to actually make the Commodore 128 have Z80, we didn't have them in stock. They were all soldered into the boards, right? There was no sockets. So I went around tearing open every doorstop I could find, right? And I come walking back in the hardware lab, and it's like 11 at night, and then you're there, and everybody's there. And I'm bleeding from my hand, right? Because when I tore it open, a piece of plastic just ripped across yeah. the back of my hand. Oh, yeah. So I'm there with yep. blood trickling off my fingertips, and they look at me like, what's up? I'm like one thought back. You know, what, what can I tell you? The, the doorstop kicked my ass, but I still got the Z80 out of it. So that was that was a kludge, a kludge and a half, and it worked though. I mean, that was if anything would have kept the C128 from working in production. I was afraid it was going to be the Z80 clock circuit, and and I would have been fully blamable yeah. had it not worked. It would have been my fault. And so I walked around. I mean, I'm asking George R.R. Robert, you know, Gurr. I I I asked people yeah. I didn't like 
I asked everybody, especially people I didn't like, <laughs> what's wrong with this circuit? Why can't I use it? Tell I asked the metallurgists from MLS, yeah. right? We're, and we're looking at like the architecture of the base collector junction. And I'm going, this should work. But, but in millions, as you know, yeah. anything in a million is its own quantity. It, it's, it's, yeah. it's like yeah. the smallest yeah. leak yes. at 100 pounds per square inch is still a huge puddle of water. Yep. Yep. And you could, yeah, you can go through millions of things and find the, the 5% that failed that just and because of something weird you hadn't anticipated. That's yes. skids of, of, of stuff that are close. Yeah. Hey, look what I got. Do you know Ooh. what that is? Um, this is by, what the heck well, is, what yeah, the heck is the, this? It's by Johan Grip, and it is an unstuffed C128 board. Okay. I, oh, I just, it, yeah. It supposedly it works if you stuff it. So I figured uh -huh. maybe you and me can sign a couple of these, right? They'd be good collector's items. Oh, what's that? An Amiga? What is that? That's an Amiga 2000 Rev 5 board. Okay. So you can eat I, dinner off that thing, man. You could. Um, I spent a lot of time on? working on working the Rev 4. The Rev 5, we had um, new memory chips. We had to go to higher density memory chips. Um, we made the board, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, we're not going to even stuff them because we just got a batch of new 68,000s that were CMOS, and they were noisier than fuck. <laughs> and it was like we they none of them worked in the existing 2000 because everything was you know everything was being run to the rails the now thresholds and, are wrong yeah the thresholds yeah. are wrong yeah the, the noise well, they had they had, TTL, to... they had ttl input thresholds so it was it was a you know it was a t, it was designed to be a, t, a cmos tt it was designed to be chip compatible but it was too fa the outputs were too fast they were call, uh, causing all kinds of noise so the production guys basically the took radio over frequency and decided that they were going to uh, the, the, that they were going to work it out how to make this thing work on a, on a two thousand. And I think I'd been I'd been off of working on something else anyway. I just did the Rev Five because they needed it quickly. And so we ended up getting we ended up getting a Rev Six that actually worked with the CMOS part, which I oh, as cool. I recall was was not a whole you know was things like uh you know there were some damping resistors put into. Uh, you know, series resistors put series into a bunch resistors. of the uh, yeah. critical lines that you didn't really need for NMOS, but probably would have been a good idea anyway had I known about those things back in so the day. <laughs> NMOS's impedance goes up then as the voltage goes, in my humble opinion, because of the gate thresholding yeah. problems and stuff. It's not, and it's right. not even TTL. It's not TTL either. It's NMOS. Yeah. You know? and, and that's the, right. So do you know what I'm going to do with this? Remember that wire that was on every C128? Yeah. This wire. There's a wire yep. on every C128. That Do you wire. The story? Yeah, that wire. Vaguely, that's, yeah. That's my proudest <laughs> kludge. Yeah. So the story <laughs> behind the wire, and everybody's heard this, is we're ready for FCC, final FCC. I think we just had CES. We now need it to really work. We shoot Rev Nana. Rev 7 of the PC board, and 20% of them won't boot the Z80 CPM program. And, and there's no auto routing back then. There was no, this is a two layer board. We wouldn't dream of doing this in two layers these days, right? And the right, impedance right. on this, I use series resistors. This is what remind me. I use series resistors everywhere because the impedance is mismatched and the series resistor absorbs it, right? Well, what happened here is when the Z when the 6502 is on, it's at the end. It, think of it as a flute, right? You're blowing in the end of the flute, and it comes out the right note. But the Z80 would get on somewhere in the middle, and the the, the electricity would bounce off goes, both yeah. ends. And I fixed <laughs> it by making it so there was no end. I made it when it got to the end. There was a wire that took it back to the beginning, and that's on wrapped here. it around. <laughs> okay. So behind me, let's see if I can. Right here is a machine so that went mine. down to like 10 picoseconds. And what I was going to do is do a TDR, time domain reflectometer, and then put the wire on here. Yeah, you know, hold that back up in a second. And I was going to actually see yeah. why 35 years ago it fixed it. 
So I think that'd be a good Hackaday video. By the way, Hackaday. Woo! Hackaday. <laughs> hey, hey Shep, Hackaday. pull up your C-128 again. So why does it turn colors? Do you know? No, I don't. I, I think I've heard somebody describe the process before, but I know they have bleaching kits and all sorts of stuff out there right, for retro right. computers. But. So I did a talk for BCF last year um, on aging and stuff. And my conclusion about the coloration is nobody knows. Everybody thinks they know, but <laughs> I haven't heard. A, I've heard all. Nobody oh, actually the, knows. Right. Oh, yeah. It's the boron in the in in the or not boron, but uh, uh, in, in the flame retard and all that. Well, until I hear one of somebody that's as good as all our old mechanical engineers tell me, I'm going to say we don't know. So that's yeah. Yeah. Does yours I think work? That's probably I, I the answer. <laughs> Yeah, right, right, yeah, I have it's, I haven't it's tried it because I've, I've powered up I powered up a few old Amigas that didn't run, and they probably need to be recapped. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so that's a, that's did you a, ever see the video where somebody was talking about the caps in backwards on the Amiga Four Thousand, and he didn't know I had Greg Berlin right outside the door? Oh no. <laughs> I'll, I'll show you that video. Maybe we'll insert it here in the in in the yeah. editing post editing. We call it post. But mm -hmm. so so the Amiga guys were talking about fixing yeah. Amigas, and um, I think it was Anthony was t saying a lot of times these caps were in backwards, which is true because people that think that the band always means negative or positive on an electrolytic cap is going to be wrong some of the time because it it would change. Mm -hmm. So a bunch yep. of them it depend yep. on the vendor. So uh, the, he's saying, I asked, I said, why are they in backwards? He says, well, nobody knows or anything. And so a minute later I go, can, can I interrupt you? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, I have with me here, Greg Berlin, designer of the 4000. <laughs> I'm like, hey, Greg, is this true? And he's like, who said that? You know, he's like doing his best answer. You know? <laughs> but I think he said, I think his answer is, well, he's lying. <laughs> so... Uh, what else you got with you? License plate. Wow. When it, all right, so, never... so, so for everybody who knows, Dave and I worked starting at the same time, but I left after only a couple years. So Dave's going to have a lot of stuff I've never seen before. So did that get you in the yeah. lot we used to park in or no? Actually, I could never use this because I lived in Jersey, in and Jersey. I had to have a front yeah, license front plate. License plate. In Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> had to have the hey, front so, license plate. I could use it now, but right. now it's like a collector's item. It's this, you know, if, if, if for those who can't tell, it's a circuit board. Oh, okay. I thought plate. it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's a PCB. Yeah. When I moved to New you, Jersey, you can tell I also put because it's got the it, it's got the uh, the the um, circuit board people's names on the bottom and uh, Excel circuits. <laughs> okay. Yeah, do you remember going to fourth generation when you first got there? Yeah. Yeah, we, we didn't do our own PC board. We we're Commodore and we used outside PC board uh, fab initially, or not fab, but layout. And then we got Terry yeah. Fisher from, from my old place in there and that, the world changed for us. So, hey, yep. you know what I was thinking? And years, and years later, now, when you, another thing is when, when we had this era, C128 or up to A2000 or so, we would always, they, they, we'd build these in the lab, the first prototypes right. by hand with, uh, you put them in a frame, yeah. put components in there. Oh, these things, we, we, these things took so long to build, they had engineers building them too. I had, I built a, A2000 a took me about eight hours to build. Um, wow. We eventually got, we eventually that's got good, a little actually. pick and place machine down in the factory. So we oh, could do you? prototypes oh, with, beautiful. yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Sadly, it didn't wind up at my house after Commodore ended, but <laughs> I, I keep not buying one of those little Chinese pick and places because I really don't need it. And I'd spend more time trying yeah. to get it to work right. But it's like, oh, I want yeah, one. Yeah, you would. I know. <laughs> so, so speaking of like fish and you, you know, there's there's a metric that I kind of have called I call it market cap. It doesn't really mean that in the traditional yeah. sense. But for example, the, the 128 and the TED together sold probably probably about at least 1.5 billion worth of dollars, US 1980 dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, you'd have okay. a lot more than me because you stayed 
So I'm going to assume you got million, billions of market cap. Um, and I want to well, ask you what all you worked on. My computers never sold as well, though, because like there were but, like. But you got like, to add them all up. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, I mean, you can count the C128, and that was that was pretty good. Um, that's seven million, then, close yeah. to seven. Yeah, it was, it was about seven million. But the uh, I don't know if we ever sold a million two thousands because uh, you know it was an expensive machine comparatively. The, you know the, right, the right. five hundred sold. You know they they were selling. I think they sold close to two million in one year, which back then was like crazy money. But they you know it never you know it was it never hit the C one you know it never hit the C sixty four numbers. In right, fact, right. In fact, nothing did until and they're they're saying the C sixty four didn't even hit the C sixty four numbers. But I choose not to believe that. I choose not to believe that <laughs> as well. <laughs> and um, and I choose to believe that the first the first single model of a computer that uh, outsold the C sixty four was the original iPad. Yes, I agree with that. That that yeah. is the first single model computer to outsell the C sixty four. Yeah, yeah. And, and part of it I was that, iPad, you know, a computer. You yeah. know, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's a personal computer. It's not a PC, but you know, we you know we, we were made them. Computers. We could call them PCs. They're home computers. Yeah, it's a home we computer, were home just computers. like your phone is these days. Yeah. Right. The, the word VisiCalc and personal computer weren't part of our, uh, you know, part of our uh, language back then, at least not often, unless we were talking about IBM or something. They, yeah. they talked, you know, actually, should... before the IBM came along, some of the magazines would di differentiate between home computer and personal computer, and that a personal yeah. computer was all in one, everything there ready to go, and home computer might be something like that, like a, you know, it, it, it is a personal, it, you could have a computer at your home that was a personal computer, but you could also have something like a Heath kit where you had to build right. each piece. But it's still a home computer. So, right. but it was, you know, that was all informal. It, you know, the, it wasn't really until IBM stamped PC on it that you started having arguments about it's a PC right. or it's not a PC or whatever. Well, and to me, and to <laughs> me, it, whether you had a trail back to the yeah. TV roots or not, you know, whether you just, I tried telling kids, we used to display it on a TV and they're like, yeah. what, you put it on top of the TV? No, it was really on the TV. It was, oh, no. so. And, and you know, the Pat's ironic thing is, you can do that still. You can do that again now, right? You know, you you plug into HDMI. You got a pretty, you know, every TV TV makes a halfway decent monitor today. <laughs> right, right, right. So Mench gave gave yep. us a compliment on the 128. Um, see, now I realized oh, Bill Mench saw the year that the 128 went against the Apple II GS. He's like, you guys beat us. You, you they they only made a couple hundred thousand, and we made a few million, right? And I realized, I'm like, well, Bill, you know, and I didn't really get this out to him in time. Bill, you were on both sides of the, yeah. of the, of, of the argument. You, were, you made our 6502s in addition to the 65 <laughs> CO2s, and, but he was getting royalties for the Apple one. So in his mind, he was on the Apple side uh, of Apple. Okay, yeah. Oh, that's, so that's right. what he was thinking of it. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. <laughs> that but, had the A16 in it, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually it did. But here's, here, here's a spec for you. Yeah. The 128 outsold almost all Apple II models combined. It's like within a couple hundred K. So wow. if you throw out any one model, That's... I mean, they only made a couple million of the mm -hmm. regular C122, I mean, of the uh, Apple that two that we all think of. They didn't make the original, that many. The original Apple II, no, they didn't. That was, that was back, that was selling back in the days of the pet when it first came out. I, in fact, I, when, I, when I was in high school, I went with my, my buddy Scott to Manhattan where he was going to buy his first computer. We went to the only computer store they had in Manhattan, which was this little one-room office. On one side, they had 4K Apple IIs, and the other side, they had the 8K Pet. And he ended up buying a Pet, and we were carrying the Pet back to his father's uh, uh, office on Madison Avenue. And... Uh, So you yeah, mentioned was, writing. Oh, here we go. This is my original <laughs> C128D, and um, there it is. It's got writing on it. Yeah. It, and it says, not an Amiga on it, which because <laughs> yeah. oh, it says that, that. That says it there. But basically, this is saying that, uh, watch your ass. This was a bad hard drive, so it's written. But by writing on our own computers, it kept people from stealing them. Yeah, I wish I wish I had had the uh, 
I wish I had had the Amiga 2000 from my lab because it said it said A2000 modified on it in big black Sharpie so that no one would steal it and try to sell it. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is the one. This is a true plastic C128. Yeah, but yeah, the original one with one the keyboard. Camera. Yeah, with there the keyboard you go. Stuck under yep. yep. So you said you had something written on, right? I don't. Yeah, actually, nothing. I still have it has writing oh, yeah. on. Here's it. something for you. What's this? Modem. That's a modem. That's a Jeff that's, Porter that, modem. That's a Jeff Porter modem. That's yeah. a 1200. Yeah, 1200 at a day of 300 baud. Yeah, and that was like the fastest time from somebody joining the company to cranking out a product, too, I think. True. Very true. Yeah, he had this out before the LCD. I mean, and we knew we wanted to put modem in the LCD, which was, yeah. you know, the trifecta of getting Jeff Porter in there, who came from AT&T. The sucker could whistle the tones necessary to talk to a modem, right? <laughs> yes, <could>. so, but, <laughs> yeah, but all, I, see, all I could ever do is whistle and shut it up. <laughs> That's, he would do that. He said he could whistle at two in the yeah. morning and cause it to shut off and stuff. Oh yeah, well I had learned I had learned that in college as well because we had the you know acoustic coupled modems, and if you were if you felt like being a real jerk, you'd go in there and whistle the right tones, and the modem would shut up. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. So, do you remember the? Do you remember me spray painting everything with H's? I think I, all yeah, my I tools had orange. Lab, yeah. If you saw yeah. orange, and, and <laughs> once a week or so, yeah. I'd go around and pick up my my books would had H's on it, and I'd pick up anything orange. If you got caught with so much as an orange screwdriver, I'd send Haney to come mess with you. And if if you didn't like that, I'd send <laughs> Berlin, six foot eight Berlin. Yeah. And, yeah, and if, you, yeah. if you still were giving me trouble, I'd send Bowen or Ryan. <laughs> you know, <laughs> those, those guys, they cut you. You never even know your intestines are on the floor, you know? <laughs> You've never even seen them. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you don't see them. You just know you that your gut them, yeah. hurts suddenly. Yeah. Uh, do, do you have a pet? You know, I have a pet, but it's so far in, under storage, I couldn't dig it out for this today. No, I never had a pet. Um, that. I had a C64 before I joined the company even. Oh, look yeah. at that. Do you, do you know what that is? Let me try and, so it's got the power connectors right next to the DRAMs. This is one of the ones that took the towers. Look at all that. Can you imagine management thinking that we're going to get that working? <laughs> but, it, but look at the chip guys. They labeled the chips that are dead bugged. Yeah, and this did work. This did work. This this worked with towers that we put in for it, each it, chip because yeah. the chips didn't work. Yeah, and I remember those towers were the towers were all wire wrapped, and each one worked a little bit differently when we first got them. <laughs> we called it the laying of hands. So I would walk over, I'd make sure the connectors were tight, everything. And what the programmers would do is, when it stopped working, they would start spraying cold spray into the air. Think, you know, and I'd go, ah, oh, they're spraying the board. And I'd come on a run, and they'd be just, they had a, a label on the cold spray. It said hardware engineer call, and they're just reaching up and going, <laughs> yeah. I'd come running, yeah. though, every time. Because <laughs> yeah. that was back when the earlier ROM emulators didn't work right, and somebody figured spraying it made it better, and it didn't. It just made it, it, it just delayed the destruction. They had output shorting in it and stuff. So, yeah, we did. Uh, we, go ahead. We did we did towers for uh, the Amiga 3000 as well. We had, but we we were smart enough to actually get circuit boards made, and they were all done with PLDs. Well, I guess back then it was just regular PLA. So you had a whole board full of PLAs to do your your uh, Gary chip yeah. and your Buster chip and all that, just to just to get the thing up and running. Right, right. Hey, so you know who has more market cap than all of us together? For printed circuit, Who's that? Terry Fisher, Fish, our PC board guy. Oh, Fish, because he's on everything. Yeah, everything, <laughs> right? So that guy has billions yeah. and billions of dollars, and he's doing work for name companies now and stuff for for our old friends. But yeah, he he yeah. talked about market cap. That guy's got it out there. So. Yeah, and ever, ever since uh, we, I did. After I left Commodore, I didn't have anything that was all that popular. So, <laughs> like, not 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 selling in the millions. Well, that's an anomaly to sell in the millions. It is. It is. It's un, it's unusual. Um, Here you go. I found the I I found the 
So we might as well take advantage of the fact that I normally wouldn't fly with all this stuff, right, to a VCO. Yeah, yeah. There's one of the towers that, that emulated a chip that didn't yet exist. And I may have yours in here. You did the PLA. The PLA tower, yeah. Uh, I'm guessing this is an MMU. No, this is it. This is your PLA tower. Here's here's your PLAs. Yep. So yeah. around here somewhere is an MMU tower. I wonder if I yeah. could get that to work again. I, I should do like a Patron and get some of this junk to work. Hey, this I was talking about this. And you probably didn't remember, were you at the, yes, you were, you were there. So this is what they played at the beginning of CES when we introduced the 128. It plugs into the 64 ports and we had a guy from Juilliard playing it. Now the story you don't hear is right before he went on, the analog stopped, the audio stopped. <laughs> And uh, Gail Moyer came over, and I reached into my pocket of my unmatching corduroy jeans that didn't match my jacket, and I pulled out a fuse. It popped the 9VAC fuse, which is used for the audio output. So we, in true Commodore fashion, we even fixed it at the last minute. Ah, oh, so we talked about this. Or we showed this. So... This yeah. doesn't work, but this is out of that pile that we had. And people are starting to ask me, do I have any 6530s? Unfortunately, this says needs to be fixed on here, and it's dated 1981. So it's been broken for a long time, but it's still a Kim 1. And matter of fact, the fact it's broken means I don't have to worry about recapping it. So and this, did you ever work on one of these? We actually no, did didn't. our compilation. Oh, no, it. actually, I did. We had, uh, I, before, I, before I started at Commodore, they had Kim Ones in the robotics lab for, okay. uh, at, at CMU. Um, a year later, they switched them to 68,000 machines. But, yeah, they were still, we were still writing 6502 code to uh, control a little robot. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, so for, just so everybody knows, Dave Haney is from Carnegie Mellon, home of robotics, many would argue and has dual degrees there, uh, computer science and math, right? In short, he oh, could no, do everything. Elect I electrical couldn't. engineering and math with the computer oh, it's electrical. science track. Okay. And almost cognitive psychology at the same time because I was, I, was, I was triple majoring <laughs> well, until I couldn't, fit in one of the, uh, I couldn't fit in one of the labs. Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to build, um, like, you know, Terminators. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Which are 6502 based, well, I might add. Of, of course you know? they are. <laughs> yeah. Um, have, have you oh. seen the video we did with uh, Chuck Peddle, where uh, Jerry yeah. Ellsworth and I showed him mm -hmm. the, you know, Bender the robot and, and the Terminator? Um, do you have? Uh, can you turn on screen sharing? I don't know. What What would you? Oh, to make it so you can share a screen or me? So I can. Sh so I can show a photo. Okay, I think you do it from your end. Share screen I, I, down in the middle. When I, it, it's just like the other thing. It says his host participant disabled screen sharing. All right, hold on. You might have to click under me or something. I don't know. I'm, I just made you the host. Oh, okay. Let's see. Hey, that works better. Why, how'd you do that? See, I'm I don't sure know how I to work actually... Zoom, everybody. What, what a okay. better format. Did it work? Now, I, I can see it, but I don't know if it's being recorded, but that's, you know, people used to see my hair and think it was my beard. That's how much hair there was hanging around me. <laughs> now, who is that to the far left? Go back to that picture. Who is that to the far left? Far left. I'm not sure. That's Adam Schwanier, Vice President oh, of Commodore. Oh, is it? Okay. Okay. So we have a few more here. This is uh, Claude Gouet and Gail Moyer. Gail was a yeah, uh, uh, ran ran marathon. There, there he again. is again. Yeah, this was. Oh, uh, look at that! Chicago. You're setting up uh, C16. Yeah, yeah. This was Chicago. I didn't have anything from the C128, but uh, this was when right, we were showing right. off the TEDs the second time. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, this is the time when I got a hold of Irving Gould while I was drunk and gave him a piece of my mind about something. And surprisingly, I didn't get fired, but I should have been. <laughs> I can... Look at that, C-116. 
what what is i didn't remember the 116 making it to the ces I, i'm not sure i'm not sure it was ever shown right that was I back that okay this was in a bar where somebody came up and started clipping animals on my face and uh i was kind yeah. of okay with it you're one of the animals right <laughs> yeah yeah go on let's see six foot berlin. eight greg berlin 30 years younger than he is now, dressed like he's from the 80s. Yep. Yep. Uh, look how skinny yep. everybody is back then. Oh. What, what <laughs> I weigh, 150, it. something like that? Oh, there's Andy Finkel oh, on the right. Oh, yeah. Oh, let's see. Yeah, that was, that was, yeah, there's Andy Finkel. That was, that was the end of uh, 84. Andy Finkel was head of the software games group and then eventually became a head of all software, right? Or all yeah. Amiga software. So, so Bill, if, 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 that, if that doesn't show up in the video, I'll send you the photos. Yeah, yeah, that's a real good point. We can always you can stick always those in. You can always include them in post. <laughs> in post. Now we're talking like pros. Uh, we'll scrub it in post. Uh, you know, it's everyone uses that term, so I started using it years ago. It was like, oh, fix it in post. <laughs> right, right. All right, I'm kind of out of things to talk. Oh, you know what I do have? Do, do you have like one more thing to show while I go rummage around in something? Um, yes, I do. I have, a, I have another, I have another, um, I have more photos to show. Um, I, yeah, I don't want to get into personal photos. Any from the, from the show? Oh, okay. No. Hey, hang on just a second. I'm going to grab Let's a see. Commodore LCD. Hold okay. on a second. Okay, let me see what else I got here. Nah, this is not very good. Crash. All right. Yep, I don't have it handy, so we'll we'll just skip over that. Um, so the case I just looked in that I kept it is empty, which means it's the wrong case. <laughs> So, but the LCD computer, if you remember, that was to me the one computer that was to be evolutionary, or do I mean revolutionary? I probably mean revolutionary. Um, revolutionary, that, yeah. Yeah, it, it wasn't going to be just another computer. And you and I were both working on that before the C128. I brought you into the LCD, um, though you and yep. I only spent a couple months on that before, but I did take the MMU. So I designed the architecture of the LCD, which happens to be the architecture of the 128 upside, you know, the, the higher end. And the MMU that I did for the LCD, I just plucked it right up and dropped it in the 128. So uh, I actually was working on the 128 before I knew I was working on it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any, any good memories you have? Of, of, I mean, I got just tons of them, but I'm, I'm trying to think of, I mean, I missed the teamwork. I missed the camaraderie. I missed the drinking and partying that we did on third shift. You know, first shift was for managers, you know, interfacing with managers. Second shift, we get stuff yep. done and third yep. shift we partied, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, I, was I, well, I don't actually life. miss not sleeping because, because <laughs> I still don't sleep. <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, I picked it was up a whole a lot bit more of fun PSTSD not sleeping when you had a big, you know, well, especially after this year where, you know, e even the camaraderie we have at, at my current job is, you know, is like virtual at this point. <laughs> right, right, right. So VCF, you know, guys, thought, we're, yeah, thanks was... for listening to us babble. Um, we didn't know what we were going to talk about, but Haney and I can get together and talk all day long, almost any day of the week. Yeah. Uh, I, I, the one computer I didn't have lined up, the LCD, turns out I don't know where it's at. Shame on me. Uh, but, Dave, great to see you. Get 35 years later or 32 or something. I can't believe it. I, we, yeah. I was voted most yeah. unlikely to survive this long of the group, um, and somehow I did. So now I have to worry about longevity. I, I, it's, you know. Rent a liver yeah, or you something finally like that. have to worry about longevity like i hadn't planned to live this long <laughs> i didn't i didn't plan on living i burned off brain cells and liver cells and but we had fun oh my god we had do you remember dancing to and they danced i would call the local radio station and have them play the hooters and they danced at one in the morning and we'd be <laughs> yeah. and, and, and we're like doing that all around the hardware lab but yeah i just <laughs> 
I just remember the manager starts showing up around eight in the morning and be like, well, time to go to sleep, catch a nap. Oh, yeah, <laughs> not getting any work done now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I used to have that sign outside my door that if I needed my sleep, it said, you must be at least a manager to disturb me. I had another one that said, you must be at least a director. And that was signed by the director of the day. And then the third one was, you must be at least a <laughs> vice president to disturb me. And I had Adam sign it. So it, I couldn't get my sleep. I mean, and I'd wake up and there'd be like somebody outside my door waiting for me to wake up, you know? Yeah, you know what would happen too is that they, 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 because my, my office was right outside of Bill's and I had a sleeping bag under, under my desk like many of us did at that point, but I had no protection. So if they couldn't get Bill, if the door was shut and the time was up, they'd come and get me. And apparently I wasn't threatening enough when they woke me up. I'd be like, oh yeah, I can, I can help, oh, you know? Uh. And I'd probably gone to bed at like, you know, this would be at eight in the morning, nine in the morning. I and you went to bed, bed at five. four or five or something. Yeah. yeah. So one quick story I'll tell then, but Dave's office was right outside of mine. Dave did my tube work for all the DRAMs and stuff. This back in the days when we called it VisiCalc, not spreadsheets. Well, it had a VAX <laughs> name, VCalc or something. Yeah. And w one day they're all, three people are on their knees around this terminal as if they're praying to it. And you guys are doing it. Diorio is one of them, and you're, you're looking at the DRAM timings. And the phone next to you is ringing. I mean, it's ring, yeah. ring, and nobody's answering it. And, and Terry Ryan had to tell me a story. I'd forgotten it. I came out of my office with that leg that I'd torn off the desk. I start beating the phone, just like, just beat the crap out of the phone. And you all turned and just looked at me. I just shrugged. I went back to sleep. The phone's laying on the floor, so it stopped ringing, right? And you guys are still doing your DRAM timings, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, that was the first time we had ever – that was that was the, the new way of doing it. Previously, for the TED, oh. it was one big sheet of Mylar. <laughs> yeah. And we had it right up in the hardware lab. We had the, the most popular DRAM timings in a chart that Jeff Brennicke had made. In my first week, I stood there and memorized that chart because it must have been important. It's hanging in the hardware lab. And so from the first week of working there, I knew all the DRAM timings cold, you know, not only what yeah. the value was, but how it related to the other brands and vendors and, and our architecture. So, yeah, cool. and I had I had I had built the the spreadsheets so that I could I have separate DRAM spreadsheet that could plug in to the C128 right. spreadsheet. And then we could, cause they, cause Commodore was always trying to get the cheapest DRAM possible. And that was like, DRAM was like a big issue in that era. Big, big was, issue. Yeah, so that, that, if that we could get some weird ass DRAM, DRAM that happened to, we could get some weird ass off spec DRAM that just happened to work in the C128, they would buy it. <laughs> right. If, yeah, yeah, and this, this let's make no mistake about it. This whole board is about the DRAMs working correctly. Nothing else <laughs> matters as much, and that's why it took me months to get it to where one day it said, "Oh, so 65, 561 bytes free," and I'm like, "It works! <laughs> it's the right number because it would show the wrong number free when it failed." So. Yep. Right. Yep. <laughs> hey, VCF, thank you for listening to us babble. We're definitely stopping now. VCF East 2020. Hey, hey. Jeff, thanks for having us on. I got Dave Haney here. Maybe in the post, we'll talk about all the different machines he worked on. But meanwhile, everybody stay safe. Dave, it's always a pleasure to talk with you, dude. Always a pleasure, Bill. Cool, man. Maybe we'll catch you in another 30. No, I won't catch you in 30 years, but <laughs> in a couple. All right. I'll be you, you, my head in a jar, you know. Yeah, like like Futurama, sixty five. Like Futurama. <laughs> All right. So thanks everybody. All right. Welcome back, everyone. So that was Bill Hurd and Dave Haney. That was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that video um, and seeing all those unique items and a little bit more history and stories. It's always fun to do that. You know, they had come before to VCF East and did their talk, you know, the Commodore years. And we had Chuck Peddle one year and then we had Bill Hurd the next year and then Dave Haney the next year. Um, but this was a sort of a contrast that was a more serious and here's the history, but this is a lot more fun, a little anecdotes and stories and unique items that they got there when they worked there. So I had a lot of fun with it.
Um, so we have uh, a lot of questions for them. Um, Chris Fallon, are you ready to ask some questions? Yes. Uh, first, I just want to mention a few comments. Thank you. This just made my day. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Fun to see you talk about Commodore history. I love that little machine. So, hey, needless to say, it was a popular talk. Uh, so first question, first real question here. Bill, why is the pin layout of the MMU on the 128 so logical compared to other chips on the board? And how did that play into the trace routing on the PCB considering the mounting holes? That sounds like a really good question. It, in, in the answer, there really is an answer there. And that was because I specified the MMU first into the chip fab, into the chip designers whereas things like the VIC chip came from them to us. Mm -hmm. So those were laid out for, for the chip, right? And then even later in life, we find out that having VCC and ground on the corners is actually horrible. But for a chip guy, that's great, right? So uh, the MMU was actually what I needed. And Dave also had input on the PLA. That was his baby. So, uh, you know, getting that pinned out. And of course, he could have used any pin for anything because that's the nature of PLAs programmable logic arrays. Yep. So, we lost you, Chris. I have the mute on again. I keep hitting that button. Since, mm -hmm. since Bill clearly still has a shop. I don't know, Bill, turn around. Do you have a shop there? Uh, yes. Somebody wants to know what you're working on. What are you currently working on? Oh, so much that I get nothing done. I, it's Brownie in motion. It's so <laughs> there. There are some hackaday videos I'm just chomping to do. I want to show you how to use a small oven to do 0.5 center chips. You know the real small ones. You can do them at home. I, I got a lot of stuff I want to talk about. It's just finding time. You know, especially as you get old. Um, getting old means time moves slower or faster. One of the two, but the memory goes next. <laughs> Uh, Dave just wanted to say that a guy named Dane Archer says he owes you a beer or at least a hot dog from the <laughs> from the commissary. <laughs> um, okay. St Stephen Edwards asks, do you know uh, the bill of materials price difference between, say, a 128 and an Apple IIc? Our cost or what it got charged for? Well, uh, he, he so says bill of materials. So wherever you want to, I guess wherever you want to nail that down. For what, for what computer? Either compared to between the like the one twenty eight and uh, Apple two C. One twenty eight's uh, bill of material. My cost was under fifty dollars, um, and, and that included my cost for my chips and stuff. I actually spent four dollars more on the packaging, and I, well, I hated about, it like, that you had case a package and it. the keyboard and like everything. That's a whole 50 machine. Fifty bucks, man. Wow. Yeah, made in millions. We we made eight million of the things. Made in millions, and 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 you know, there's a lot of stuff where it's you know, it's, if you're making it yourself, um, yeah, you know, chips. It costs. Apple did, Apple historically did not know what they should be paying for things. They might now if they have <laughs> people, but like here's an example. Oh, that's very true. Yeah. When we start out, when when Amiga started out, um, Commodore got the sixty-eight thousand, and our chip guys took it apart, and we figured out how much it was supposed to cost, and we got a deal for about that. So we were paying $2.50 or something like that for a 68,000. We know that Apple was paying eight bucks for the same chip <laughs> at the same oh, time. Um, and part of it was because we were able to get them from Hitachi for a while. And, and, and then Motorola looked at the fact like, oh, they're willing to use Hitachi parts, which was their oh. second source, but not everybody wanted, you know, every, every chip company up into a point needed a second source, but they didn't really want you to use the second source. They just wanted it out there. So, um, right. yeah. So. so what Dave's talking about, too, is also we knew the, 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 the footprint costs and the yields and stuff. So we could go have that conversation, go, look, we know how many mils square you are. We know what your QA is. So here's what it's worth to us. It's yep. like being in real estate and owning square footage. Yeah, and other times, like for the uh, for the Amiga twenty five hundred, the 20, 2620 board, we needed a fourteen megahertz, fourteen point three megahertz, sixty eight twenty, sixty eight thousand twenty. Um, so they had sixteen megahertz parts that wouldn't quite make it. So we said, "We'll buy all the fourteen mega fourteen point three you're willing to sell us." Um, right. You know, all the ones that just barely failed, and they were happy to do that for us. 
Did you change the power supply then to, to bring them back in or did you just go with your normal tolerances on the supply? We, we had, that was the clock. We, with, for that board, we were forced to use, uh, we were using a system clock. Actually, it was kind of a, it was kind of a dodge too, because we were using, um, we had two uh, quadrature clocks coming up at 7.3 megahertz or so. Okay. And for your so, color then or something. Yeah. Them to make a 14 megahertz clock. And that also meant that there was no clock on the board. So the FCC looked at it differently. Yes, they would, because you need, yes, you, you, if you don't have an oscillator above a certain frequency, they, they lose interest in you. Yeah, there was no oscillator at all. So, so it was kind of both of that, but it was also because that made that all the 68,000 stuff that needed to translate into 68,020 happened synchronously. So it was a right. simple design. The next generation, I, <laughs> for the 68,030 version of that, I did it async. Cool. Cool. Okay. Did you uh, want to show the LCD real fast? Well, I got plenty of questions, but I thought we didn't want to forget that. Oh, we can do that. I found it finally, hopefully. And yes, <laughs> that is 35-year-old plastic cracking and breaking. But this is the LCD computer such as it is. And I may restore this someday. So if you all want to see it restored. I do. Yes. <laughs> if... <laughs> yes, very good. So, okay. Oh, go ahead. No, that, I was um, just going to say, it, we'll, we'll, if right? you don't help me restore oh, this, we'll yeah, shoot hey, this hey. going. What are the chip replacement towers mostly made of? Uh, General 7400 series parts and ROM? Oh, question mark? LS, L LS okay. parts and PALs and PLAs, but they they were the bitchinest, hottest parts we could get. They had F parts in them. I used, uh, it, I know Dave did too, advanced shot key, shot key, and LS if we didn't need the, the high speeds. Because yeah. we're trying to emulate what's in, happening inside a chip, you know, it, 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 without leaving one pin and going in another pin and all those packages. So, yeah. Yeah, we were allowed to break all the rules. I mean, you could warm your hands on one of those things. Yeah, we uh, for for the six for for early earlier Amiga stuff, we were using uh, most mostly uh, mo mostly um, pals um, yep. down to like five nanosecond pals, which cost a fortune, but we didn't care. <laughs> we make three or four Crash towers. can full of pals. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> later on, when they were doing some of the uh, CD thirty two stuff. Where they uh, they were actually using FPGAs, but like prototyping FPGAs, not production FPGAs. You could spend two hundred, four hundred, six hundred dollars for one chip, but it would actually be able to emulate something a little bit more complicated. And then right. they, and so like we, for for the CD32, they were implementing part of the 8520 in a uh, in in a FPGA in, in a new design, and they wanted to make sure because, of course, one of the one of the wonderful things about old Commodore chips is sometimes there were bugs in there that became part of the hardware description, and if you didn't get it right, things failed. Yeah. Our bugs define the the feature set of yeah. the industry. So, yeah. who did the CD32, Dave? Was that a uh, was that Beth and Headley, or who 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 were? Uh, Beth was involved, I think. Um, Beth Richards. Who else? Yeah, who else was involved? I mean, I, I know Headley. Headley kind of started that whole CD thing. I, I, I was Headley so. Headley Davis I, of Xbox fame. Yeah. Yeah, and there are a few. There are a few other people. Um, All right, I was just curious. Right. So, next maybe. question. Um, yeah. Uh, this is not in any particular order, but this might be a quick one. <laughs> Dave, Dave, were you at Amiga before Commodore? No, I was a Commodore before Amiga. Who hired you, Dave? Ex explain uh, that Bill a little Hurt bit. Because I know, so, yeah, I, I don't know the timeline exactly at that Bill, point. Bill in Hurt. So, so I was I was at working at General Electric and very unhappy there and uh, kind of protesting the fact that the, all the college kids who came in with me started fading into the background looking like they belonged at, a, at had wor working at General Electric for like 20 years in about a course of months. So I had... And also, they were working on nuclear weapons that I didn't want to. I went there for space shuttle. <laughs> didn't get to work on space shuttle, so I I sent out a resume and um and and uh, 
a week later, less than a week later, they called me in for an interview and I just happened to be wearing a homemade shirt that day. Went to this headhunter yeah. place in Philly and uh, I met this guy, John Lennon looking guy, because he had the long hair and the round glasses um, in the lobby. And I'm like, and he's like, hey, you here for an interview? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, uh, how about you? And he's like, yeah, kind of. <laughs> and uh, so then I went in and met the suit, Joe Krizuki, and you know, we spoke for a little while. And then he brings me into the room where Bill was and like, hey, we've already met. And he asked me about, uh, I think he asked me about um, diodes for swing limiting in front of op amps and a few other technical yeah. things. And, and um, oh, yeah, he asked me That's, if I knew how to do S, plant, S or Laplace transforms. Be, and I started to write something. He's like, oh, I just want to make sure you knew because I don't. <laughs> right. And right. It was, at the time, at least. And and um, then uh, like a day or two later, they uh, they invited me out to uh, uh, Commodore in Westchester. And um, I basically accepted right on the spot. And uh, the rest was history. Now, Dave, weren't you? I have a memory of you in the MOS building with me. Did did you ever work there or did we just go back there? We just someday? went back there. No, I no, I I, okay. I started at the end of October in 83 where, where you guys have pretty much just recently just not moved. Here, not just moved, but pretty recently moved over there to, yeah. to Westchester. Okay. Yeah, we, we right. were back we were at MOS a couple times for things. Oh yeah. I, I loved going there. Go mm -hmm. poke the dragon. <laughs> I, I'd like to just take this opportunity since you guys both just said MOS several times. That's one of my pet peeves is when people call it Moss. And I, you know, not that it's so horrible, but let's get the history right. What do you guys think? I mean, I've never heard any Commodore employees call it Moss. It's MOS, correct? Well, now well, there was well, CSG. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> no, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> And I never knew it as CSG, but there was a Moss Tech, and there were some other Mosses that that said it yeah. that way. So you had to say MOS if you meant MOS technology. So for us, it was a mnemonic of say, and I also say CBM instead of Commodore, mostly because I used to. It's easier to type, you know. So I would <laughs> we got in the habit of typing CBM. It's there funny. Well, while I always said MOS for the company. I still say MOSFET. <laughs> yeah, well, MOSFET yeah. as a as a device is a yeah. MOSFET, but yeah. the company in in Norristown is yeah. MOS. Uh, anyway. You know, it wouldn't bother me either way, but that's how we always said it. Well, what yeah. bothers me is the guys that are on YouTube making all this great stuff about Commodore, but then they're getting the name wrong. So I think if they're going to re record it for posterity, so let's get it the, right. If you're on the internet, you have to argue about something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I could contribute then. Actually. Uh, Dave, this is for you. This is a little bit long. I didn't read the whole thing beforehand, so forgive me if I fumble through it. Um, the A3640 uh, with the Amiga 68040 CPU board mm -hmm. has a, quote, fun circuit lifted from a Motorola application note. It looked like a real pain to design. I found a Usenet post of yours from 91 explaining the Motorola bus adapter design, and he puts a link. Um, was this when you were in the throes of the A3640 design? Was it as painful to design as it looks? Uh, there were also some backwards caps on that board, but maybe that was Greg Berlin's fault. No, 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 no. We're, we'll talk about the caps, but keep asking your question. Well, that, was, that was it. That was it. That was it. Okay, well... For me, the A3640 was a piece of cake because I didn't design it. Um, at the, uh, at basically at the end of the, well, not even the end, but about halfway through the A3000 project, um, we started looking around for, um, the, the 68040 wasn't out yet, but we managed to hire a guy with 68040 experience anyway, Scott Schaefer. So we brought Scott Schaefer in and he actually designed the first Commodore 040 board, uh, which was, so at the, at the Amiga 3000 introduction in April of 1990, we had the behind the scenes, big fat 68,040 board, which, which also had um, some, re, some small amount of L2 cache on it, 
Um, it had a faster bus translator. It was this thing that Scott had worked on basically since the day we brought him in the door. And it ran, um, it ran Amiga Unix and all this stuff. Um, we wanted to show it off at the uh, A3000 introduction. And um, first Motorola said no, because at that point, they had been the only people on the planet to show an operating system running on the O40. Eventually, they said yes. Not only that, they couriered over the golden O40 we were supposed to use to show it. And then at the very last minute, our management said, you're not going to show that because then we're going to have to make it or something stupid. Then you'll have to make it. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't so, want to hurt future sales. So let's not sell anything at all. Yeah. yeah I'm glad yeah. I wasn't there when you guys were doing that stuff. That would have. I'd, I'd have had to kill somebody. Oh, we, we were we were royally pissed off because everybody worked so hard to get them to say yes. <laughs> and, yeah. um, so the A3640 board was a different thing. So um, there was this project after um, new management had taken over, let's say, in 91. And um, the Amiga 3000 Plus was basically tabled. And we had this other thing that was really cool that was tabled. And... They said, well, why don't you make some A3000 Junior products with uh, without SCSI and with other cost reductions? And and so Greg Berlin and Scott Schaefer were working on the what they were dubbing the A2200 and the A3400. And at the time, they were going to run O30s. And we knew in 19, these were going to be out in 1992. And they said, well, 1992, you cannot just have the O30. So... Greg Berlin told Scott Schaefer, hey, make the cheapest 68,040 board known to mankind. <laughs> and uh, I, I can hear him doing that. that. Yeah, and so Scott Schaefer made the cheapest 68,040 board for our, 60, for our sort of 68,030 yeah. bus. Um, and, and, and by this time, the yeah. Commodore can't make the chips that you're using, right? You're going so fast. That you're oh, having to, oh, to oh, get CMOS oh, gate. Oh, these high speed logic and um O40. But it was, you know, it's it's a big board. It's got a lot of you know, a lot of discrete yeah. a lot of PLDs on it, basically, and and buffer chips because you have to do various buffering between the two you, buffers. You, you, right. You end up uh right, pipelining and stuff. So, yeah, so well, real quick, a little capacitors bit board, that are but... backwards. It, Okay. So, so yeah. I'll ask this question, to everybody. If you see a capacitor and it's got a black mark on it, is that the positive lead or the negative lead? Negative. And the, and the answer is it could no be either. Knows. Oh, that's true. Right. It could be either. It could be either. I, it depends I'm on wrong. the manufacturer. And in other words, when read the we were manufacturing. Carefully. Yes, and when we were assembling in America, I don't think we knew uh, ChemCon was backwards. Things like that. Chemicon. Chemicon, yeah. Uh, it was a follow-up to the Commodore Amiga history. So somebody wanted to know, asked you about you being there before Amiga, whatever. He said, so Amiga existed before it merged with Commodore. Is that correct? Yeah. Amiga, yes. Amiga was founded as a startup company in like 82 or 83. It was originally called High Toro. And... Um, it, they changed the name to Amiga. They were they were making a they made a couple of cool little toys called the there was a little tiny little tiny fits in your hand joystick. Uh, they they had a product I don't know if it actually ever shipped called the Joyboard. Um, this was all to 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 fund their video game project, and they weren't actually making a video game, but they were selling it as a video game because they wanted money, and that was a good year to get dentists and other people to invest in a video game and um that so so they were uh they were in in 83 84 they were running low on money and um they had gotten a loan from and a then talk. yeah i was gonna say and then we got into the ugly times that it de that are very uh it depends which side you're on atari or a commodore <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. So, 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 so if pe yeah. people, if, if, if they don't know, Dave worked on the C116, 216, 264, 364, C16, 232, C128, <laughs> and the Alpha unit for that. <laughs> so, so he I did do a lot of Commodore before stuff that. before the Amiga. Yeah. And the, uh, and the, and the Ted Super cartridge. <laughs> and the Ted Super cartridge. 
<laughs> now I was going to hold this question till later, but it seems like it fits in right now. Um, Bob Roswell asks, what could Commodore have done differently to survive till today? Uh, not lose Jack Tramiel. You know, that's what I thought too. Is it really, that's, is it that simple? Not that that's a Jack simple Jack may answer. not have survived till today, but that was our best, that was our best choice. And we lost our way so significantly. Uh, Dave and I are from that small group of people that knew what was work to work with Jack, to, for Jack Tamell, and then after Jack Tamell left. And it, it was night and day. Yeah. And, 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 sure. and, you know, Dave and I carried on with that same, uh, those that that quality you needed of not not taking excuses and taking no no quarter and the new commodore was like boy you guys need to shut up and sit down wait wait you're making us look bad getting the stuff done at three in the morning now they you know that was that wasn't actually much that was a thing for a little while but it kind of went away like you know all those the middle managers and the all that stuff that was happening kind of around that time they they all eventually left they they killed their their host yeah they were, a, a, they were a bad parasite out. yeah they, they were all kicked out and it did bounce back but later on um i'd say the thing is we were we were moving into an area where you needed more investment in r d you just did yeah and to keep because you know it was like you know commodore commodore is kind of doing you know commodore is competing against atari and apple and a couple of their small companies when you know what's what's you know, once we were getting into the Amiga stuff, we were starting to compete with IBM and, you know, and, and you know, and Apple was growing and, you know, to really and, stay. And meanwhile, uh, you're locked in a, in in it with Atari. You both are you, you're trying to divide for the same dinner. Yeah, well, yeah, a little bit. But, you you uh, might not. We, we didn't feel that way. But looking back, there was IBM getting its inroads. Meanwhile, Atari and Commodore are tangling with each other and IBM slowly eating our lunch. Yeah. Yeah. You know, IBM was a factor, but they, but IBM and MS DOS really hadn't become yeah. enough of a factor by the time. Commodore Not when died. I was there. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't take them seriously died. back then. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, you know, we basically, if, you know, if they had, I guess our best bet forward in the Amiga era would have been if they took it more seriously, invested when they should have, so that rather taking three years for a AAA chipset that okay. never got finished, it could have happened in a year and a half or two years. That started in 1988, by the way. We started working on our 64-bit architecture, which is what that was. Wow, that sounds cool. You know? In, in 1980, <laughs> freaking eight, and by 1992, when I was working on the prototypes, um, you know, it w we got first silicon, I think, really in 1993, and Commodore was already in financial trouble then, and we didn't get a rev. We got a couple parts that were fibbed in order to work. Thousand dollars <laughs> a chip, uh, right? And uh, that was pretty much where it was left. They were they were not letting me fix things and you know not making not paying the right not letting me make the new boards and there's just all this stuff was going wrong at that time. Um, but you know that was the product of the fact that they were you know they were paying you know I mean I hate to say it but it's true that you know uh, a bunch of the people in upper management were, were getting three million dollar a year salary and bonus, which was more money than the president all, all of, of or Apple got yeah. considerably more. So, you know, the money was going to the wrong places within the company. Now you can say there are other things they did wrong, like marketing and everything. But honestly, if you don't have the right thing to sell, no one's going to buy it, no matter how good you are at selling. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. they the thing that started out as a, you know, as, as you know, we were, you know, Amiga came along and that was something no one had ever seen. And it was, it was better, you know, it was multitasking. It was, it had hardware graphics acceleration. It was doing all these things that, you know, eventually became important to other companies. Um, unfortunately, they squandered that lead. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, if you don't keep it up, no one's going to buy your stuff. I mean, the, you know, there was, there were a few outside factors like, you know, we had the gaming market in Europe for a long time, but um, piracy started becoming a real factor in selling, in, in people being interested in writing code for Amiga. You know, there were, there were guys in Germany who wrote a, 
you know, a game that, you know, everybody in Germany had and they'd sold 50 copies. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we, you know, the CD32 and the CD TV were kind of the idea of here's how we fix that. But they, you know, is that all kind of happened after, you know, after things were already being broken, if not already broken at Commodore. Yeah, that was one of the, the things that I wanted to do as a um, exhibit um, is that the, the war between the copy protection and the pirates, it was like a back and forth battle. I would love to like do like uh, some research on that because that was just like a very interesting time where like, you know, they're, they're like, who's going to crack this, this one first and the copy protection programs trying to defeat the protection and then, and then trying to make it harder and, and so forth back and forth. All right. It, Jeff, quick, next uh, time we get together, I, we'll, we'll have to talk some stories because there's definitely some. Uh, Commodore was one of the biggest pirates of its own software, but that's for a different day. <laughs> all right, great. Yeah, I'll, I'll remember and that. Jeff, we're okay. FBI going came time, in. I'll tell you off. off <laughs> we got plenty more questions. I just want to double check the clock. Uh, so we're, for, we're good to keep going. If you are, I got a good list here. You guys good? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Bill, regarding the 128 specifically, I think this one one guy sent us four questions. Number one, do you know why Commodore refused to make a variant of the SFD 1001 drive for the 128? It would have been quite useful to have one megabyte on a cheap uh, five and a quarter floppy. Right. Yeah. Uh, I only ever saw one or two of those drives myself. Uh, Fred Bone would have had one. Um, it just it, it wasn't a, a product in production. Certainly wasn't worth trying to uh, change one of our new designs to. I liked it, though. What he's talking about is one it had a 488 uh, interface on the back right. of it. Yeah. Which made total sense, especially given the speed of our serial bus. <laughs> yeah. So. Those those things are extremely rare and and they fetch a pretty penny they are, they, yeah. uh, these days they're like several hundred dollars easy uh okay number two does do you know why the 128 is limited to 128 uh ram 128k of ram while its mmu could have handled 256 why didn't they just leave room for further expansion and just cut off the mmu ability to work with 256k his name's Joe Krizuki, and he was my boss, and he stepped in and uh, made the decision to not throw the final mask at the chip. So the chip was designed to be 512K, um, and he, 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 he urinated on the project. That's all I can tell you. He made a decision. And you've heard it, for, you've heard it here, the truth in the matter. Okay, very good. Thanks, Bill. Uh, do you know why the 128D release in 87 also missed 256K RAM? Were there any movements inside Commodore toward expanding the C128 memory? Uh, is that a similar question or something different? No, I wasn't there. And, you know, the 128 was only made to sell for one year. We were just trying to patch a bump in the hole in the road until the Amiga arrived. Right. So the concept yeah. that four years later we'd be adding RAM to it, that's that's just kind of a meandering computer trying to find its way to a slow death, it sounds like to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had we actually um, uh, it after it was after Bill left, but I, I was sort of left as the senior eight bit guy. At, uh, how old was I? <laughs> I'll bet. I wrote my my not quite mid twenties yet, and uh, wow. Frank Leia was still there, and so we were we were doing some dog and pony shows, basically trying to sell management on doing something more in that area. Because what else was I going to do? I wasn't on any other project. So, so we made a we actually yeah. made we made two prototypes hand stitched <laughs> um one was a c256 which used the 256k wow. mu and the other one was a uh was a z80 machine that ran the full cycle not the half cycle with the 80 column chip so you could oh, run right it, right you right, could run it in full right. four megahertz and we presented these to management and they kind of looked at it and yawned and um we uh yeah we then proceeded, and then went back to not selling Amigas correctly. Yeah, 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 because they hadn't they hadn't really figured out the Amiga thing yet. Um, because right. this was <laughs> they actually, never did. <laughs> well, they did. I mean, the the Amiga five hundred was the proper way to sell an Amiga for. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, you know, and that and that was mostly Jeff Porter. I mean, 
yeah, George Robbins designed it, but Jeff Porter was the one who was getting all who the heralded it. Yeah, you know, you know, who went you know went over there and busted chops and got the thing to cost, you know, in the same ballpark as you know the one twenty eight had cost him. Right so, for for know, its I, technology, yeah, yeah, and it was also the one single flat thing with add ons that every bean counter at Commodore and every salesperson at Con Commodore could understand because it wasn't you couldn't just immediately hand an Amiga to a Commodore salesman and he would know what to do with it because it was a completely different thing and it was just you know they needed they needed years of learning how to do that Commodore had to learn how to do it Commodore had to build the proper kind of technical support group they had to build the developer support group all that happened but it took time Great right. thoughts. Next just, question. Yeah, next question. Uh, Bill, would you would you call or would you say that the 264 was Jack Tremiel's project? Oh, yeah. The whole family was a concept. Um, Jack felt he had done the Apple killer with the C64, and he wanted the Timex Sinclair killer and a small and, and a cheap business machine. And so the TED family came about. TED means text display. And the 264, the 116, and the talking 364, along with Magic Desk. Yes, we had a desk motif before other people did, though you don't hear about it. Um, but his thought was the whole family. And so after Jack Tramiel left, Commodore didn't know what to do. And they picked out the 264, turned it into the plus four, and they threw the rest in the trash. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And the big problem is you look at that plus four software, it was horrible. But the they had already developed really good versions of that kind of thing for the LCD machine. They weren't finished, yeah. but if you know, the Commodore ended up buying that because they because nobody there knew what they were doing on these things. But well, they, they didn't they didn't talk to engineering, yeah. the marketing bought yeah. that. And, yeah. and yeah. I, I dare say they're not qualified to buy software. To, right, to, to right. And that, so, so they didn't know what they were selling. And yeah, and the software may not even be that bad. It's just not worth two hundred dollars. Yeah, right. Not uh, nineteen eighty dollars at least. Yeah. Again, well, I mean, the, the thing that we understood, you know, from the LCD stuff is you could have done this really, really well. <laughs> uh, Again, Al Segan's questions, but uh, since we're talking TED, the question is, what's this? What is the TED Super Cartridge? And then a continuation of that question. Um, also speaking of the TED series, can Dave or Bill speak to how close Magic Desk 2 came to being released for the TED machines? So it, super, I, it, TED Super the, Cartridge and The Magic software Desk. died the moment Jack Trammell left. Mm -hmm. I'll let Dave talk to the Super Cartridge, but that was the death toll. I mean... We got back and they didn't even ask us to put make sure stuff fit in boxes. You know, it's just like, no, we're not doing it. Yeah. So the super cartridge, if you look, you know, if you look inside the TED, and we did kind of the same thing on the C128. You've got this ROM banking scheme to allow you to have multiple different things at different times, right? Well, the super cartridge did basically took that same circuitry and put it in a cartridge. So rather than have one set of ROMs in the cartridge, you could have four sets of ROMs in the cartridge. We had a, a double decker board that did that. And um, there was, there were really only, I think there were like two or three boards made. And there was one case because I actually went into the room late at night, into the lab late at night and took two regular TED cartridges and a soldering iron and some saws <laughs> and, and basically built my own, uh, super cartridge case that looked like small TED cases, uh, melted them together. Then I put in some <laughs> epoxy filler, sanded it all down, spray painted it. And it looked like, it looks like the regular TED cartridge only, it looked like a regular TED cartridge that had gotten pregnant. Wow, geez, I, I'd love to have seen that. Well, you know, I mean, I was a kid. I was like, okay, what can I do about this tonight? <laughs> I don't yeah. want to wait until tomorrow. To we had energy. <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> it sounds like when I used them. Once the super cartridge worked, and that was like I think that was the first project that Bill had given me all by myself. So <laughs> that's that's great. Um, okay, very little talk of software. 
for example, in ROM, were the teams separated? Do you guys, hardware and software guys, not really talk to each nah, other? Nah, we, we, we couldn't, we talked to each other every couple minutes some days. We used to shoot nerf darts at each other. <laughs> yeah, no, it's something like this. We were in tight synchronization. You don't hear about the programmers, but I'll tell you, uh, for the 128, the real father of the C128 is a guy named Fred Bowen who did the kernel in that, which would make me the mother of the 128. And I can <laughs> worse than that. Um, but we don't hear about the programmers as much because everybody can see and feel and hold a computer. I love the color of an Atari 800, uh, but I know very little about the guy that wrote the kernel in there, right? Yeah. So it, it's 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 kind of it's been unfair to the programmers. They they were brilliant. Hard working, yeah. yeah. and here's the the thing: was we said we will meet you in the valley three days from now at sunrise, and boom, we would all be there. Right? <laughs> They'd have their code, we'd have our PLAs and our hardware, and we just knew we could count on each other. We we knew we'd be in the right place at the right time. And what one of the things I got out of Commodore was I had already kind of figured this out when I because I came in there. That was my it was my second job out of college, but it was, I'd been at another job for four months, uh, which the one I didn't like and Bill hired me out of, yeah. and, you know, and I am forever He's writing ready. missile code. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, so I had, um, I had gone to school for uh, uh, electrical engineering, computer science and cognitive psychology, because I could just, why, why major yeah. in one thing, why major in one thing when you can do like all kinds of stuff. And so when I, when I started, got a job at general electric um they had they it was the biggest high they had hired like 13 people at this office and it's the biggest hire than they had done in ages and we were the only people in the company who were allowed to touch hardware and software and i'm like what sort of madness is this yeah, i mean that's, I, you know, that's why they wanted that was your clue but, right but it made no that was sense. your clue it made no sense that you have this gigantic wall you can't even see it because it goes past my camera of, uh, of a, a wall between hardware and software people. If you're designing a system, you, you build it out of little blocks on a piece of paper somewhere. And some of those might involve software and some of those might be all hardware. And if you take that same system design five years into the future, those blocks might be different things, but it's all the same shit, you know? <laughs> so, you know, I don't know, you know, I when I got to Commodore, you know, that's how things were run. So I said, oh, you know, I knew I had found my home there because everyone was doing engineering the right way, building computers yeah. the right way, which was the thing I had figured out, but apparently General Electric hadn't. And, you know, yeah. I over the years, I felt good about that. <laughs> and and we really did do some of that better to seek, you know, seek forgiveness later. We we didn't, we, we didn't try and have a committee to have a committee meeting, you yeah. know. What not? That's, that's good. Um, okay, now, Bill, I'm going to read this on just the messenger. So the way this is worded, I don't know. Uh, I've had no uh, luck. Do we know the address of who is? <laughs> because like, we can Gadget drive today. by and shoot out his porch light, you know? Yeah, all I know is Gadget today. He says, I've had no luck getting bank switching working on the 128 in Z80 mode. Is it supposed to work? The page mapping works in Z80 mode. So. I, I'm actually lost there. I don't know what that's saying, but it says, is it supposed to work? Is bank switching supposed to work in Z80 mode? Yeah, everybody but you got it working. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> the Z80 re relied on the 128 to manage the MMU and the kernel for it. And I honestly, all these 30 years later, don't know how you could tell it to do these convoluted bankings and still have somebody to talk to after it did the banking for the Z80. Z80 didn't have the wherewithal of the 6502, you know, who knew about all 256K. So the Z80 was really a kludge uh, above, above everything else. It was an add-on kludge for, for a different reason altogether. And so if it doesn't work, it doesn't surprise me if that one thing doesn't work. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, that's, I can't add anything to that. <laughs> yeah, we are lucky to get it work. We, we really were. It, yeah. That could have been the thing where we sat there and said, yeah, we could have sold 8 million, but instead we sold 100,000 because dang Z80 wouldn't work right. You know, <laughs> and we're all out of jobs and, uh, you know. 
A uh, quick one just came in, and I'm going to read it the way it's written. Can I ask Dave what college he went to? Can we ask you that, Dave? You can. I went to Carnegie Mellon University. Oh, all right. We had a math, a which simultaneous you... math and uh, EE. Yeah, it was it was EE um, with math because back then you couldn't actually major in computer science. You had to major in computer science with a math tract. And I also made I was also majoring in cognitive psychology up to the point where I couldn't fit it all in and didn't want to spend any more time in college. <laughs> so uh, that was uh, I had to I had to I, I had to get a lab. I was already I was overloading like every semester. Um, I was taking summer courses occasionally, but like good ones, like I took a course at Rutgers in, in science fiction to count as one of my humanities so, courses. <laughs> The reason there Dave was taking cognitive psychology is he was trying to invent a robot that didn't want to kill all humans. Actually, and well, so I, was, you know, I, I hadn't decided if I was good or evil at that point. I was, you know, right, but I right. Was, None of us had, <laughs> you know. But um, yeah, it was artificial intelligence was was bigger in the cog psych in the cog psych department at that time than it was in the computer science department. I had courses right. in both, and I was working and I took courses in robotics, so I sort of wanted to build intelligent machines. Right. It was just. It was. I was about thirty years too early, but. <laughs> yeah. And the the questioner thanks you, Dave, for that answer. Um, now this is a this is a little bit of a interesting concept. This question, very curious about your differentiation. Different. Oh boy, I could say that word. Differentiation about personal computers and home computers. Ah. So, so how, how home, do you even wrap your head around that? We, we, we hadn't even heard of PC basically as an IBM-based thing. A home computer was those things that you took home and put on your television set. And, you know, if you tell a kid these days, we used to use our computer on the TV, they'd mean, what, you set it on top? No, we, the TV was our monitor. And that, to me, is kind of how you tell a home computer is, well, did it have a channel three, channel four switch box on the back of it? <laughs> yeah. So that to me is the difference between, so I'll, I'll never say, oh, we, we swung, I'll say the Atari swung at the PC thing, but what I did was home computers. Yeah. There was also hobby computer. That's the one where you sort of had to build things. Yeah, right? like Ohio Scientific, I'd call a hobby computer. Yeah, or, or the Heath kit. They had, a, yeah. they had the LSI 11 kit. You know, you basically, you know, even if you bought something that was kind of all together, you probably had to buy a bunch of other stuff to make it do that something. Rainbow, yeah. But you had it at home. Eleven seventy three Vax. Yeah, yeah. There were a lot of those that happened before the take it home, plug it into your TV, and it just works. Yeah. Okay. I actually thought that comp question was more complicated than that, but you wrapped it up very clean, <laughs> very cleanly there. Thanks. Oh, good, good. Um, okay, was there an arrangement with Infocom to market the game Trinity with the 128? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, if it was in the box, then yes. Where's if, that if cricket when we need it? We had this annoying cricket. In yeah, I was waiting for the cricket. You yeah. know? But no, if it was in the box, then clearly they did. Um, they they didn't talk to me by by that time about stuff like that. Okay. Um, about the Amiga sidecar, were there ever plans to make it to make an AT version of that? Um, I don't know. Um, they 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 had looked at making. I I think the sidecar probably not. The bridge board they did. Um, they. I, I don't even remember if it w hit the market or not, but they, you know, the the thing was that when when we were doing the the reason that the Amiga 2000 came out the way it did was because that that the German group that had done the sidecar was working on building something with slots that they could drop the IBM card into, and it just so happened that our uh, our vice president of engineering Henry Rubin loved the idea of the bridge card, so. Um, <laughs> So yeah, they they did some advanced work on the bridge card, but eventually they got tired of doing that. But there was a good bridge card story. So when I was working on the Amiga 3000, um, I had an early version of the Buster chip, which controls the bus and also does this 
68,030 to 68,000 translation for Zora 2 cards and stuff. And and um, we got the new version in that was supposed to fix a bunch of problems, and it fixed a bunch of problems, but the bridge card didn't work. And Henry was all a panic because the bridge card didn't work. And um, we were going to summon some Germans to the United States to get to come out and fix the bridge card or to figure out why it wasn't working. And I was, I was, they were, they were coming and I was like, I have, I had to go and get some dentistry or something done. You can see me with my, my dentistry is always an issue. I broke another tooth. Um, you know, you, you know, you don't want to be one of those people who lives life without uh, damaging your body all the way through because otherwise you can live a boring life. Anyway, I had to go and get some teeth work done. So I, so I got into my stupid little plastic car. I had a Fiero. I'm driving like 90 miles an hour down the highway. <laughs> it was about as fast as it would go. Uh, thinking about nothing much, listening to loud rock music, and all of a sudden it dawns on me why the bridge card didn't work. And I still have to go and get why my... Why didn't it work? Well, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> I um, But for the record, a, drive, got, a fast drive down the road I makes your brain work better. Done, decided to go back to the <laughs> the adrenaline. Brilliant idea. I got there. Apparently the Germans had been there and decided to go to their hotel rooms and get all set up and everything. And they were going to come back later. So I said, okay, took the, took the actual bridge card, made a few little modifications, put it back in, started right up. Um, I, uh, ran, I got this, you know, I got booted DOS. I wrote a script that basically just said it works now and left it in a loop and went back home. And so they came back from dinner and saw this thing running and didn't, had I, you know, there's no other indication of why it had, and that was kind of a, that was basically a poke at Henry, like you didn't really need to summon Germans from across the sea to come and fix this thing, because I was perfectly capable of fixing it myself. But basically, it was, it was, if you want to know, the Zora 2, we had two different ways of doing uh, weight states on the Zora 2 bus, and um, that version of the buster ship um, had a disagreement with the bridge card about how the X ready signal was going to work. So I turned it into a, a um, I turned into an OVR. I turned it yeah. in, well, X ready delay DTAC and OVR let you ride, drive your own DTAC. So I set it to OVR, right. and drove my own DTAC, and then it worked fine. Yeah. You, see, you notice my ears perked up when we got to wait states. That, that's the kind of <laughs> stuff we live yeah. for. Yeah. So the X ready signal all was about balance. Speed. Oh, X ready signal is a way to add to just say go and add D, go and add weight states without having to worry about driving your own DTAC. An OVR let you right. drive your own DTAC. So a few more coming in. So I got an email from uh, our Amiga Bill here who's who's sitting with us uh, in the chat. His partner Amiga Anthony emailed <laughs> just to refresh his memory as best I can. I believe, and I can't fully be sure, since at the time I was trying to find a way to escape the room with both of them in the doorway, that right. Greg Greg Berlin said it. Greg Berlin said he's wrong about the caps in the audio circuit in the Amiga 4000. Then laughed and said it might actually be right. Were you there? Do you remember this? Oh yeah, I remember that uh, very very clearly. I was there. And Yep, Anthony was giving a uh, talk about how to repair your, you know, basic repair on your Amiga 4000. And, 4000. Uh, yep, exactly. And uh, he was there giving the talk, and then um, he was talking about the caps being backwards, and uh, and Bill was in the room, and you know, we noticed that Bill had just like exited really quick. And a few moments later, uh, Bill returns to the room, and uh, and then with this, a six this, foot eight guy this, yeah, behind this huge, me, this huge guy, and with a really deep voice, and he's like, uh. He's like, what are you saying about my caps? <laughs> <laughs> and Anthony, yeah. Anthony turned and saw like who it was. It was Greg Berlin, and uh, he he really wanted to jump out that window. It was uh, it was a heart attack moment for Anthony because there's a. Uh, oh, I didn't know he had done the four. So I went outside. And I said, Greg, and he's like, Ugh. And I'm like, did you do the four thousand? He goes, mm, Yeah, yeah. All right, come <laughs> with me. So the part of it was I didn't even know he did it till that day, and I'm like, Well, come with me. We're going to have some fun. He could have blamed yeah. on me. About the only thing I worked on in the four thousand was the uh, Zora bus and the, uh, and the audio. Yeah, yeah. Greg was Greg needed. He actually I worked on the mute circuit because he was trying to do some digital thing to make it mute, and I just put this analog circuit in there and said, "Yeah, it's it's okay. It's it's like uh, I remember that. Down. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's not muted, no, but it's, it's you know 
Tan It'll tantalums would would tantalums and electrolytics would all be having problems today, no matter what. So yeah, yeah. it's not just the oh, backwards. Yeah. No, everything, you know, every cap on those boards was you know it's they're, 30 they're, years old. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah, and they're like if you look at the official specs, it gets you really really scared because they're rated for like 20 or 30 two or two thousand three thousand hours or something like that yeah yeah yep now, i know you made a couple of videos that day did you catch this incident on video we actually have the exact moment uh when it happened we do on video. Okay. Yeah, so, pretty classic. so the the youtube <laughs> channel is tomorrow. guru meditation right guru yeah, meditation, guru meditation yep. it's uh amiga bill and amiga anthony's awesome amiga youtube channel like this this guy's a genius with behind the camera and in other ways too happy to know him so you can catch up on some of that detail in uh live oh thanks chris i appreciate that it. once uh once we're talking about anthony you know uh, anthony is the proud owner of a very rare piece of commodore history he's got a commodore 65 and i'm wondering if uh either bill or dave uh, worked on the commodore 65 and uh what commodores uh for the Commodore 65. Go ahead, Dave. I, I did not work on the Commodore 65. That was <clears throat> that was this we <coughs> weird project that just seemed to happen. And <clears throat> I don't know all the reasons behind it, but part of the reason was there was this chip designer in the chip group called Bill Gardai, and yeah. uh, nobody wanted to work with him. Yeah. For various reasons. Heard. The only reason, so I don't know, I was not in the chip group, but um, I ran into Bill Gardai in the weirdest way. Um, I used to write articles for magazines, and usually they'd send me something like a compiler and say, write an article about this compiler. And they sent me a C++ compiler once. I think it was Amiga Century that sent, it's either Amiga Century or, or Amiga World. Um, they wanted me to write an article on this. So it's like usually when I got new lang computer language, I'd try to write a good program in it. And it just so happened that I was working on the Buster chip. I think it was the I think it was the A3000 Buster chip. And uh, I was looking at these log tables of numbers, or I could look at them in graphics on the VAX using a terminal emulator. And none of this made any sense because in my lab, I had this wonderful $50,000 logic analyzer that used a Macintosh as a display. And you could see everything and it was real fast and everything. So I said, I'm gonna make something like that that reads these tables of numbers that come off the VAX simulator. And I wrote this thing in like a weekend and put it out. And it was actually designed specifically for Headley high-res terminals because we all had Headley high-res terminals at the time. And um, a few days later, I heard there was this big screaming mess happening over in the chip group because of this. Well, apparently, the terminal emulator that you could use to see your graph, your, your waveforms when you're running the simulator was written by Bill Gardai. And anytime he got pissed off, it stopped working. <laughs> so he had this little bit of power and uh, I had inadvertently given them a way to not to that, for that not to be power anymore. <laughs> Here's, this is what happens when you ask a C65 question. Yeah, I, you know, I, the only thing I, the only other thing I know about a C65 is I saw a, I saw a, a couple of guys in Germany making a C65 clone, but not having the full specifications. And they hit me up and said, what do you know about the C65? And I said, well, I, I have this friend, Fred, who, who, who. Yeah, Fred was on designers, And that's all, all, about all I know about it. Uh, I, oh, I actually, I did. I, I helped, uh. I helped them fix a C65 keyboard just because uh, Randall Jessup had a C65 with a weird keyboard thing, and he was thinking about selling it so he could put his daughter through college. <laughs> so so I, I I did finally understand the C65. It was after VCF West, and uh, was it Scott? Who who was the main guy on Dave on the C65? The main hardware guy. Um, but he. You tell me his name when you think about it. So, but yeah, he, he, he was adamant. He said, because I said, was there a niche for this thing cost wise? And he said, yes, it tucked up underneath the Amiga in a place where an 8 bit would normally fit. And when somebody from Commodore says that, I usually believe him because we knew what we were talking about when we were yeah. talking about quantities and 
and so market guys, issues. And keep stuff. um keep elaborating on that because the question mm -hmm. in the in the chat is C sixty five question mark. Mm -hmm. So what just yeah. what is it? Well, so Fred Bowen, it, it was an 8-bit computer that came along 10 years after the 128. It had dual SIDs, and did it, did it have a, it had an Amiga chip in it, right? No, it had it, its own chip, its own, like, Vic 4. Vic or it had yeah. a Vic-like thing that could do 8-bit graphics. So the, the story, the way I hear it is, they used it to keep the engineers busy so that they could sell the company with the engineers still working there. Yeah, and we, we, that's exactly. why that's why there's so many C65s as they were doing runs of 20 and 50 of them. Whereas like when Dave and I would do like the 128, we might do three boards at a time before we're ready for another rev. Not wow. certainly not yeah, hundreds. They, they, they were they were actually getting some pretty decent chip resources. Of course, they were really small chips and Commodore could yeah. make them. But so had, no, I I learned to like the sixty five though, but that that was yeah. that was they years had, later when I learned to like had, it. Had the forty five oh two processor in it that had some of Headley's new instructions. They had a Z yep. registered. <laughs> and and Bowen Bowen's good at what he does too. So oh, yeah, and and, I, and actually, the hardware guy knew what he was doing. Uh, so Fred, it, Fred, it, Fred it was mostly the, about whether the Commodore was going to follow through or not, and the answer was they didn't. So yeah, and that wasn't a surprise. Fred, Fred's actually in my company today. Yeah. Yeah. So is Andy Finkel. Wow. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. Andy, there, there's yeah. a whole group we, of them out there. We we sort of we sort of like working with each other. What can I say? <laughs> That's good. Yeah, All I'd right. like to imagine if Andy Finkel was on this conversation. Okay, uh, another question. I'll get if, you, Andy, one day. Yeah. I'll good. Get Andy. Yeah, I, Let's I, do that. You, don't let me miss that for sure. And he's actually, and he's been getting kind of back into it. He's been publishing all yeah. kinds of stuff on Facebook, all these, all these old notes. We'll, we'll get Andy for the next one. And yeah. Andy Finkel for everybody is Good. he was the head of the games group when I got there and went on to become head of the Amiga software development. Yep. Yep. Great. Guy. And Andy's one of our sages. He knows where the bodies are buried. He helped <laughs> bury some of them. Yep. I also worked, I also I did two him. startup companies with Andy before. Or this one we're currently with yeah, now. Which don't don't our, give anything away, though. <laughs> so <laughs> well, I, they didn't, I they didn't do so well. <laughs> I'm coming to what I think is the last question, and I feel like um, and the uh, crowd goes wild. I feel like uh, what's um, David uh, Tennant in in uh, Doctor Who? He says, "I don't want to go," uh, but <laughs> <laughs> I want to stay. I think he said, yeah. "I want to stay." He said, "I don't, don't want to go. go." So um, the question it might be a good one. Uh, right. If I don't get any more, so as Commodore was still around technologically, would it be ahead of where, of other companies? Where would it fall, like in tech, technological advancement? Uh, it looks like that's what they're asking. If Commodore can, had survived and is still around today, if if we had stuck with the LCD, we could have just cleared the field on portable computing ahead of its yeah. time. Yeah, it's yeah, it really and, depends on which commodore you point out to because yeah, that's exactly right. You know, that was that was the thing that grew into this huge business. It would have been a different world if the L C D had come out when when it had been developed. Yeah. And I, I, I swear to God, we could have dominated things like neural nets and stuff that came later because we could integrate hardware and chip production as if we worked in the same room as e with each other. And so that was our strength. Yeah. Um Later on, um, Amiga stuff could have survived, I think. But I think at some point we would have had to decide whether we were a just a systems company or we, whether we wanted to make custom chips. Because if you looked at what happened after Amiga AAA, it was going to be this thing called Ombre, which had on chip. It was a 3D system. It had an on chip processor. It was, you know, it was, it was a cool architecture. That was the thing Ed Hepler was working on in the, like '93. Um, we had, we had the brains, we had the direction, but at some point, and that was, that was actually where we were getting to this too. We were, you know, I had decided for the thing that probably would have been the A5000 if Commodore survived that we we're going to use the PCI bus. Ed Hepler had independently decided we were going to use the PCI bus. We were, we were getting on the idea that, see, part of the problem is when you're the first one doing something, you kind of have to do it all. But after other people are doing it correctly, and it becomes an industry standard, you sort of have to follow that. So I think, you know, eventually Commodore would have been 
probably followed the same way Apple did and gone with x86 processors. I think we, you know, if you know, if yeah. if, if if my brain had worked the same way, if that had continued, I think we would have jumped on ARM real early rather than waiting. You know, because that's we, you know, ARM's a great example. Because, yeah, because yeah. Uh, because Amiga stuff, even if it had been enhanced, it was still going to be light weight compared to everything else everybody had out there. So I could have seen that going on ARM, but it's, you know, it's impossible to say because, you know, you can, you know, you can, you know, you can shoot something forward a little bit, but, you know, you don't know where those future winds are pointing. Um, so, you know, you can only extrapolate out from, you know, that's why I'm saying, you know, if you start whatever point you start at. So if you, you know, Bill says, you know, like that LCD computer, you know, oh, you know, who needs a battery powered computer? Oh well, <laughs> right. No, who needs a portable? Oh my gosh! You know, that, like okay, seriously, back in, in two thousand one, that is two thousand one. I work. I did IT support, and I was Android outsells Windows by five to one, and that's a pocket computer that runs on an LCD screen. Yeah, and it you know, and it doesn't have to be as powerful as a PC. So you know, it you know, it all depends on where you you know <laughs> how far back you go with the time machine and what you do with it. Well, back back in 2001, I was doing IT support for a small company, and I tried to convince my boss to let me get a, a wireless card on my laptop, and he said no. <laughs> Can you imagine the world today without wireless? Yeah, well, you look at Palm computing. You know, they, you know, Palm and and early smartphones. Early smartphones did not want you to have Wi-Fi. <laughs> right. And and when when the iPad came out, I remember thinking. Why do we need this thing? It's not a phone. What the heck is it? And now everybody's got them. Uh, I did. I did have a question come in. Some guy named Tony Bogan said, "Do you guys have any interesting prototypes in your possession? And if yes, can you sell them to him, Tony?" And then he <laughs> said he would split the profits with you guys when he resells them to Chris Falla. <laughs> That's my buddy Tony. Yeah. Well, in that case, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and but see, knowing me, I'd pay whatever and would buy it. So no, uh, actually, I I kind of I I unloaded. I didn't really keep any terribly useful. No, Dave quarters. Dave I, unloaded a, a bunch and donated the money to uh, cancer research. Yeah, I was. Oh I was wow! Pretty, yeah, my wife got yeah. breast cancer, and so I did a uh, I did a big uh, a big sell off of. It wasn't even. I didn't have prototypes. He, I had like weird shit like. Uh, like a three thousand towers, you know that didn't Dave, Dave really... put his money where his mouth is. He, he he did a wonderful thing with with what he did with a house full of unique stuff. It, he yeah. went out and well, sold that, and you know some of it was also. I mean, you know, it, you're making it sound really noble, and some of it was. But the other thing was that um, yeah, I I actually got the idea when I was going through my garage doing a little cleaning and I found this box I hadn't looked at since I'd moved there 10 years before. And I had all these A3000 towers in it. And it's like <laughs> eBay garbage. Dave, yeah. was that, so, um, yeah, old, was that when you were selling like toasters? You know, when you were selling like 80 SID chips or something at some point, is that the same time? Oh, I had, well, that was a little bit later. I just, I, okay. I had been, the, the, the 80, there wasn't, it was like, it was like a, you know, I had a, I had a big foam thing full of SID chips. Um, I, you know, I didn't really need any SID chips anymore. And I, that, I had been going, that was after I, that was when I was moving from, yes. uh, and from you know, my, it's funny. My, I, I ran yeah, across you on Delaware and I ran I across you on eBay yeah. during that. Yeah. I, I, I sent you a few messages on eBay mm -hmm. and I remember you commenting that you were astonished at how much money that they the SID chips would draw. I mean, they're they're very popular. <laughs> I actually knew they were popular because the reason I had a, a big foam thing full of SID chips because when I was when I was uh, at early on at Commodore, um, my sister was at Oberlin Conservatory and all of her electronic music geek friends wanted SID chips. So I just I think at one point I grabbed some you know, they were—they weren't exactly a rare commodity at Commodore. You could get SID yeah. chips if you wanted some. So I think I grabbed some, and every time some, one of her friends wanted some SID chips, I sent them a couple in the in the mail, and it just—it didn't last that long. <laughs> yeah, if only we knew, right? Right. 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 Who knew? I know. Hey, the big, the biggest money making thing would have been if uh, <laughs> we had all if we had all cashed in our shares of Commodore stock, one share printed. Per share, and then I'll sign them. 
those would have been nice collector's items and worth way more than the stock ever was. <laughs> yeah. I think I have one more. Uh, was it true that Bill Hurd might be the cause of the LCD not coming out? I seem to recall him saying that they had money to do one machine and he made the 128 seem cheaper to make at the time. And that was from Amiga Anthony. And um, I kind of started coming to this conclusion that where I said to myself, uh, first off, Jeff Porter told me that the LCD got canned because we didn't have enough to go with two brand new computers, which was news to me because before then in the Jack Tamell era, we had lots of cash to output new computers where we were going to do eight or nine, you know, of the yeah. TED series. Yeah. So the what happened to me then, that moment where I really hated my life from then on was, wow, if I hadn't done the 128, if I didn't sit down and draw that that day, or Fred Bowen and I had never hooked up, um, would we have stayed with the LCD computer? And the answer is, yeah, maybe we would have, and maybe the LCD computer would have changed Commodore. So we should have done the one. We should have done the LCD computer, not the 128. One was evolutionary, one was revolutionary, and we went with the wrong one. We went with the one we could understand. You know, the one that yeah, I, was 64 I, compatible. I didn't really understand that, but the same kind of thing happened later on. Um, Commodore had been working on this thing called the Commodore 900 for three different engineering teams, and they could never quite get it to work. Uh, other people call it the Z8000. Is that the Z8000? Yeah. 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 Well, the last iteration. Yeah, no, they didn't that, get it to work. No. Yeah, well, the last iteration of that had Bob Wellen and, and uh, George Wellen. Roth working on it, and they got it working. It actually worked really well. I, I heard they did some slick stuff to make oh, it work they too. Did some really crazy slick stuff. They had this. That's guy what I heard. A one transistor detach circuit. Doing their windowing, they had a windowing system. So it ran this. It ran this. This Unix clone called Coherent. They had a. They had a megapixel black and white display. Um, it was basically like a Sun two. Um, yeah. Only thing was when when Amiga came along, Commodore said we can only do one computer. You know, it's. I mean, it, it is up to management to say one or another. They and and the Z eight thousand needed to die. It, it was on its third third year too. It wasn't going anywhere. It, it well, needed no, to at, die. At that point, it didn't. No, it actually, by the time there were plenty of times it needed to die, but by the time they actually killed it, it was a good system. It didn't need to die anymore. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So they didn't kill it when they should have, and it yeah, they they, they fly. They let, they let, <laughs> They let George Robbins get his hands on it. And that guy was, uh, that well, the, yeah. 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 He was amazing. Yeah. He could make, you know, he, uh, he could, sure. you know, he, he was the high end guy, right? The only reason I worked on the Amiga 2000 was that George had started the 500 and that was his baby and he wouldn't let it up. So I got to, I, you know, For I was, I had been the low end guy, right? Being, you know, part of the C128 team. And they put, you know, they basically handed me over the A2000 and said, here, boy, go. I had everybody. The only one help, who helped me on that was George, because of course George. Just, George, for those that don't know, slept in bubble wrap under his desk, and we called it nesting. And after he'd wake up, he'd walk around. And he'd have these little red circles on his face from where he was sleeping in bubble wrap. <laughs> yeah, there were times when he never. I mean, there were, there were months when he never left. Months college. where he didn't go home. Yeah. Well, after yeah, we bring him food, uh, change the clothes. Yeah. I don't know exactly yeah. when it happened, but at one point he had. He had been caught driving his van with no driver with the with an outdated station driver, wagon, no insurance, yes. no no. Well, he had, it was the van too. It was, I made, I, the station wagon might have been the first one of those, but at one point he had the van that lived in the Commodore parking lot. After that, right, right. I thought that was station wagon, but you're probably right. It, it, it had a bunch of Z eight thousands in it at one point. He was driving around. Yeah, well, so. actually, the Z eight the the original the original Commodore compute Commodore uh, entry to. Um, the internet was one of George's Z8000 uh, machines. Yeah. That UUCP. He had got yeah. Exxon or whatever when they were when they were. That's right. Their data systems. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. His yeah. his his mission was lots of little Unix boxes take over the world. Yep. Yep. And. and uh, and that's that's how that's actually how we ended up getting Amiga yeah. Unix. We it miss was, you, George. George yeah. passed away years ago. We miss you, guys. You died at All work. Right. All right, guys. This has been wonderful. We loved our video. And thank you so much for staying for a whole hour of questions and answers. You see, 
everybody loves it. Lots of questions. Um, thank you for the answers and memories. Um, this is invaluable. Thanks for asking us. Yeah, you're welcome. You know, yeah. The day you guys quit asking is the day we stop showing up. So yeah, yeah, know, really, we appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so it was great. <laughs> Thank you. It was yeah. good. Good finale. Yeah, I had a blast. Thank Dave and so I don't get to do this all that often. So now we now we we're all caught up and we're synchronous again for a little while. Then our yeah. bustles will go asynchronous and yeah, it's always all kinds good. of bad things. So um, I have some finishing things to say before we end the day. Um, one of our members, Glitch, uh, Glitchworks is going to be doing his own streaming tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. He has his new uh, R6501Q SBC. Um, his Twitter is at systems underscore glitch. He's doing it on Twitch, twitch.tv slash glitchworks. Oh, Chris is showing you the board. So he's going to show you how to make the board um, on Twitch. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it here live, but he's going to do it in his place. Also, we have our T-shirts. Chris, do you want to show us the, this year's T-shirt? We have two colors, green and amber. Um, you can find them at vcfpd.org slash WP slash T dash shirt. They're $20 plus shipping charge. Um, they're really great. One of our, our board members, Mike Brutman, made them. Oh, yeah, I forgot about the back. So that has the Bridges Computer Festival, just like a concert t shirt. Obviously, <laughs> it was canceled. Italia was virtual. West was virtual. We're virtual. Um, but oh. it's a great t shirt. I love it. Um, we're going to start again tomorrow at 9 a.m., go till 6 p.m. Um, and there's a Harry Balcom had a little story just as a side because they were talking about um, Commodore and Apple. There's a little story he wants to tell about that. So, um, bright and early tomorrow, 9 a.m. Any last words, Chris? Just thrilled that this day went so fabulous and uh, can't wait to do it again tomorrow. And thanks to everybody for everything. It's been great. And Bill and Dave, you ducked out, I understand. But uh, just thanks again to you guys. Appreciate it. And thanks, guys, for uh, for having me be a part of this. And just want to say congrats to you guys. You guys put in so much hard work to the show, and it's just been an absolute blast. I know everyone here has had a great time. Everyone online has been having a great time. So thank you so much for all your hard work, you know, Jeff and Chris, and everyone at the Vintage Computer Federation who made this happen. You're welcome, Bill. I was glad that you could come and show off your cool stuff there. Um, I'm always, you know, it's a lot of work for me to do this, uh, hours and hours and hours, and uh, taken from my personal life, but now I'm happy to see that I'm giving to people, making people happy, and uh, it's great. So, we're going to end the show for today. You ready to go, Andy? Yeah. In three, two, one, we're out of here. Bye.